Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 41 It had been 18 days. 18 days of being held prisoner in large airy and well-furnished chambers, with a view of the city streets and the harbour in Newcastle. The Onion Knight may be a guest on the outside, but he was a hostage with guards stationed outside the doors. He was a man of value, as the hand to the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms and had royal seals to prove it. I may be seeing Lord Manderley soon, not as an envoy, but as a hostage. There is so much on the line with treating with one of the fattest lords in the Seven Kingdoms. The war effort in the north, seeking a bride for Prince Jacob and to gain an ally for Stannis. The queen may be right on one thing, she may not like whichever granddaughter Mandalay chooses for the prince, but she will do her duty to guide the poor girl through this war and the aftermath. Ser Davos would have prayed to the seven, for the sake of Lord Mandalay's granddaughters, who are forced to marry men below their stations, and are from a house known for ugliness and cutthroats. He was given food throughout the eighteen days, which signified he was a guest of some sorts, but his hosts would never deprive him without sustenance to keep him alive. The political situation was not all in black and white. Lord Wyman Manderley was weary of all the fighting and violence surrounding his house and the north, but the man was a coward, who allowed the Boltons and other traitor houses to have power over him and other Stark loyalists in the north. The Onion Knight didn't like this business, but he knew this marriage was vital to the cause. And how it would be difficult to convince an already afraid lord to abandon his safety and the safety of his people to marry off one of his granddaughters to a man of high birth. My king chooses me out of all the men in his retinue. He knew the prince and I have been bonded, since he was a babe at his mother's breast. Of all the loyal men, I know what's in the best interests of the heir to the throne. Not men like Axel Florent, who suck up to the prince to gain favour from the king and never knew what his favourite book was nor do they know him beneath his titles. Ser Davos was willing to die, in attempt to cement this alliance before King Stannis pushes his son onto the Karstark girl, another bride in consideration. There was no shortage of northern brides available for the prince, but the king will have to choose carefully and choose soon, the prince may be a man of eight and ten, but time was of the essence and his availability will be known to the rest of the seven kingdoms. It was a possibility Lord Manderley may have knowledge of the prince being dead, like the rest of the kingdoms. Eliminated at the Battle of Blackwater, it had been true for a while but Prince Jacob returned with a graying hair color and a new sworn shield from the south at his side. The Onion Knight was no consultant in terms of marriage pacts, but he had a mission. To hopefully secure an alliance with the Manderleys for gold, provisions and men in exchange for a suitable husband for one of Lord Manderley's two granddaughters. In the end, Davos will choose the girl, based on whether Prince Jacob could grow to love her and the eventual marriage can last forever. Davos had full confidence in his prince, even though others in the king's court many not. Prince Jacob was a changed man he wasn't a boy, who would refrain from any socialization with other men of his station, but he had grown up to become more engaged in politics and court intrigue. The doors opened for a man to appear with few guards behind him. He was over six feet tall and was stout. The man's beard was graying, as were the color of his eyes. His beard reminded him of Prince Jacob's short-lived new hair color when he returned. He wears armor of silver, with flowing seaweed engravements on it. The man's hell made him look fearsome, but over a head taller than Davos meant he wouldn't push his luck with this knight. The Onion Knight was seized by the stout man and a hand full of household guards. He may have been treated like a guest, but he didn't know his situation being inside a keep, which housed Freys. I'm growing used to being seized by guards of various lords, it comes with being the hand of a king most people in the Seven Kingdoms despise. Fools, if what the robber lord said in Sweet Sister was true, then none of them know the prince is alive, a man grown and unmarried. He was familiar with the commander of the White Harbour garrison, being the cousin of Lord Manderley and the man responsible for making sure he was comfortable, during his stay and having a sustainable meal through the eighteen days. Ser Davos was thankful towards the seven, for getting him this far on his journey, even though it pained him to be away from the prince and princess again. At the back of his mind, Davos was fortunate to have found another ally in the Reachman Grimm. The new sworn shield of Prince Jacob and a man, 
who worshipped the seven, as much as any one of the king's men did, but he was not one of them, due to his obvious dislike for the king. Ser Sorel was a different man than what Davos expected, which was a self-centered southerner only concerned with his own self-ambitions, but this man could fight and took his oaths to heart, even though the man was previously a sailor at Old Town. The cousin of Lord Manderley was a pleasant man, but the man is doing his duty to his lord. Treating with the lord of the keep will take some cunning and some careful persuasion, but learning from Prince Jacob on how to speak to high lords and play the game of thrones. I am prepared to represent my king's cause and to persuade Lord Manderley to abandon his fruitless alliance with the phrase, a house responsible for the murder of one of his sons and many other northmen and rivermen slaughtered at that god's forsaken wedding. The Onion Knight still had his royal seals with him. As proof of his status as hand to the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms, and he had an extended role of playing matchmaker for Prince Jacob, but he was ready to embrace such a role for a man, he considered another son of his. It wasn't an easy task, as it involved the potential of everything going wrong for him. This treating could go south, for how the phrase could manipulate the situation in their favor and try and have him eliminated, only for speaking for his king. Ser Davos couldn't fail, the prince personally asked him to find him a wife from House Manderley, in an attempt to disrupt his father's plot of marrying him off to the dead Lord Karstark's daughter. The prince saw the Manderleys were worthier allies for his father in terms of funding the rest of the war and to help them all survive the winter. The guards were not mishandling him, in the way the robber lord's guards did on Sweet Sister. It seemed northerners treated their guests or hostages with a sense of humanity and respect. He didn't expect the treatment to last forever, it depended on what Lord Manderley thought of him. The Onion Knight took a deep breath, with him standing in front of wide, blue-green double doors engraved with the merman and the trident. It was a sigil to be proud of it looked fearsome in its larger form. The guards behind could get in front and force the doors to open, and take him inside. Ser Davos, still being held by two guards was brought before a crowded court, with many of the guests focusing their eyes up on him. The floors, walls, and ceiling were made of wooden planks placed together and engraved with all creatures of the sea. The other end of the hall was a dais, where there was a large cushioned throne, it was occupied by a very large man with a booming laugh and dressed in the blue and green colors of the hall. By his description and what was told to him days before, this was Lord Wyman Manderley and Ser Davos was a jester in this man's court. Behind the dais a kraken and grey leviathan were locked in battle beneath the painted waves. The hall was grand, and many of the guests looked different. Ser Davos suspected those sitting on the table on the left were the Fry delegation, due to their weasel looks and glaring at the ladies of the court with them turning away and fearing to look repulsed by the Fry men. His head was held up high he was the hand of the king, to the rightful king of the seven kingdoms and he was here to negotiate alliances and a possible marriage pact between House Baratheon and House Manderley. On the right side of the throne were women, whom were members of House Manderley. One of the women had long yellow hair with her face being rounded and pink. She was quite plump, dressed in a turquoise blue gown and looked her nose down upon Ser Davos. Two other younger women stood with the older woman, with one of them having a long brown hair bound in a braid, but the other young lady stood out amongst the guests of the court with her own hair being in a green color. The Onion Knight remembered what Prince Jacob told him of House Manderley. Of the women of the household consisted of the captive Wyless Manderley's lady wife Leona, formerly of House Woolfield, his daughters the ladies Willa and Winifred. Ser Davos reminded himself of how Ser Wyless Manderley was a hostage of the Lannisters, and how they would like to see him returned home. You are should kneel before me you are in my court in the presence of my family and good fry friends Jared, Rieger and Simon. Lord Wyman said, catching the attention of all those in his hall. I requested a private audience with you, my lord. Ser Davos replied, remembering what Prince Jacob taught him about the Game of Thrones. You are in no such position to be requesting, such a thing smuggler. You will kneel before Lord Manderley you are in his halls after all. One of the frays in the delegation sneered. I refuse, due to my status as hand to the true king of the Seven Kingdoms. Rightful king, the man you serve is nothing but blasphemy in the name of the faith. He is the same man who sent his son to die in his thoughtless war leaving him depleted and destroyed. Lady Leona said harshly. He means nothing, good daughter. 
He is a smuggler in service to man, who couldn't even get a grandson out of his abnormal son, before his death. It's a shame, a young man had to die for his father's worthless ambition to sit on a throne that doesn't belong to him by rights. My lord, those of House Fry are responsible for the death of your son and others, who have been slaughtered at that damned wedding. The red wedding was the young wolf's work. He changed into a beast before our eyes and ripped out the throat of my cousin Jingle Bell, a harmless simpleton. He would have slain my lord father, if Sir Wendell had not put himself in harm's way. The second of the phrase argued. Is it your claim that Rob Stark eliminated Wendell Mandeley? Sir Davos questioned. And many more. My own son Titus was among the dead, and my daughter's husband. When Stark changed into a wolf, his Northmen did the same. The mark of the beast was on them all. Wargs birth other wargs with a bite, it's well known. It was all my brothers and I could do to put them down before they slaughtered us all. Sir, may I have your name? The Onion Knight asked. Sir Jared, of House Fry. The second of the phrase, said with his voice radiating arrogance. Jared of House Fry, I name you a liar. Those of your house broke guest right, by killing those who ate bread and drunk wine in your own halls. Your house and the Boltons plotted to slay the young wolf, the Northmen and the rivermen who were loyal to him. You are traitor, smuggler. To speak against the Iron Throne and King Tommen, you should learn to respect your betters. Lady Leona said sourly, you come here, spreading lies and peddling treason under my good father's roof. Tommen is a usurper, and not a true son of Robert Baratheon, and therefore Robert's brother Stannis has a truer claim to the Iron Throne. What proof to do you have of such accusations, other than a jealous man's ambition to steal the throne from his own nephew, shameful? Lord Wyman resided. You have been told lies, my lord. Stannis's son and heir is not dead he survived the Blackwater and bypassed Tyrell forces to return to his father. Those loyal to Stannis, especially those of House Florent are only fighting for him because of his son, who looks just like King Robert and has his warrior skill on the battlefield. His looks are akin to any trueborn Baratheon of black hair and blue eyes. If Stannis's son had died on the Blackwater, then the southerners in his army would have deserted him a long ago. You speak lies, smuggler. You and Stannis Baratheon are responsible for bringing an apostate sorceress onto our shores, who has been converting people to abandon the faith in favor of a god, whose worshippers burn men alive. Isn't it true, Stannis's wife was one of the first converts? Lady Leona replied. The Onion Knight couldn't blame Lady Leona. She was speaking against him out of fear. She was afraid for her husband, who was a captive of the Lannisters. Ser Davos knew the Lady Melisandre's presence made King Stannis unpopular, and caused potential allies to turn away from him, due to her and the Queen's men trying to convert his grace, the King and his son the Prince into worshipping Lawler with them. The Lady Melisandre is a priestess of the Red God. Queen Celis and others have converted to her faith. The men who have adopted her faith call themselves the Queen's men, but there are more of his grace's followers who keep to the faith of the seven, myself included. Prince Jacob himself worships the faith and opposes the presence of the red woman, if he had been king, then she would have been put to death long ago. Ser Davos explained. Lord Wyman glares at Ser Davos, he has a right of it. He was a stranger in this man's halls, but he allowed his good daughter and his fry allies to mock him. He thanked the seven many times, for Prince Jacob being alive where this delegation would have gone another way, and it would have ended with him with his head removed from his shoulders. Ser Onion Knight, what does Stannis Baratheon offer me in return for my allegiance to his already depleting cause? Lord Wyman said, in a stern tone. The chance to do your duty. Ser Davos replied, and for one of your granddaughters to be queen. What about your king's strength? How many allies does he have to his cause? Is his strength strong enough to take on the Boltons? Ser Marlin questions. The Onion Knight knew the answer in his own mind. King Stannis didn't have much, but it would have been much less if Prince Jacob had died on the Blackwater. The Florence may have stayed, with a daughter of their own house being Stannis's queen, but in their minds a son and heir was better for advancement of their house and to have Florent blood on the throne for generations to come. His silence only proves my point. 
allying with Stannis will only bring us defeat and death. Ser Marlin declared. What does Stannis offer you? Vengeance, for my sons and yours, for your husbands, your fathers, and your brothers. Vengeance for your murdered lord, your murdered king, your butchered princes and the hand of one of your granddaughters for his son Prince Jacob. Yes. They eliminated Lord Eddard and Lady Caitlin and King Rob. He was our king. He was brave and good and the phrase murdered him. If Lord Stannis will avenge him, we should join Lord Stannis. The young lady with the greenish blonde braid announced. Be silent, Willa. You must not speak ill of our fry friends, one of them will be your lord husband soon. The young woman with the brown braid said harshly. She must be the elder sister to the girl, who bravely spoke out against the phrase. Grandfather may want you to marry a fry, but I refuse to marry little Walder. I would rather marry Prince Jacob than wed a boy from a house, who murdered our liege lord. Willa, every time you open your mouth. You make me want to send you to the silent sisters. Speak out of turn again, and it will be your reality. Lord Wyman shouted. I know about the promise. Maester Theomore, tell them. A thousand years ago before the conquest, a promise was made, and oaths were sworn in the wolf's den before the old gods and the new. When we were sore, beset and friendless, hounded from our homes in peril of our lives, the wolves took us in and nourished us and protected us against our enemies. The city was built upon the land they gave us. In return, we swore that we should always be their men. Stark men. The Starks are all gone, my lady. The maester pointed out. That's because they eliminated them all. Willa has always been a willful child, always speaking childish nonsense. I fear she will make a willful wife. Lady Winifred said, in a stern tone. Marriage will soften her, I have no doubt. A firm hand, a quiet word and little Walder should curb her wildness. Rieger Fry said, in a tone of disgust and malice. The Onion Knight admired the Lady Willa, she may have been young, but she was intelligent enough to see who the true enemies were. She was braver than most of the men in the room, who would cower before the phrase and their lord's cowardice. The young lady's willfulness was a quality Prince Jacob wanted to find in future wife, a woman who was equal to him in shrewd intelligence. The girl's sister, the Lady Winifred was at age with Prince Jacob, but Ser Davos saw her trying to protect her sister from the threat of punishment from her lord grandfather and their fry allies in attendance. Arya Stark is still alive, and on her way to wed Ramsay Bolton, and therefore you should give your allegiance to him, as he will soon be lord of Winterfell. Rieger Fry insisted. Why should I give my allegiance to a monster, who terrorized the people of Hornwood, and made his last wife eat her own fingers? Lady Willa replied, with her arms folded. Be silent, Willa or otherwise your lord grandfather will send you to the silent sisters. You should behave yourself like your sister. Lady Leona hissed. Rob Stark was the real monster, faithless and greedy. He betrayed us all. He abandoned the north to the cruel mercies of the Ironborn to carve out a fairer kingdom for himself on the Trident. Then he abandoned the river lords, who had risked much and more for him, breaking his marriage pact with my grandfather to wed the first western wench, who caught his eye. Young wolf. He was a vile dog and died like one. The third fry man snarled, King Tommen is the only hope for peace in Westeros, all Stannis will bring chaos and will force us all to worship the Red S. Demon God and will eliminate all he deems his enemies. I agree with Rieger, King Tommen will bring prosperity and peace to the Seven Kingdoms and your throne less king will seek to destroy us all. Lord Wyman replied. He is lying, they are all lying. King Tommen is only a boy, the Lannisters rule in his name. Lord Stannis and his son will stop the Boltons. Willa protested, causing her lady mother to drag her out of the halls, for her disobedience and for stirring trouble for the phrase in the audience. Ser Davos wished Prince Jacob had been with him, to prove to these highborns of him being alive. They might have believed Jacob's words, being highborn himself and the nephew of a dead king. I will never consider an alliance with Stannis Baratheon. If what my good daughter says is true, then I will not foolishly ally myself with a man, who has abandoned the faith and gotten his own son eliminated for his ambitions. 
Guards, seize this smuggler and get him out of my sight. Lord Wyman said, with his guard seizing Ser Davos. I am an envoy, my lord. Of the rightful king. The Onion Knight protested. Are you? You came into my city like a smuggler. I say you are no lord, no knight or envoy, only a thief and a spy, a peddler of lies and treasons. I should have your tongue ripped out with hot pincers and deliver you to the dreadfort to be flayed, but the mother is merciful, and so am I. Lord Wyman said, in a kindly tone. At the back of his mind, the Onion Knight knew this was a lost cause. The Lord of White Harbor turned to Sir Marlin, the captain of his guard and commanded. Cousin, take this lowly creature to the wolf's den, and cut off his head and hands. I want them brought to me before I sup tonight. I will not eat another bite until I see this smuggler's head upon a spike with an onion shoved between his lying, treasonous teeth. Chapter 42 The harsh snows near the mountain ranges of the north would have frozen any of the southerners easily, but for Prince Jacob. He held on to the reins of his horse Misty, whilst the host of his father King Stannis were prowling through the snows of the mountainous regions. The prince knew at the back of his mind how he and his father have a difficult challenge ahead of them. Jacob wore his gold and black furs, which kept him warm, whilst he rode beside his sworn shield Sorel Grimm, who had snowflakes on his face and had a grim expression on his face. He couldn't blame the man he was born and raised in the reach and wasn't used to such conditions, but the prince was used to it being in the north as a guest of the Starks. At the back of his mind, Jacob never thought much of the house that used to rule the north. He didn't want to think about it, due to his own guilty feelings of wanting Rob Stark dead for betraying him and for taking the crown of a false king. His own guilty conscience was eating at him, when he heard of what happened to the other Stark children, all pulled apart by war and stolen innocence. Jacob never deemed to care for anyone other for those he viewed to be allies and nothing more. He was a cold and heartless man, but it was what the war made him. The prince didn't want to be close to his father, not wanting the man to berate him for befriending the idiot Lord Commander, but he didn't care for what his father thought most of the time. The Prince of the Narrow Sea realized how he wanted to be a leader and less of being his father's favorite soldier, but he was his father's heir at the end. Jacob had led men into battle against the wildlings and at the Blackwater he wanted another opportunity to lead a host into killing Ironborn. Your Grace, you have been quiet the whole journey. Sorel asked, motioning his horse to be beside the prince he sworn himself to. I want to get to the keep and get this done with. Northern lords are difficult to reason with, only because southerners are easily fooled by false promises. Prince Jacob replied. I have this thirst for blood rather than play the game again. You have changed, my prince. War has made a man of you, but not in a good way. What do you mean, sir? I have seen you on the field, you look to enjoy killing, your grace. I saw the thirst and hunger in your eyes to keep on killing even though the battle was over. I didn't know what happened to me. I wanted to secure the victory for father, after foolishly getting myself kidnapped after the Blackwater. You shouldn't be hard on yourself, your grace. You may be a man, but you are still young. You haven't experienced life the way most men have. What do you know of war, Grim? You are only a sailor in Old Town. Prince Jacob said bitterly. I was there, when Randall Tarley defeated your uncle at Ashford, the only loyalist victor in the war. One of my cousins died for that victory, but one of my other cousins, the heir to Greyshield wanted the reach forces at the Trident, but the Fat Flower wasted time with that failed siege which cost the royalists the war. My father told me about the siege when I was a young lad. He told me of how the Mace Tyrell and Pax to Redwine were laying siege to the banquet table in the command tent, while he ate boot leather, rats, horses and dogs. Your father may be the king Westeros needs in order for the realm to heal he may not be the king people want, but the realm needs a stable king. A man and not a child to rule the seven kingdoms. You are a bold man, a southerner from a family of Tyrell loyalists to say such a thing. It seems serving me has redeemed you in the eyes of the gods. To give your service to the rightful king and not the pretenders to my father's throne. You are determined, my prince. Do what you can to give your father the throne. He must listen to your counsel and not those of the disloyal northerners, who allowed oathbreakers to rule the north. 
I didn't know you had such harsh opinions on them, it does come with your Southron pride and all. Where did you hear such a thing, your grace? Lady Olena, Sir. When I was young boy, she took me under her wing and taught me everything I knew about the Game of Thrones and how people were. She said Southerners are prideful because they live in a warmer climate, have the better refined ladies and the South is closer to the throne. If any of those savage men come near you with an axe or anything that looks like a weapon, should I cut them down? Sorel asked. No, we are guests and it will be insulting to point your sword at them. My father needs the clansmen to fight for him, and to help us oust the ironborn from the northern strongholds. Prince Jacob replied. I only serve you, my prince. I do not hold any loyalty towards your father, being a prig and a man without any niceties at all. I will happily sacrifice my life for you, as it is you I vowed to serve and protect as your sworn shield. Prince Jacob found it hard to understand the man, who had sworn himself to protect him. Sorel Grimm was not a simple man he may be highborn, but didn't live the life a traditional noble man lived in the south. He was a sailor and did things to earn his keep, even though he could have served his lord cousin as captain of his household guard, but he wanted to forge his own path in the world. The young man didn't understand his sworn shield, because of the difference in lifestyle. Jacob may have not been the rightful heir of Storm's End, but he still lived a life of a privileged nobleman, being the nephew of a king and being born into one of the great houses of Westeros. Prince Jacob gently stroked the mane of his horse he had Misty since he was a child and would never leave her, even though she came back for him when he was on the ground at the battle beneath the wall. Being with Sorel gave Jacob some form of freedom to express opinions his father would consider to be dishonorable and foolish in his own pragmatic and logical mind. The prince and his sworn shield could see the sights of a keep in the distance. Prince Jacob didn't look at his father, not wanting his eyes to be on his stern, kingly father. He thought he put all his internal issues behind him, but they were still lingering inside him. All of those issues stemmed from his father's inability to change his blunt and harsh personality, as a way of getting allies for his cause for the Iron Throne. His father never listens to sense and reason, but chooses to listen to a red priestess, who is feeding him false hope with her magic and lips full of lies and broken promises. Prince Jacob and Sorel were closer together, as it was the latter man's duty as his shield to protect him from any form of harm. The prince didn't believe northerners were foolish enough to make an attempt on his life, but some of the northerners sided with the Boltons and Freys, which made this journey even more perilous. From John's knowledge, the clansmen of the north have been loyal to the Starks for centuries and are the sort of clans, who would like to spill the blood of Roose Bolton. The keep had the flags waving in the distance. The prince could see three wooden buckets, brown on blue within a border of grey and white checks. Jacob learned of how the house wool, was the most powerful of all the clans, and how most of the other chiefs would reconvene in wool's keep and host a feast celebrating long and achieved peace between all the clans. Long ago, most of these clans were fighting each other, but now were allied with each other against their ironborn and wilding enemies further in the north and the west of the north. The prince rode with his sworn shield, just a few horses behind his own father. Jacob didn't want his father and his blunt nature ruining this potential meeting with the chief clansmen. He had the responsibility to make sure none of the mountain clan warriors had a good reason to eliminate them all. There were a lot of men standing around the entrance of the keep, most of them adorned heavy furs and had helms, like the ones ironborn warriors would wear. Some of the helms could be war tokens from their dead reaving enemies. The men would have either big two-handed greatswords behind them or would have axes. They were all in ragged skins in darker shades of brown and grey, and studded leathers to keep them warm under their armour. Prince Jacob was intimidated, by such men who looked to be tough and strong the only place in the south for big strong warriors were the Stormlands it was how his uncle Robert was strong enough to fight three battles in a single day. Even when traitors like the Canningtons disobeyed their liege in favour of a prince, who stole away another man's betrothed, and still kept fighting the war after the defeat by Randall Tarley at Ashford. The prince unmounted his horse, and was followed by Sorel behind him with his sword. The rugged men glared at him, knowing he was no northerner, but a southern boy with a scar across his left cheek. The grim knight looked around, looking to detect a threat to eliminate in service of Prince Jacob, but the prince gave the knight a stern warning. He didn't want bloodshed, 
whether it was because of Sorel's eagerness to eliminate for him or his own father's abysmal ways of respecting northern traditions. Prince Jacob looked at his father, in the flamed crown upon his head. Underneath the weight of the crown, the prince knew his sire better than any man, even more than Ser Davos. His father was a man of honor, a just man who would follow the law and a man, a man willing to do his duty as the rightful king. The young man pulled off his hood the men with axes were not bothered by his scars, but most of them have seen war and know what war scars looked like. His long black hair had the grey streaks of the dye left in his hair by the kindly maester of House Molendor. Jacob liked it it made him more of a fearsome man than the boy, of five and ten willing to fight a war bigger than himself at the time. Prince Jacob didn't know what to expect, with Sorel standing by his side. The northern clansmen could agree to an alliance with him and his father against the Ironborn or it could all end in bloodshed. The king and the prince were brought into the Lord's Solar it had the flags of house wool on the walls. Prince Jacob thought having a bucket as a house sigil was strange, but he would never say it out loud, being a guest in the keep of the wools and not wanting to insult them. There were two men, who commanded fear and respect amongst the men, being larger and having weapons on them. One of the men had a large belly, but he was no fatter than Uncle Robert on his last days. The man had a great ginger beard that put his own father's one to shame. Jacob knew the man to be Hugo Big Bucketwool, the clansman with the most men in his army and was a hard-headed Northman. The other of the two was a stout and gruff man with gnarled, red-knuckled hands as big as Uncle Robert's warhammer. This one made his father Stannis uncomfortable, being a staunch Northman, who had fought against Ironborn and Wildlings. This man was Lord Torgan Flint, but was called the Old Flint amongst his men and by the other clansmen of the North. It has been centuries, since we clansfolk have last seen a king in these parts. Lord Wool said, in a gruff tone. My lords, my father and I have come a long distance, journeying from the Wall to ask for aid in liberating northern strongholds in the hands of Ironborn and Bolton scum. My father and I are southerners and will be welcomed by the assistance of experienced fighters such as yourselves. Prince Jacob said. My relations have seen your face in the north before, you were a guest of the Ned and his clan before his friend the Jolly Stag King became his guest. Lord Torgan replied. My lords what my son is trying to say is how some of the northmen have betrayed their lieges, and by rights should be punished for it. The Lord Commander of the Watch said there are no truer men loyal to the Starks than those of the mountain clans. King Stannis said, in a hardened tone. The last time you were in the north, you were a boy, a stripling of five and ten. And now you come to us a man with war wounds on your face. It seems your own fellow Southerns cannot recognize your face, if they did not know your name. The war scars you see on my face, chief clansmen are two years of war on me. I tend to fight alongside my father to free the North and make Bolton and his fry friends bleed for their dishonor upon the Northmen and the Rivermen, who died in violation of guest right. Prince Jacob said, in a louder tone. He didn't want to seem soft and meek in front of men, larger than himself. His voice had to be bigger for the clansmen to take him seriously, as a man and an equal among them. The boy speaks true, old Flint. If what he says is true, then we would be foolish to pass upon an opportunity to slaughter the Boltons and throw the Reavers back into the sea. You have steel in you, boy, being a southerner and being used to our cold you eliminated those savage wildlings with your own sword, and kicked one in the face. Lord Wool said. I am no boy. I am a man grown, and I have seen men die in front of me. I have seen things only storytellers tell scared children in the middle of the night. I know you have lost men to the Boltons and the Freys at that wedding, but I have lost much in the war. My uncles Robert and Renly are dead. I want to make sure they didn't die in vain or their memories were lost. Prince Jacob could feel his father's piercing glare at him. He didn't want to look, all because of the fear of turning into the boy of five and ten, who wanted to do anything to please his father. The prince was a man grown, and he had to make his own decisions. He was to be king after his father and rule the seven kingdoms. The young man didn't want to be king in truth, ruling was hard and he already saw what it did to Uncle Robert. It made him a shadow of the man he once was a leader of men in war and a great warrior in battle. 
Ruling turned a great warrior into a fat man, who wanted to drink and whore himself into an early grave. He didn't want to suffer the same fate, of having his strings pulled by various people, who were not going to act on his or the kingdom's interests, but to fulfill their own selfish ambitions and to eliminate him when his use to the capital vultures was over. Prince Jacob was equally as unpopular as his father, all due to the same harsh and hardened traits inherited from father to son. He didn't know if his eventual wife will even tolerate him, let alone learn to love him because of his unappealing qualities. Marriage was a cage to him he saw how unhappy his own parents were, they were only living shadows and didn't love each other much. My lords, my son didn't mean to be unclothed. He was raised better than to talk back at lords. My heir is usually well-mannered, with southern courtesies bred in him. The Lord Commander tells me how the clansmen are great fighters and are the best group of men able to assist in pushing the ironborn out of Deepwood Mott. King Stannis intervened, his glare never left Jacob having done something wrong in his eyes. Your son is spirited, Southern King. You should be fortunate to have him in these rough times. He is unlike any Southern we have met. Your boy speaks true, the iron reaving cunts have stayed in the north far too long and it's time for them to be thrown back to where they came from. Lord Torgan exclaimed, with his clansmen cheering for their lord. Prince Jacob breathed a sigh of relief. The clansmen believed him, and even his father was astounded by his proclamation. The young man didn't expect them to listen him, being a southerner and a worshipper of a religion different than them. The prince didn't know these men well, but he was proud to be in the presence of experienced warriors, who have survived many battles and wars. His father King Stannis's glare lessened due to wanting to curry favor with Old Flint and Lord Wool. We shall be grateful for the aid in our campaign to free Deepwood Mott. The Ironborn stationed are weakened, their craven lord is dead and only a small force stands. Only loyal Northmen, such as yourselves have considered our offer in removing them and some of the others have turned on their fellow Northmen in need. Prince Jacob said, in a hardened tone of voice. The cheering and loud shouting from the clansmen made Sorel nervous, by his twitching fingers and unpleasant stare at most of the men with axes and greatswords. Prince Jacob understood the reach man wanting to do his duty and protect him, but this wasn't the time or place for bloodshed. The prince only thought of his eventual marriage once and ignored his other thoughts on them. It was difficult because Jacob didn't grow up with any examples of healthy and respectable marriages. His uncle Robert and Cersei had a poisonous relationship and the unhappy relationship between his own parents Stannis and Celis made his skin crawl, of somehow failing his wife before he met her. Prince Jacob stood by Sorel he was the only man in the solar not be the stranger to him, unlike his own father was. King Stannis stood firm and uncompromising he was not a man for celebration, but having the clansmen of the North on their side will help greatly in their campaign through the North. Chapter 43 The heir to the Iron Throne was trekking across the snows of the Wolfswood, the largest and most dangerous of all forests in the North. Prince Jacob had hunted here, when he was previously a lord. The forest was large, and the prince remembered hearing wolves howling in the night when he had been hunting with Ned Stark, Uncle Robert and a few other Northmen. It was made up of many kinds trees, such as the oak, evergreen and black briar, as well as the sentinels. The prince could see the rare ironwood trees, which reminded him of the bloody battle against the traitorous White Hills of High Point, whom were stationed in the lands of their rival's house forester, in serve of the Boltons. Prince Jacob had an aching pain on his left arm, it had been from the fighting at High Point. They had been stationed here for five days after the short, but bloody battle. The first victory on their northern campaign was to march through the woods, make way through the passage on the forester lands and to launch a surprise attack on the remaining Whitehill soldiers stationed there. The battle was won because High Point was lightly garrisoned, due to Lord Ludd Whitehill and his sons taking the best crop of their armies towards Winterfell, lending their support for the Boltons. However the Lady Gwyn was taken as a hostage, maybe his father Stannis will threaten her life to lure the Lord of High Point and his sons to stand and fight against him on the field. Most of the Queen's men, whom journeyed south with Jacob and Stannis called for the Whitehill girl to die for the sins of her father and brothers, but she was a valuable pawn to draw the cowardly Lord of High Point and his sons away from their Bolton and Fry allies. If Lord Ludd's only daughter was in danger he would either abandon the girl to her fate or come to save her. 
she was a hostage to his father and nothing more than a pawn to separate the White Hills from the Boltons if the time came. The battle had ended, and now King Stannis and Prince Jacob had control of the Wolfswood and the Forester Ironwood. There was another battle ahead, and ridding Iron Wrath of White Hills gave the rightful king and his heir the perfect route to pass their hosts through, towards Deepwood Mott. The prince's heart ached, whilst walking around the war camp, which was full of mixed sigils, since the mountain clans of the north had joined his father in the fighting. He missed his mother and sister, but he understood why he needed to continue the war in his father's name. The victory at High Point drew new additions to his father's side, with the foresters and Serwins joining them. Prince Jacob turned back to see his sworn shield catch up to him. Sorel looked like he could pass for a northerner with his fully grown dark beard and bald head. The prince wasn't in need of protection, he was a warrior in his own right and was trained by Randall Tarley. His mother Queen Celis feared for his safety when he left her again to march west through the mountainous regions of the north. Are you prepared for battle, your grace? Sorel asked, in a tone of bitterness and uncertainty. I am ready to throw the Ironborn back into the sea, the traitors of House Whitehill may have escaped my wrath, but the Ironborn will not have that fortune. The castle is fortified with strong walls, and they might dare to escape back to their lonesome ships. Prince Jacob replied. The storm will be upon us, my prince. I hope I get to slay as many Ironborn as I did the Whitehill men. The Queen's men are growing restless, they want the Whitehill girl to burn for the sins of her father and brothers. I would agree, the girl is no use to our cause. She is a lord's daughter and can be married off to one of our northern allies, but having her marry a southerner would be what my father will suggest, to punish the girl and to get rid of her. Keeping her as a hostage will only be to lure her fat father out of hiding. Your father is meaning to speak with you. The northerners have a lot to grip about. Their liege lord butchered at a wedding and the north being ruled by a cutthroat and butcher, who lives by those titles to his name. I'm not afraid of the leech lord. Between him and his idiot, Roos Bolton looks to be more intelligent and reasonable. His idiot cannot control his urges and tendencies, just like Joffrey. I'm afraid for your life, my prince. This war will have you and your father in the grave the steel in your heart will not stop you fighting, but if you have to fight to please your father, at least let me fight all your battles at your side. My father is Uncle Robert's true heir, but father doesn't have the respectability or inclination to win the nobility and the faith to his side. I can. My father is only a battle commander and a solider, but I am a game player. I learned from Lady Olena as a child, spying on the Tyrells and their banner men, even when she said my own clever mind would get me eliminated one day. My faith in the Seven has kept the Southerners loyal to my father, but it can help convince the High Septon to give my father clemency, and a chance of redemption in the eyes of the gods. It's a dangerous game, my prince. To potentially be a threat to your own father. It's a shame, your father does not see your true worth and what you have to offer him. You have been a political pawn, since the day you were born. The Florence only see you as advancement for their house, the Lannisters see you a threat to their stranglehold on the kingdoms and your father only sees you as his heir and nothing more. My father does love me, even though he is not the type of man to be showing affections. He values me, unlike these knights and lordings, who are only with him to gain lordships from him as rewards. The prince's guilty psyche never left him alone. He was sick of it all being blamed, threatened and shamed for only doing his duty to his father. The same father, who trusts him over all the other men loyal to him. The young man embraced the role of a soldier and killer, it was what Uncle Robert wanted him to become, as great as he was at his prime. Jacob never thought much about his favorite uncle, not wanting the empty sadness of him not being here in the world to resurface. The war camp had other tents, with the sigils of the northern houses, whom have joined his father. Prince Jacob had Sorel on his side, the only man willing to keep his secrets. It made him realize the big hole Davos's absence had within him. The prince missed the Onion Knight, but he knew why he was gone. He asked Davos to find him a wife from House Manderley, to disrupt his father's plot in marrying him off to Alice Karstark. He did not want to voice the truth of not wanting to marry either of the northern girls on offer. It made him face his knowing fear of being rejected by unattainable girls again. The young man was close to winning Marjorie Tyrell's hand, but his suit was rejected. 
Mathis Rowan's daughter was soiled from allowing a bard into her bed. He was never allowed to marry Desmer Redwine, his first love because of his father, and he resented his sire since that day. He was the rightful prince of the Seven Kingdoms, not some silly boy mourning over a girl. Not just any girl, a highborn maid, who had been his first kiss, during their frequent moments in Highgarden. I was only a young man, of four and ten, when I fell in love with Desmer. Uncle Robert said losing your first love cuts deeper than a sword wound. It was what I felt when I was not allowed to see her again, by the chagrin of her lord father and my own father. A tear fell from the prince's eye for his lost youth and innocence. He was only young, when he lost Desmara, she was not dead, but in his heart, it felt like she was gone from the world. Jacob wiped the tear, not wanting Sorel or the northerners to see his crying like a newborn babe. He had a lot of sorrow within him for a reason. His uncles were dead, Maester Cresson was poisoned by the red demon woman and he was left without his mother and sister. Only to have his unforgiving father. The prince and his sworn shield looked at the ironwood tree sigil of House Forester flapping in the winds, the brown bucket sigil of House Wool and various of the mountain clans, and the black battle axe of House Serwin. Jacob's eye was on his father's own terrible sigil the bad omen from the demon god. He never liked the sigil, with Uncle Renly being dead, it would have been better to take their true black and gold stag sigil, to signify them being the last Baratheons in the Seven Kingdoms. Prince Jacob gave Sorel a look, a look for him to stand outside the tent with his sword ready. He wanted to speak with his lord father alone. The dread of him being talked down to, like a child was heavily present in the prince's mind. The meeting with the chief clansmen saw some unresolved problems between father and son. The prince wanted to make it known to the clansmen of the north, that he was no soft boy from the south, but a man with steel through his blood. The young man entered the tent, only to see a few men leaving it. He took a deep breath his eyes were on his father. His father's face looked fuller and was less gaunt than he was at Castle Black. The prince was thankful having a decent meal in the halls of the Wools and at Eastwatch made him well. You wanted to speak with me, father. Prince Jacob said, in a hardened tone. His father was looking at maps of the Wolfswood and Deepwood Mott. Your behavior at the Keep of the Wools. You almost cost us a long-term alliance with the mountain clans. Lords Wool and Flint, on the other hand praised me for raising such a headstrong boy. For the sake of this alliance, you are forgiven for your transgression. King Stannis replied. The chief clansmen agreed with me. I was only defending my honor, since these men want to refer to me as a boy. They would have thought of me as a soft southern boy with no will or strength, but I will not be talked down to by old men. I blame myself, Jacob. For not stopping your uncle from fostering you to the Tyrells. You were only a child, to be taken from home and living with another family. I lost many years with Robert because of his own fostering in the Vale when he would come home, it was only brief before he had forgotten about Renly and myself, his own brothers to go back to the Vale to his new brother. Are you disappointed? Of not having captured Lud and his ingrate sons? Jacob asked. Luckily, we have the girl. His only daughter. After we have captured Winterfell, her fate will be decided. She can live and be married off to one of our northern allies or be put to the sword, along with her father and the rest of her witless family. Stannis retorted. I am leading a part of our host, to breach the outer walls of the castle. The Ironborn are arrogant to think these high walls keep them safe, but their hostages inside the keep could betray them for an opportunity to be free from their reaving and raping captors. This battle will test you, to see if you are capable of fighting the Ironborn as well you did the Wildlings and the Whitehill men. You have proved to me, you are able to lead a host and to command the respect of a true leader. I'm glad you are well, father. I was concerned for your well-being, when I returned. The war has taken much from you as I has from me. Your health matters to me because, you need to be strong enough to stand beside me when we take north from the Boltons, the Riverlands from the Freys and the Throne from the Lannisters and the Tyrells. As I said before, we are in this war together, and we will succeed together. Side by side. Father and son. The prince stared at his father hard. Jacob could not believe he came from such a hard man like Stannis Baratheon, 
and that this man was his father. The young man was always reminded of the dangers of the battlefield, but he was a man and was ready for it. Prince Jacob peered closer at his father's map to show the detailed positions of all the points surrounding Deepwood Mott, and where the Ironborn will be at their most vulnerable when the battle commenced. The surrounding Wolfswood will have the Northmen ready to eliminate any reaver caught trying to escape to their ships. They were the last trueborn Baratheons, alongside Shireen. Jacob was the heir of a dying house. And knew how valuable he was to be securing the future of House Baratheon for his sister to grow up in a better world without cruel nobles and ass-licking schemers around and for his uncle Robert to be avenged from the dishonor of being made a motley for the Lannisters and his inept counselors. I never thought about Uncle Renly. He was my uncle, but he was a traitor. The man could have laid down his claim and supported his kin, but he chose his fate by claiming the crown for himself. I know the Tyrells better than Uncle Renly claimed to have they only chose him because he was easy to manipulate and bend. If he sat on the Iron Throne, with his lover as Lord Commander, a small council filled with reach men and the fat flower as his hand of the king. The prince didn't want to worry himself with these thoughts. Of the uncle, he had a troubled relationship with. It was never easy, being around the uncle that stole his birthright and Uncle Robert allowed it to happen this way. The only time Uncle Renly spoke kindly towards Jacob was when Renly tried to tempt him into soiling his honor and betraying his father three years ago. Are you prepared for battle? King Stannis questioned he wasn't man for sentiment, but for Jacob it was an exception because he was his son. I'm ready to do what it takes to return the stronghold back to the Glovers. They would be thankful for us ridding Deepwood Mott and the Wolfswood of Ironborn Reavers. You will meet Lord Arnulf soon, along with his sons to discuss the marriage arrangements. There is no better bride for you than Lord Ricard's daughter. I want you to put all thoughts on the Mandalay issue behind you. The prince groaned under his breath. He did not like being talked down to, as if he was a child. He knew at the back of his mind, this Arnulf Karstark was not to be trusted. Why would this man openly declare for his father? Knowing the last remaining son of Ricard Karstark was still a prisoner of the Lannisters and he could have been eliminated for that declaration. If the lawful heir of Carhold was dead, then Alice was the rightful heir being Lord Ricard's daughter, putting her above Arnulf and his ingrate sons in terms of the lawful succession. His father Stannis did not want to listen, knowing how Arnulf pledging himself to his cause mattered more to him than the dangerous plots surrounding him. Lord Wyman decided to bluff my fealty with flowery words of being scared and a coward. I may allow the man to pledge his loyalty to me, but I must meet the Karstark girl for myself, to see if she will be a good queen for you. King Stannis grumbled. At least, you are speaking some form of sense. You may not know Lord Arnulf, but I know men like him. I was surrounded by them, since I was a child and learned from them. He must want something in return for his fealty and marrying Alice off to me. Prince Jacob said. He wants something all men want. A chance to climb higher in the Game of Thrones, Jacob. You are a player of the game, you should know. The Lannisters' days are numbered. If Lord Arnulf becomes the uncle of a future legitimate queen, then the Karstarks will advance, like the Florence when I married your mother. The talk of marriage was uncomfortable for Jacob. Especially with a father like Stannis, a man not for having these kinds of talks. The prince lowered his head, not wanting to hear any longer about the suspicious Karstark lord. All Jacob wanted to focus on was the battle for Deepwood Mott, the seat of House Glover, which was been stolen by the Ironborn. These were warriors, his father Stannis, Uncle Robert and Ned Stark fought on the Iron Islands, during the Greyjoy Rebellion. His father had told him stories of that war and how it established his reputation as a great battle commander by defeating Victorian Greyjoy, the captain of the Iron Fleet and a reaver who was a challenge for him. As a young child, Jacob looked up to his father as a hero, when he heard of his accomplishments, during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Defeating a Greyjoy, let alone the captain of the Ironborn's most prized fleet was an impressive feat. The prince hoped to succeed, and crush the reavers like his father and Uncle Robert did years ago. This time will be Balon Greyjoy's daughter he might be fighting in the Wolfswood with a steel sword in his hands. The prince heard of how the salt-smelling Craven's daughter is the captain of her own ship, and has eliminated men on ironborn reaving missions. 
he was gladdened in his heart to finally have someone worth fighting and killing on the battlefield. Prince Jacob stood beside his father Stannis to look through last-minute details of the map, on the crafted table. He took a deep breath, not one to be nervous before a battle, not after fighting three battles during this war. This battle was going to make him, to spread the terror of the Lord of the Storm and Fury tearing through the Ironborn with his sword and standing on their blooded corpses. Are you sure, this is the way, my prince? Sorel asked, being uncertain with the surroundings being unfamiliar to him. The prince and his shield were stationed in the Wolfswood, in the dark and a host of 1,200 men behind them. Prince Jacob was not afraid of the dark forest, for he was a stag and the forest is the home of the sigil to his house. He wanted to take his part of the force here, whilst his father was leading the recruited northmen at the gates of Deepwood Mott, but at the back of his mind, he knew the Ironborn would not surrender peacefully, for they were proud people. Prince Jacob was sharpening his sword on a whetstone his darkened sapphire blue eyes were looking upon the sword. A weapon that has eliminated wildlings, Lannister men at arms and Whitehill soldiers. It was a fine weapon, from the cutthroats of House Tyrell and it still looked as good as new. The young man was shivering under his furs, but they were not as heavy for he had to be able to fight on the field. He was in his antlered armor, the one forged for him by Uncle Robert. It was in a color or furnished gold, and its crafted antlers on the stag made it look fearsome on his chest. His antlered helm was upon his head, with locks of his black hair resting on his shoulders. Jacob did not think himself a fine man, only focused on his ugly flaws. It was the source of his envy for Uncle Renly, the pretty boy knights of the South and Rob Stark. To everyone else, he was a spiteful and vindictive boy. It is the way, Sorel. With father wasting his time at the gates I led my part of the host here. The ironborn are prideful and will never surrender so easily. The castle will be overwhelmed with my father and the northmen, but the ironborn cunts will try and escape to their ships. If I find them, then they will be put the torch and crew members to be slain. Prince Jacob suggested, with a smirk appearing between his dry lips. You smile, my prince. You look forward to fighting the craven pirate's daughter. The knight said. I have spent much of this war fighting greenish Lannister boys, savage wildlings and incompetent Whitehills. I am a warrior trained by Randall Tarley. I am the nephew of the man, who eliminated Rieger Targaryen and the son of the man, who defeated the captain of the Iron Fleet. I finally have an enemy worth fighting and worth killing on the field. I warned you on the way to Wool's Keep. And I will warn you again, your overconfidence and brashness will have you in the grave earlier than you would have liked. The prince did not care for what Sorel said. He was only his sworn shield, a man from the Shield Islands and not Ser Davos. No matter how hard he tries to be what Davos has been for him. It made him miss the Onion Knight even more and wished his father had not sent him away so far from him. Prince Jacob saw the shining glint from his sword limos he had been given the sword for his fifteenth name day and kept it as his primary weapon. The prince also carried his bow and arrow holding the weapon in his hand made his mind think of the traitor great uncle who gave it to him. Lord Alistair was a traitor. He had sold father out for a chance to regain his lands again. This man was my great uncle, but he would have sold Shireen and I for power and brightwater keep. Being burned alive was the punishment for such a man a man who betrayed his king and his house. The young man was warmed by the lit fire. Prince Jacob did not like the fire much it had its purpose for keeping the hearth and the home warm. He saw the flames, as a symbol of everything that has gone wrong with his life and how the people in his life are falling under the spell of a demon witch. Prince Jacob's eyes were caught on the horizon it may have been the night, but a blaze of orange and red flame peered in the distance. A fire was lit in the distance, and Jacob saw something burning from afar. He did not know what it was, but something was put to the torch to stop the ironborn. The prince's guilt, of almost allowing the red woman to seduce him gave him bad dreams. She had found his most vulnerable spot he was lucky to not have let her do any more with him. Underneath the grim face and the sharp blade was a man, whose heart is in great ruin. He cannot be attached to the sworn shield defending him, he cannot trust his northern allies and he cannot trust himself. Your grace, we must move. Our scouts have reported some ironborn men sneaking into the woods, and attempting to run to their ships. 
Sorel foretold. Do you know what was on fire? Prince Jacob asked. I have no idea, my prince. It does not matter now, the remaining ironborn forces are going to come here and we must eliminate them all. The prince understood why Sorel wanted blood he heard things, among his southerners of the mad crow eye returning to the iron islands and is now in possession of the iron fleet, and is terrorizing the reach. The shield islands were the first victims of this madman on his ravaging campaign through the most fertile lands of the seven kingdoms. His faithful knight never spoke about home, but his relatives were being terrorized by this faithless reaver. The prince needed Sorel Grimm with him on the field, to protect him if anything went wrong and he was in trouble. Men of the king, we shall cross further into the wolfswood. The ironborn lack honor and the numbers able to defeat us. We shall be feasting on their corpses tonight, after I give you this victory, like the victory at Iron Wrath and beneath the wall. As your future king, I will fight beside my men and push the ironborn out of the north. The prince exclaimed, raising his shining sword above him. The men cheered for their prince, and Prince Jacob's face was glowing with a smile. For the first time, he senses himself to be the stronger man he always wanted to be. The prince stood tall and proud on a rock, with his sword in front of him. Jacob knew the great battle was ahead, and he was to lead the men to the victory he promised them. The prince, his knight and his host began trekking through the wolfswood. The darkened trees sent shivers down Jacob's spine. It was a foreign realm to him, being a worshipper of the faith he gestured for his men to trek in silence and they began walking past the trees and the howls and growls in the distance began to spook the men, but most of the men in Jacob's host were southerns. The pounding of feet in the snows was what the prince heard. He motioned Sorel and his men to come forth, even though the southerns are in unfamiliar territory. Prince Jacob missed his horse Misty she was a good horse and was always there for him. He made the choice to leave her, he did not want his horse to be caught up in the violence. Jacob heard of stories of how Ironborn never lacked the taste for horse flesh and did not want his faithful companion becoming a reaver's meal. Sorel held a flamed torch, wanting to provide a guide for his prince. Prince Jacob never thought much of his sworn shield. The man did his duty and did it well. There was no need for him to become more than his ally and protector on the field. His father Stannis told him attachments were weakness, and he believed it to be true. No one wanted to be a true friend, because it would call for his guard to be let down and he let his walls down for Desmar Redwine and it got him nowhere. My prince, shall I hand the torch to another man? I am to protect you from the ironborn. Sorel exclaimed. You shall, my faithful knight. Prince Jacob replied, and Sorel passed the torch on to another man. The prince saw footprints on the ground. It must be Iron Islander tracks. Most of them were foolish enough to leave their tracks open. Prince Jacob learned from the Lord of Horn Hill about how to track down prey for a hunt. His fostering in the reach gave him more sufficient skills, than if he had been fostered at court with his uncle. Jacob became a man by learning swordplay hunting and listening through the walls of High Garden, whenever Mace Tyrell had his bannermen around him. His eyes caught on passing silhouette in the dark, and knew it was one of the escaping ironborn. He whistled, alerting Sorel and his men to come forward, with them being closer to their enemies by a mile away. The prince took a deep breath, he could feel the blood rushing through his body. The same feeling fighting beneath the wall brought him. His battle skill was improving, but his mind was the greater strength of knowing people and finding their weaknesses and flaws to use against them. A man wearing armor of the Kraken engraved on it foolishly ran towards Jacob, but the prince unsheathed his sword to cut the man at the side of his head. The prince gestured his men to attack, with a horde of ironborn coming towards his men with battle axes in their hands. The two hordes of men clashed against each other with the prince and Sorel following the men onto the two forces. The trotting of some on horseback and the clanging of metal was an all-familiar sound to Prince Jacob. It was the sound of battle and war, something he could process as he has been in three battles and has secured a victory in the recent fight at Iron Wrath and High Point. The prince ran into the pit of where his men and the iron men were fighting, and had his steel sword limos in his hand. Prince Jacob clashed his sword against an axe-wielding iron man, whom was taller than he was. His blade blocked the attack by the man's axe, and stood sideways for the Iron Man's weapon to miss. 
The stag of Dragonstone's helm was still on his head, with his eye focused on the enemy. The prince saw an opening at the tall man's armor, with it not being properly fitted and it not being made of the finest material for protection. The Ironborn were a proud lot and didn't care for who they call Greenlanders, an affectionate name given to people like Jacob and others in the Seven Kingdoms. Prince Jacob's blade pierced the man's breast with a swift blockade of his axe attack. The scent of blood was present on the field, with the Iron Men dying around him and the Reavers being outnumbered by the men of Jacob and his father Stannis with the Northmen at Deepwood Moth. The prince could see some of the Northmen in the fray of the battle. Some were the men of House Forrester and House Little, with the prince recognizing their sigils on the breastplates of the men battling the Ironborn Reavers. Sorel. The prince yelled, in the midst of the men in his host sounding the battle cry, joining forces with the Northmen. The rush of adrenaline went through him and the trickling of blood touching his tongue from the heat of the battle. The young man's armor was the same he wore, when he defeated the wildlings. Jacob caught his eye on another brutish iron man running towards him, but the prince swiftly swung his sword, only for the man's axe to be bigger than his head in size. The brute force of the weapon was thundered against the prince, knocking him down onto the ground with his antlered helm falling from his head. Prince Jacob's eyes looked up at the brute warrior, who knocked him down. The man stood above him with a gleeful smile on his face. His teeth looked to have rotted from being an ironborn pirate. Any last words, stag whelp? The brutish man huffed, in a laugh. Holding his axe above the prince. This was not how Jacob wanted to die on the battlefield, at the hands of some ironborn, who was not Balon Greyjoy's daughter or someone worthy enough to eliminate him. The force of the big axe against his armor radiated an aching pain through his body. His eyes widened, wanting to look in the face of the man about to send him into the next life. The prince began to close his eyes, not wanting to see the blood and grief on the faces of his men, especially his close ally Sorel Grimm when he died. Jacob saw the sharp end of a sword piercing the midsection of the brute, who wanting to eliminate him. His eyes were widened and he dropped his axe. The brutish man himself eventually fell dead onto the ground. The prince wrapped his arm around his chest and crawled away backwards having the use of his feet to help him move away from whomever eliminated this man. The man falling revealed a familiar face. The man was dark of eyes and orange-reddish of hair with slender of build with his sword in his hand. His coat of arms and his armor bared the green sea turtle of House Estermont, the house of his late grandmother Lady Cassana. The man was good-looking, but not on the level of handsomeness as his late uncle Renly and Rob Stark. He gave the prince his hand and Jacob accepted his hand, and pulled himself on his feet to see the man in face. Cousin Luther, I thought you were at Deepwood Mott with my father. Jacob exclaimed, not expecting to see his cousin from the stormlands here in the Wolfswood. You needed assistance, Jake. You could have died the man's axe is bigger than a cart. Said Luther. We must go. I saw the Greyjoy girl, not far from here. If you are thinking of fighting her, you are a bigger fool than I thought. If you do, I will come with you, as your kin. Jacob and Luther ran across the field of the Wolfswood, with iron men and northmen raging around them, with swords and axes fighting another. The two men had their swords, and cut down every iron man in their path. The prince had not seen his cousin, since Luther was knighted by his uncle. His cousin Luther was one of the king's men of his father's army, a man devoted to his faith in the seven. The prince seeing him was bittersweet because the man's brother Sir Andrew had sailed away across the narrow sea, being the guardian and shield of Uncle Robert's idiot Edric Storm. The men were in the thick of the battle, with iron men falling and northmen crying in cheers of victory for every crack and solitor that fell. Prince Jacob and Luther were cutting down the men, who dared to attack them from behind. The prince's sword limos, shone brightly in the darkness of the northern wolfswood. His sword clashed against an iron man with a broadsword. Jacob's sword maneuvered the man's sword, in order for the prince to strike a deadly blow against the man. His eyes were feasted upon the crows flying around the fighting. Black creatures, whom would feast on the dead. Prince Jacob's eyes were fixed on the dead iron men littering around, with the northmen fighting ferociously with their swords and axes, most of them were mountain clansmen. At the corner of his eye, the prince of the Iron Throne saw a woman on the field, clad in chainmail. 
She was lean and long-legged, whilst she had her shield and an axe in her hand. Her hair was black and cut short, for she could have been mistaken for a man. She adorned the golden kraken sigil on her, signifying her to be iron-born and an important one, with some iron men flanking towards her. Prince Jacob held on to his sword, not keeping his eye of the woman, not for a second. He charged straight towards her, with Luther following behind him. The young man had no time look for Sorel, not when he is close to slaying a worthy opponent. He still had his eye on the woman, and he was not going to lose focus. The prince wanted to finish what Uncle Robert could not do, do what his father Stannis wanted to do at the end of the Greyjoy Rebellion it was to eliminate the Greyjoy line. The prince's sword battered against the Greyjoy woman's axe, with her blocking his attack. Jacob was not fooled into lose focus, when fighting her. Not when her family were full of cutthroats and killers. The taste of blood tricking from his nose and touching his tongue gave him a surge of adrenaline through his body. He liked the taste of his own blood, and his sword cutting men down. Prince Jacob held on to limos, whilst face to face with the Greyjoy woman he never cared to know her name, why would he if he was to eliminate her? He maneuvered himself to the left side, with the woman striking her axe against him. The prince's eyes were still and eagle-eyed focused on her. The young man did not have his antlered helm, with it falling on the field. The tresses of his black hair were lifted by the cold winds of the wolfswood. The scent of blood and death was in the air, with various men dying around them. Jacob raised his sword to deliver an attack against the axe. The Greyjoy woman held her shield, whilst the prince's sword slashes against the woman's cheek, which sparked the anger in her darker eyes. Jacob saw the blood trickling down her face a glint of a smile was appearing on his lips, his blooded red lips. Her axe swung over him, with him ducking and kicking off the woman's shield and clanging his sword against her axe. The prince's armor was light for him to maneuver his sword around and be able to miss the woman's axe by the inch of his face. Prince Jacob heard a battle cry sounded by the Northmen from the mountains. It echoed through the woods in the midst of the stench of rotting corpses in the air. Had Jacob been a boy of four and ten, in his first battle, then would he have been sick. From the stench and the clanging of metal in his ears. His knee was bent into the ground, breathing through the cold air of the north. Jacob glared into the eyes of his opponent, with blood rushing through every entry of his body. Her axe was raised to strike against him, but the attack was blocked by the shielding on his sword against it. The prince clenched his teeth, gritting the aches and pains of his body in this armor and fighting this battle. Ready to die, Greenlander. The woman said, in a haughty smirk. It was obvious Jacob did not intend to die in the north, surrounded by strange creatures to feast on his dead flesh at winter. The prince swiveled his sword, and his stance to knock off the shield from the Greyjoy woman's left hand, and now he had the advantage over his opponent. His sword battering against the woman's axe with blow and after blow. His hand clenched onto his sword tightly in his grasp. The prince was gaining on the woman with clang after clang with his sword against her axe. He picked up a lone shield from the ground, and held it against himself. Jacob's eyes saw the ironborn axe come for him. The young warrior battered the shield against the axe, causing it to fall from the woman's hand. He had his sword up close to him. Jacob saw the woman on the ground, hoping to have a good death, but her leg to be twisted from her fall. Ready to meet your sea god, Reaver. Jacob grunted, raising his sword for the blow to finish her off. And then he heard the call of a trumpet. It was not any old trumpet, but it was the horn of his father King Stannis signaling the battle of Deepwood Mott and the Wolfswood to be over. Chapter 44 King Stannis had awoken from his slumber this morning. Days after spending almost a moon or two trekking through the harsh snowstorms from Deepwood Mott to this small encampment, which is where his southern soldiers and his northern allies were stationed. The watchtower he slept in was warmed by the morning fire started by his new squire, after Brian Faring died from scumming to the cold. It had not been the same, since Devon was left behind at Castle Black, even though the boy had been his son's squire. There were other boys in the barracks, willing to replace him in serving the rightful prince and the king whenever they were of use to them. The Northmen and the Southerns had to make their own tents for the duration of their time here, as there was not enough room in the watchtower for all of them. It was a practical solution to a niggling problem Stannis had solved in a fortnight. 
He was a rational man, never one to second-guess anything. He was absolute in all the decisions he made and stuck true to his words, even though there are those in his army that disagreed with his choices as of late. The battle at Deepwood Mott is nothing to boast about. There were minimal ironborn soldiers garrisoning the castle, as the rest of them and their ships were commanded by the returned exiled brother of Balon Greyjoy. The ironborn woman is my hostage, and she will be of use to whatever I see fit for her. Retaking Deepwood Mott was almost bloodless, with only a few losses in comparison to the ironborn, who were eliminated by the men led by his son Prince Jacob in the Wolfswood. Many of the Southerns thought his son was Robert's shade back from the dead to smash the thieving iron and all her remaining men, and it was true. No matter who exaggerated the rumors were. It bothered the king deeply, to know his son was gaining glory for himself and did not care for the consequences of his actions. It was the fury Jacob inherited from his side of the family, and he unleashed that fury upon the iron-born men and the coward Lud Whitehill's men at High Point. Stannis had no use for glory himself he was a middle-aged king with more important things to focus his attention on, but for the younger men in his ranks, it was all they thought of. It was truly foolish when they would cheer for their own triumphs, even though he had victories at High Point. Deepwood Mott and the Wall they were minimal in comparison to the great victory he was seeking when Winterfell was retaken and the Boltons and Freys were only rotting corpses in the snows. The king noticed his son was gone. Being alone in the watchtower gave Stannis time to prepare for the war meeting later. Stannis was used to Jacob being gone for long periods of time, because he had responsibilities to handle, in terms of keeping the men of Rolaller and the Seven from fighting each other and making sure Asha Greyjoy stays in her place. The capture of the woman was not hard, as Jacob fought her in her middle of the wolf's wood and his sword slashed her cheek in the middle of the duel, causing her to slip and almost be eliminated before the horn was sounded, ending the battle. Stannis was not blind to the attention the Greyjoy woman was giving to his son, as told to him by the Grey Shield Knight. It confirmed his reasonable doubts about whether he made the right choice in marrying Jacob off to the Karstarks for an alliance. He knew his soldiers had camp followers and whores in their tents, for the men to relieve themselves of the stresses of war and being a solitor. On the other hand, an iron-born woman, a Greyjoy giving his son the same look whores give to his soldiers before they end up betting them. It was a sign of trouble and it needed to be stamped out right now. The king had no time to be dealing with his prisoner, when he had to prepare for war on Winterfell, which was guarded by the forces of Roose Bolton and his northern traders. Stannis kept his thoughts of the Karstarks at the forefront, as Lord Arnolf and his sons were coming to discuss the marriage arrangement in more detail and what would the benefits of their alliance bring to his cause. As a man of considerable pride, Stannis would not admit to Jacob's face of him being right about the Manderleys being better allies in the long term. Because of their considerable coin and capability in helping him survive the winter and the dowry offered by Lord Wyman would be better than the one offered by the Karstarks. I am surrounded by fools and fanatics. The only ones with brains are the Grey Shield Knight and the son of Lomas Estermont. The Northmen tire of arguing with the Queen's men every day and are close to declaring war on them. It's good Jacob is there to stop the disputes between both sides and become a mediator between them. My son is the reason why the king's men and the queen's men have not fought each other, during the war. Of fear of disappointing their rightful prince and future king. It was that fear that kept them in line. The king's deep-seated envy towards his son was not at the center of his attention, until after the Battle of Deepwood Mott. Stannis knew it was wrong for him to be jealous of his own son, but it was the same jealousy he held towards Robert as a child. It was not Jacob's fault he was an exceptional warrior and leader. It was his duty to be a leader as the future king of the Seven Kingdoms and this was great preparation for Jacob to learn how to be a commander and leader. Stannis knew his son was more content than before, due to the Lady Melisandre being commanded to stay at the Wall and having to part with his squire Devon Seaworth. Jacob knew not to get attached to people because of the circumstances of the war and how betrayals can happen so quickly when loyalty is thrown to the side for a grasp of power. It was power and disloyalty that sealed the fate of Alistair Florent for his treason against Stannis and his family. He never regretted the man's death because it was what he deserved for what he had done writing letters to Tywin Lannister in selling both his children Jacob and Shireen to the Lannisters as hostages and nearly ruining his cause. The man was disowned by his brother, his niece, 
great-nephew and condemned by the very king, whose banners he went over to after Renly's death. Stannis had not seen the Karstark girl for himself, but he expects Lord Arnulf and his sons to bring the girl over after they have recaptured Winterfell from the Boltons. It was better if he had seen her for himself, so he could inspect whether the girl was good enough for his son or not. The thoughts of Ser Davos plagued the king day and night. Of why the Onion Knight was still absent from his side. Did he succeed in following his son's plot to supplant his already planned arrangement with the Karstarks to do what Jacob asked of him? Ser Davos has known Jacob, since he was a babe and would never refuse any order his son gave to the knight. At least, with the Northerners in the War Council, things could get interesting with the conflicting opinions and thoughts on what they will do about this stormy weather. Stannis does not have the patience to deal with the Queen's men stirring trouble between themselves and the Northerners, who worship their old gods as deeply as Jacob does with the Seven. The new squire was not as slow as the faring boy, who perished out in the storm. The boy was not even a knight, and most of his men would not give a damn about him, even though many others died in the snowstorm as well. The king could see the tents outside of the watchtower window. Most of the tents were covered in a sheet of white snow that men had to dig their way out from being trapped inside. He entrusted the Mormont warrior woman to keep an eye on his prize and keep her leering eyes away from him son. Stannis would not think of it, his son wedded to ironborn scum like her and the rest of her kind it could be the reality if he is not vigilant in not paying more attention to Jacob's day-to-day -day activities. It has been too long. Jacob has been unmarried, since the war began, and time was running out. If his lady wife Celis had her way, then their son would settle down to a southern bride of her choosing and not marry northerners at all. The king expected it at the beginning with his wife and good family, the Florence being southerners and valuing their own over all others. He understood they all wanted Jacob to settle down to someone, who would do what is expected of a highborn bride and birth the next generation of Baratheon progeny. The last thing Stannis would want to see before his eventual death is to meet his grandchildren before the stranger takes him. The rightful king was capable in doing things for himself, but the gauntness in his features suggested he was feeble and haggard. They were the symptoms of being out in the elements too long and was what caused Stannis to be more tired more often. He never told anyone apart from Jacob. Staying in the watchtower was good for the king's recovery from trekking through the storm and leading a pack of fools, who do not know where left and right were most of the time. Having the northerners on his side improved things. The northmen were accustomed to the cold and were able to march through the storms better than the king's southerns. Stannis looked out of the window of the watchtower, to glimpse the winds blowing in the direction of the minimal campfires being lit in the night. He suspected the queen's men were starting the fires and using the flames to pray to the Lord of Light for whatever favors he could bestow on his most faithful in these times. The king made his way to the bigger of the tents put up in the middle of the encampment. It was one belonging to the umber forces brought by Moore's Crow Food. It was larger than the other tents and the banner of the great giant in chains was flapping in the cold winds. Stannis was grateful for the new additions to his slow, expanding army. To the right of the king, the banners of other northern houses were flapping in the winds as well. The bear of House Mormont, the fist of House Glover, the black bullmoose of House Hornwood. The green sentinel trees of House Tallheart and the white tree of House Forester were among the smaller northern banners, whom have joined the king in rebellion against House Bolton. The gathering of the northmen and the king's southern men were amassed inside the tent, as the king entered with his penny squire standing behind him, with a frightened look on his face and it made the king grit his teeth in silence. Stannis was not wasteful of the potential skilled workers within his army and only hired the most competent boy to replace the squire that died days ago. The prince was present amongst the men and stood at the right side of the head of the table he had the grey shield knight and Lomas Estermont's son next to Prince Jacob. Stannis never cared to ask what the red-haired boy's name was for it was not important, even though the boy was one of his many cousins from his lady mother's maiden house. The men began to sit in their place, even though there were not enough wooden chairs for all. At the head of the table opposite the king sat Moore's crowfood umber, with most of his men by his side. The man was old with a ruddy face and a shaggy white beard. His lost eye looked to be hidden with a stained white leather eye patch. He was a strong and powerful man, as he was adorned a cloak made from the skin of a snow bear, with its head worn as a hood. This was the man, who agreed to join Stannis, if his brother, 
the whore's bane was pardoned for fighting under duress for the Boltons. The king knew the Umbers were staunch Northmen, with a strong hatred for wildlings and prissily Southerns, who cannot keep up with them. Stannis had to tread carefully, as the queen's men could ruin everything with a stroke of a sword. The king sat with his son to right and the Sir Richard Horp to his left side. The man on his left was obedient to the king and followed his orders without a question, but he was a queen's man, which made him an adversary to the king's men. Your grace, if it be prudent for most of us to go back to Deepwood Mott or some other keep for warm shelter, until this terrible storm passes. The lording Robin Peasberry was the first to speak, and his eyes were shifting, and fingers were shaking. And what come all this way for nothing? You Southerns have no sense of honor or bravery. Artos Flint replied. It was your savage tree gods that brought this storm upon us. How long can we sit here until Bolton's soldiers come out and slaughter us? Corliss Penny said, in defiance of the Northmen. My lords, please. We must remain level-headed. We are fortunate to have the forces of Hornwood, Umber and Mormont on our side. This settlement is only temporary until Lord Arnulf and his forces arrive to our side. Prince Jacob interjected. How are we going capture Winterfell, when we are stuck with the Greyjoy slacker, who contributes nothing? The iron should burn, we should give her to the Lord of Light. Get the wench of our back so we can focus on the Boltons and them damned phrase. Sir Godry Faring demanded, slamming his fist on the table. Why not use her as bait for the Boltons? And lose the prize of our victory in the Wolfswood and devalue the prince's bravery in fighting the ironborn scum. Hugo Wool said, in a gruff tone. What of you, Moore's Crow Food? You say would join us and our rightful sovereign in fighting the Boltons, but your brother fights for them and that makes you a traitor. The giant slayer said. I, it is true what you say, giant man. My brother only fights for the Boltons because the damned Freys have the Great John and much of the Umber strength in dungeons. I would advise you to think before you say anything else. Moore's Crowfood said, in an iron tone. Similar to the tone Stannis would use when talking to his own men. It seems Sir Godry, you allowed the Slade Giant to cloud your mind, to where you think you have the audacity to disrespect our northern allies, especially ones who have risked much to join us. The king's son argued back at the giant's lair. I am only looking out for the best interests of your father, your grace. We do not need skimping traitors in our ranks, we already have that sworn shield of yours, a reach man in our ranks. The king listened to the sentiments of the queen's men loud and clear. His fingers were crossed over each other, as he watched his son's eyes glaring at Sir Godry for his comment. It was typical of the Queen's men to do when it came to having close-minded views on everything. The men, who worshipped the Red God were more under control, when under the leadership of Ser Axel, but the man was at the wall with his lady wife Celis and daughter Shireen. It would have been better to send the Reach man there as well to keep watch over his daughter. The man being here did not ease Stannis's doubts about him. The night became more of an emotional pillar for his son, when the king had not been the supportive father he should have been for Jacob. It had been Stannis's own pride that led him to becoming slightly envious towards his son and his shield. Ser Sorel is a valuable knight and has done more for the king's cause, than you flame-worshipping sacks have done. The Estermont boy said, addressing Ser Godry to his face. Anyways, the Lord of Light demands a worthy sacrifice for the storms to clear out. The Greyjoy woman has king's blood, a false king but king's blood nonetheless. One burning could benefit the rest of us long term. Corliss said. There will be no burnings today, nor will the Greyjoy woman be your father. She may be ironborn, but she is highborn and will be my hostage for the time being. The king interjected, with the queen's men shrinking back and were not bold enough to speak against the king. How are we going to survive here, your grace? The fish in the lakes are running out and our food rations are not enough. Lord Robin complained. We will make do with what we have, unless Lord Arnolf arrives with more food in his stores and more furs to keep us warm. Sir Justin Massey replied. Staying in the encampment will do us ill, it would be better if we discussed how we will defeat the Boltons with the Freys and other traitor northerners on their side. 
Ser Corliss, the reason why the traitors are fighting for the Boltons is the same reason why Hother Horsbane is on their side. Fear and having much more to lose than the rest of us. The others will abandon them, unless Roos Bolton is dead and their front lines are broken. Prince Jacob said. We have an advantage over the Boltons. Experienced commanders and men fighting for us. Roos Bolton relies on his fry good family to lead his armies and we have veteran Northmen, who have fought in these conditions before. Only the foolish would poke the leech lord into an open battle and will die for it. Ser Sorel announced. What right do you have to speak amongst us, reach man? Your family is sworn to the Tyrells, the king's true enemies. Lord Robin said accusingly. I have as much right to be on this table than most. I have been fighting alongside the king, since I brought his son back from Old Town. I was there when we forced the wildlings to run back to their pitiful tents, and I was there when we pushed the Ironborn and took the lands of High Point. I am more capable of being on the king's side than some of you. Sorel is right, Lord P. We have to strategize, this battle will be like no other. It will be the battle that makes us or that battle that we will fall on. The Karstarks will give us more men to fight for us and we will have enough to break through Bolton's lines. The Estermont boy said, in a confident tone. Prince Jacob stood up, as he was on the king's right side. The storm may delay us for a while, but we have to make do with what we have the extra food stores will arrive soon, we have enough men, weapons and horses brought from the northern houses, who have declared for us. The rest of my forces will start building the trenches, and the fry bastards will not know what hit them, when they fall and break their feeble bones. Moore's Crowfood said, in a booming tone, eliciting cheers from the Northmen. The king may have led the war councils at the beginning of the War of the Five Kings, but he was more than willing to sit and observe how his son was controlling the situation. It was a test for Jacob to see whether he could handle the pressure of talking amongst many men. Stannis may have not taken notice of the Estermont knight, but the boy had more brains than half of his southern forces. My son has done well to keep control of things. He has to learn to keep these men in line, if he ever thinks about ruling seven kingdoms when I depart from this world. I trust the Estermont boy to be a friend to my son rather than the Reach man, who has been protecting him. The king was surrounded by idle fools and fanatics, but he was fortunate in having most of the king's men with him on this journey south from Deepwood Mott. On the other hand, the queen's men were the minority amongst the various northmen and southerns brought from Dragonstone and the men he had left from Blackwater Battle. Stannis knew it was not enough to fight the Boltons, who had the Freys, the Whitehills, the Riswells, and the Dustins on their side. The king knew his son had a talent of persuasion, as it was something Jacob learned from his time with the Tyrells and perfected the skill of deception better than the faltering John Aaron or the limbering Ned Stark. The war meeting was disbanded, and the men began exiting the tent in their respective groups, according to their regional loyalties. It was almost time for the midday meal and to eat whatever was left of the food stores from Deepwood Mott. This war council was different to the others Stannis had been a part of in the past, because it was more about Jacob taking the reins and proving himself to have become the man he was meant to be for his house. The war meeting had been over for a long period of the day. King Stannis had finished his evening meal with his son Prince Jacob present, alongside the knights Luther Estermont and Sorel Grimm. The two of them had the privilege in sharing meals with the king, as Luther was kin to Stannis through his mother's maiden house and Sorel being one of his more trusting of the king's men and being Jacob's sworn shield. The long table was made of wood and not of great finery, as the watchtower was made to be an outpost for northerners to see their enemies in the distance. The meal for the night was roasted venison, with the leftover vegetables that were not ruined by the long trek through the north's worst snowstorm in decades. To Stannis, food was a means to survive and was not for pleasure he saw that gluttonous eating had turned Robert into a complacent king, with no regards for his kingdom and keeping his wife's despicable family under control. There were not many servants that travelled south with them, only ones brought by the highborn lords that joined him and ones for himself and his son, being the king and the prince on the road. So uncle, will you face the hideous Roos Bolton in single combat or will he be too much of a coward to face you in an open battle? Luther asked, in a tone laced in arrogance. As I said, I am not your uncle, but your cousin once removed. Stannis replied, in a bitter tone. 
Bad idea, Luther. You know how father gets when people get proper titles and things wrong. The constant need to correct people can irritate you all the time. Jacob said, in a more cheerful tone. With your brother all the way in bravos and the rest of your family being cowards. There might be some hope for you yet. Who is more hideous, Jake? Walder Fry or Roos Bolton? The Estermont Knight said, sniggering T the thought of his redundant question. Both of them will get what is coming to them. Old Walder sent many of his sons, nephews and grandsons to Winterfell with a sizable force. Most of them will be dead by the time the battle is over. Lord Bolton is married to one of Walder Frey's many daughters, and she might make a good hostage next to Asha Greyjoy. What do you suppose we do with her, when we defeat the Boltons and Freys? I hope you have some rational ideas underneath those idioms of yours. The king muttered. The Greyjoy woman will stay wherever you see fit. She is known to be the king's prize, even though I was the one, who defeated her in single combat and captured her in the wolf's wood. Is it praise you want or is it recognition for a victory that was rightfully yours? Men died for me to secure that victory in the wolf's wood. You were right about the ironborn not being underestimated. They are hardened warriors, who will never kneel, especially to us Greenlanders. The Estermont knight placed a hand on Jacob's shoulder. Come on, Jake. We won the battle and the ironborn have been expelled from the north. We have to focus on fighting the Boltons and their fry friends at Winterfell in a few fortnights. Sir Luther, did you flee from Greenstone to join your rightful king, even though others of your house have bowed to the Lannisters? The king asked. I never regretted running away from home. There was nothing for me in Greenstone anymore. With my brother, Sir Andrew gone, I cannot see myself betraying my own kin. I only joined this war to see my cousin again and to fight alongside him, your grace. And not for personal glory and honor. Good fighters are in short supply and I am fortunate to have one, such as yourself on the field. Sir Luther began pushing Jacob playfully, and the prince smiled at him. What is she like, Jake? The Karstark girl you have to marry. Lord Arnulf and his sons will come to discuss the arrangements in due time. A sufficient dowry was offered in the original agreement in the exchange for his house's fealty to me. Still it's sad, Jake. Being forced to bed a girl so cold, so northern and does not even believe in the same faith as you. King Stannis sensed Luther's humor to come as insulting to him and his authority. He was the one, who decided Jacob to be married to Lord Ricard's daughter and he was not going back on his agreement with the lords of Carhold. The Karstarks have blood relations to the Starks, which is the reason why Stannis chose the Karstarks over the Mandalees for the marriage alliance. The marriage would have complications, due to his son and the bride worshipping different gods. It reminded the king of how Robert was to marry Lyanna Stark and he built a god's wood in Storm's End to win his betrothed's affections. The words of Ser Luther were most convincing to Stannis. He believed the boy to be true to his word, of fleeing from the Stormlords to join him and his son in fighting the Boltons. The king also believed Luther was hungry for glory, like most young men at war. It did not matter because Stannis was not wasteful and good fighters were needed for his cause and having someone from his mother's maiden house on his side might make things better for the short term. The king had no niceties towards House Estermont for bending the knee to Joffrey when the Blackwater was lost, and they bent the knee to the boy King Tommen, cementing their disloyalty to their kin and their rightful king. Sir Luther, you and Sir Sorel are excused to take your leave I would prefer to speak to my son alone and uninterrupted. The king said, in a clear tone. The Estermont knight and the Greyshield man left the watchtower after the evening sup was over. The table and utensils were cleared away by two servants, who were stationed here. Stannis sat on the crooked wood made bed with his arms folded. He was curious to know why Jacob's behavior has changed over the years and how what happened at Wool's Keep could have ruined the alliance with the mountain clansmen for good. The king expected this kind of rebellious behavior from a boy just growing into manhood, but Jacob was a man of eight and ten and there was no excuse for this kind of conduct. He had to approach this with tact, to be nimble and to the point. The king cannot afford to alienate Jacob from his side, as he needed him more than he wanted to admit. The prince sat opposite to his father with a neutral look on his face. As a father, 
Stannis could tell what emotions this son was displaying, without even asking him. It was the ability to read people from seeing how they act and how they present themselves to him. It was how Stannis was able to decipher the despicable from the people, who might not be too bad, compared to the schemers he has come across from his time in court. Jacob's head was lowered, and he was fidgeting with his fingers moving within his hand. He was less than interested in paying attention to whatever Stannis had to tell him. How long have you known about the plot between Davos and I, father? Prince Jacob asked, with his arms folded. I have known, since I sent him away to White Harbor. I do not blame Davos for wanting to assist in finding you a wife, but you need to understand how vital this alliance with the Karstarks is to our cause and to your future as king. You may have accepted them as allies, but I don't. I know Arnulf and his sons are using this alliance as an opportunity to plot against us. Why would they support us, other than getting the rightful Lord of House Karstark eliminated by the Lannisters and they can sell us to the Boltons? You have remained unmarried far too long. It has been my greatest failure, since the war started. Your unmarried status tells our enemies, that you have flaws that make you an unsuitable husband to any woman, but it is my greatest advantage in this war. Is that what I am to you, a tool to be used to gain allies? I bet you do not treat Shireen this way. Jacob gritted between his teeth. The stakes are high in this game and there is a price to play. John Aaron and I made the decision to investigate the legitimacy of Cersei's children, by meeting and looking at Robert's bastards. The price of that decision was the Lord of the Vale ended up dead and I was lucky to be alive and escape to Dragonstone, when I had the chance. What does this have to do with the war now? The past failures will not help us beat Roos Bolton and his mad dog idiot on the field. I do not appreciate this behavior from you, son. I expected this outburst of anger to have come from some unsettled issues from your past. It does come from the past. Prince Jacob shouted, standing up on his feet, glaring at his father. I was humiliated by the incident that happened in the arbor. It was an adolescent mistake that was turned into something it should not have become. You should have known interfering with a pre-made betrothal had consequences, why did you think Robert interfered? It was to preserve the honor of our house and to avoid a war with houses Tarly and Redwine. We should talk about it, father. Not pushing it aside when it's convenient for you. Why was I the one to be punished, whilst other actors of the plot got away with it with no losses to their names? It was the only way to come to a compromise with Redwine. I do not like Redwine, for his crimes of starving your uncle and I during the siege of Storm's End, but he has the second biggest navy in the Seven Kingdoms beneath the Ironborn. A king's nephew or no, everyone has to face the consequences for their actions. Renly's death was the consequence of his treason against us and Robert's death was the consequence of turning blind to how power-hungry the Lannisters were. I can't believe you are going through with the Karstark arrangement, after everything I told you about them. We should be cautious when Arnulf and his sniveling sons come to meet with us. Is that why you told Davos to find you a wife from House Manderley, knowing Lord Wyman bluffed my fealty spouting cowardice in my face? Is it because you still hold affection for the Redwine girl, who spurned you? Stannis said, in an iron tone. Desmara was betrothed, and I was foolish enough not to let go sooner. Had I thought through my actions, then things would be different. I should have put my pride to the side and be happy for her and Dickon, but the adolescent in me did not want to let go. You were only young, doing what foolish things young people do. You have grown from the boy raised in the reach and became a man I am proud to call my son. As a man of few words and emotions. I means a lot to hear that from you, father. I thought all my life, you never loved me or appreciated all I have done for you. I should have been thankful for you, for even trying to help me, even though I acted ungrateful towards you. Prince Jacob said, with tears streaming from his eyes. It was not what Stannis expected to see. This outpouring of emotional from his son was foreign to him, as an apathetic king. He could see how it meant more to Jacob to tell him everything, and to not feel the shame of hiding what he was feeling inside him for years. It hurt the king, to even think of his son feeling unloved and only saw himself as a tool to the king's cause. He never thought of Jacob's feelings and never considered them because they were an inconvenience to him as the rightful monarch of the Seven Kingdoms. You made mistakes, Jacob, 
but you have grown up much during this war. Taking command of a host twice. You defeated the Greyjoy woman in single combat and constantly advise me against those who plot against me. What if the Karstarks are playing us false? What if Arnolf is planning on selling Lord Ricard's daughter to one of the northern houses that support the Boltons? We will execute them, if those claims are true and come to light. I had enough of traitors and bootlickers, but I must make use of what the Karstarks will offer to my cause. Never be wasteful of potential allies, Jacob, even when they are people you dislike deeply. There was a sense of optimism within the king, as it was something strange and unlike what Stannis would do in the past. There was a long way to go, until he could sit on the throne he coveted, since this war began. There were also trials to go through to even stand a chance and take Winterfell from the Boltons and sealing an alliance with the North through the act of marriage. As a king, uncompromising leadership was what Stannis always aimed for, but it cannot be at the expense of alienating Jacob from his side. It was what could have happened, if Stannis had not sat there and listened to what his son told him. It was better for the both of them to have some form of closure from the past and bury it where it should be. There was a battle coming, for the fate of the North and it could be the battle that can will make Stannis a legitimate threat to the Lannisters again. Chapter 45 I can't believe I lost again. Sir Luther Estermont yelled, slamming his fist onto the table, as the young knight lost another game of Sivas. The man from Greenstone was an easy opponent to beat, since he was known to lose at the game in the Stormlands. Prince Jacob smiled gleefully at yet another win again his cousin. It was a great way to spend time with the cousin that rebelled against his own house. His time was mostly spent on keeping order within the encampment and keeping an eye on the king's prize hostage. As a man in the middle of war, it was great to find camaraderie among men he could relate to. The prince sensed himself belonging with the Northmen, and them giving that respect back to him. He was still processing the talk he had with his father days ago. It was something Jacob dreaded at the back of his mind, his father was not the most emotive of people. He realized that talking made things better between them, after the tension started to build after they had left Wool's Keep and during the war. The young man chose to ignore the existence of Asha Greyjoy, all because he was focused on killing Boltons and Freys, not on a woman condemned by his father. He hated how he had to spend hours of the day watching her, alongside the she-bear. She was obviously missing her lovers trapped in Deepwood Mott, as he could tell by the forlorn look on her face. Jacob never gave a damn, especially when the men brought whores with them to bed after the battles of Highpoint and Deepwood Mott. As a young man, Jacob was patient in practicing abstinence and refrained from drinking any kind of wine ever. It was a way for him to stay strong, and not give in to the temptations many men indulged themselves in. The prince was growing bored, and Luther was not much company other than beating him at a game of Sivas again. It was hard not having any friends around him, because everyone else obeyed him mindlessly, and it was starting to grate Jacob's nerves a lot. As the king's son, he did whatever he wanted, until his father Stannis needed him or if the Karstark delegation arrived at the watchtower. He was not looking forward to seeing these sniveling men again. The prince would rather fight the battle now, than to deal with the worst lot from a proud northern house. Lord Arnulf, or otherwise known as the blemish on House Karstark and his equally chinless sons Arthur, Cregan and Harold. The old man was petty and the most disreputable northerner he has ever met. What made things even worse was that they were selling off Lord Ricard's daughter to him for an alliance that was only fraudulent as Arnolf's sense of decency towards anyone around him. Jacob was beginning to suffer from the boredom staying in war camps presented. There was nothing to entertain him, apart from antagonizing the Greyjoy woman. It was fun poking the kraken at least twice a day. It was all a game to Asha, who would call him Greenlander or the Sweet Green Prince, even though he was anything but sweet. That word was mostly used to describe men like Loras Tyrell and his uncle Renly, but not the only son of the harshest man in the Seven Kingdoms. Most of his father's soldiers and captains were king's men and had the bigger numbers amongst them. They would pray to the Seven at every rationed meal and when they go to bed at night. This destitute place did not even have a god's wood for the northerners to pray to the old gods whenever they could, but they made do with what they brought with them from the west of the northern mountains. The northerners and the king's men shared their dislike for the queen's men, whom were the minority amongst his father's soldiers, 
which made the arguments a lot harder to diffuse between the two sides. I'm surprised you are not married yet, cousin. I thought with your rivalander looks, you would get a wife before me. Jacob asked. I'm only a knight, Jake. My father is not even the heir to Greenstone, but that title belongs cousin Eamon and the children he has. Luther replied. This is miserable. Can Roose Bolton come out and fight? I'm bored just sitting here. The prince growled, folding his arms across his chest. Tell me about the Karstark girl, your father is forcing you to marry. I met her in Winterfell once, Luther and I'm not sure if I want to marry into House Karstark. I would, to save the girl from whomever of Roose Bolton's allies Arnulf will sell her towards. She lost her father to Rob Stark beheading him, her brothers died in the Riverlands and she will be marrying a southerner, who worships the Undull religion. Did your plot with the Onion Knight work out or did your father put a stop to it? I do not know, Luther. He only spoke about of it days ago and nothing more. My father may be a stubborn man, but he is not stupid. He sees the Mandalis make better allies than the Karstarks in the long term. They have the coin and many of horse and knights to support us, what do the Karstarks have to offer, other than Lord Ricard's grief-stricken daughter? You are a cold man, Jake. No wonder why you are still unmarried. I don't care. I would rather be a spinster for the rest of my life than marry a northerner. I should listen to my mother's idea, wait until the war is over and settle down to a southern bride of her choice, it's better than being stuck with the Karstark girl forever. Before the war started, your wedding would have been a great event. With Robert as king and wanting to make a big deal of everything for his only nephew. Your father would insist you being wed in Storm's End, to respect the ancestors and all, but Renly would be more for Highgarden, with his Tyrell affiliations. Luther said, with a smile on his face. Who would have been the unfortunate bride in that fantasy cousin? No one would be willing to marry someone, who is not the heir of Storm's End nor whom lived on a desolate island of dragon statues and poor prospects. Some reachman's daughter for sure. Those greedy lords would not resist an opportunity to get closer to the royal family. There is nothing more to dwell on. We are in the middle of the worst snowstorm in centuries and we are going to battle two of the worst houses in the Seven Kingdoms. Luther pulled a face that looked like a scowl. You are such a stiff, Jake. Can't even lighten up without your father around. The prince folded his arms. He hated it when anyone would point out his very visible flaws right in his face. Jacob was not the kind of person, who would be nice to anyone, even though some people did not deserve it at all. The world nowadays was a cruel place for people, who were not as ruthless as Tywin Lannister or ambitious as Mace Tyrell. It was the honorable fools, who died in the last four years, and the deaths of Ned Stark, John Aaron, Rob Stark and Oberyn Martell made Jacob more cautious of his moves and to think things through a lot more. It was careful thinking that led to the reclamation of the forester lands from the hands of the grubby White Hills and it led him to his victory in the Battle of the Wolfswood. Prince Jacob was not a man for songs, but he tried to be for his sister's sake. Shireen was just a child princess, who was thrust into a role she did not wish for. The war showed him the heroes in the fictional songs were just fables and fantasies. Being fostered in the reach made Jacob immune to the grandeur of everything around him. Luther was the only ally he had in this desolate war camp, as Sorel was busy being thrust in a leadership position amongst the king's men, who were misguided after the departure of their senior members after the freeing of Edric Storm from Melisandre's grasp. I'm happy for him in truth. Sorel deserves such praise, after everything he went through for me. He is still around and I'm thankful he is here. The night will never be what Davos is for me, and it's okay because Davos will return. The prince and his cousin were amused of how House Frey's remaining heirs will be girls and small boys, because of all the men will be eliminated when the war ended. In Jacob's mind, the Freys were just as bad as the Boltons, but the two houses were welcome to each other. He was bored of waiting for the biggest battle of his life to come faster than he had to wait for Lord Arnolf's Karstark reinforcements to come through for his father with the men and the food stores for them. The young man left the tent. He was too bored even think about spending anyone time with Luther it drove him mad to even play another Sivas game with his cousin any longer. He was desperate for a spark of excitement on this day. It was too boring, 
and he was close to gutting a man for no reason other than perverse boredom. It was not that Jacob hated Luther, but he was grateful for someone to talk to other than Sorel Grimm. He needed to do something with himself, maybe even train for the battle so he does not get slow when it comes to the actual fighting on the field. His swordplay needed work and years of training with Randall Tarley taught him to be aware of his surroundings and to ever miss a step. The prince had to leave his father's side because of boredom and he was in council with the northern lords and the Mormons. It graded him to be dismissed from a council meeting. He would never miss one, since his father began the war, but there must have been a reason for it. Jacob got the idea to start poking at Asha Greyjoy for the fun or it. She proved good conversation, when others around him were too boring and were too afraid to even humor him. The cold didn't bother him because he was used to it. The snowstorm did not let up in the slightest. Jacob was heavily cloaked in two layers of furs to keep him comfortable, and for him to function in the armor beneath the furs. The idea of marrying a northerner was not so well received by Jacob's queen mother Celis, because she wanted him to settle down to a southern bride of her choice. He understood where his mother was coming from. Queen Celis did not begrudge her only son in worshipping the faith she abandoned from her girlhood. Jacob's belief in the seven kept the king's men and the remaining southerners loyal to his father, and maybe being the pious man, he was could have an advantage when it came to convincing the faith itself to depose the Lannisters and Tyrells from the throne. The prince was strolling through the protected encampment his eye was caught on men from the umber ranks passing him by. He wanted to be alone, away from being surrounded by people constantly, during the day. The heir of House Baratheon frowned, seeing a burning ember in the distance in front of him. He was used to the Queen's men making their night fires, but with their current situation of being in a place so cold, no one knew where the sun was in the day. Jacob trekked through however long miles of snow, he could to get a step closer to the burning ember in the distance. His nose was numb to the snowflakes falling upon his face. He brushed the snow from his clothes and his hair. The petulant prince had grown up and was unrecognizable from the boy of five and ten who went to war with his father. There were no mirrors for him to see what he looked like as a man, but he was curious to know. Luther complimented his growing beard, even though it had been trimmed by the clansmen, as a show of gratitude. It was growing past his chin in inches, but the facial hair covered his jawline. The prince took note of his chipped and filthy fingernails, which were pink, due to the severity of the cold. The man knew he changed on the inside, as well as the outside. His heart hardened, from battle after battle. From the blood spilt from his blade, and from maneuvering in court politics to eliminate any potential threats to him and his father's successes. Jacob was happy to have half the credit for the battle victories, but it made him grit his teeth when his father would have more of the credit. He was the one, who was on the front lines, leading the hosts through one bloody battle after another. Jacob was closer to the glowing ember, but it was not light. Not light as in the light that looked like the beacon from the Grand High Tower. It was something brighter than that, as it looked to be another night fire being lit up. The fire was something to behold in the middle of snowstorm, and it was known for the night fires to go out without sufficient firewood. He had no interest in watching foolish men worship at the feet of a demon god, and not even the wise crone could guide these lost souls now. The prince was closer to the fire, and he heard the curling scream enter his ears. He did not care who the queen's men were going to use for their sacrifice fodder, but at least it wasn't Asha Greyjoy. The iron needed to be kept alive, so his father Stannis could show her off in chains to the northern lords, after the reclamation of Winterfell. He found it more difficult to decipher his father because the two separated almost every day, since they got to this encampment. It was better for both father and son not to be around each other so much, it could cause unwanted tension of being stuck together all the time. The wall was cold and miserable, but the worst thing was being stuck with his father in a dreary black castle every day, until his father planned the northern war effort. The prince exhaled out a breath that he could see. Jacob had grown so accustomed to the cold that he almost considered himself to be a northerner in a previous life. Looking at the burning night fire could be the only moment of freedom Jacob had left before he was forced to look upon the hideousness of Arnulf Karstark and his equally ugly brood. The prince had to keep going for as long as he could. There was no way he was going to give up, it was not in his Baratheon nature just to sit there and wait for death to come. He was going to charge towards the stranger when he sees him on the battlefield. 
The idea of death excited Jacob, and he did not dread it as much. As an adolescent, he was afraid of dying because there was so much he wanted to do before his death. He was too young, to have so much responsibility placed on his shoulders, but as his father's only son, he had no choice. He was the heir to a dying house, and he was the key to House Baratheon's surviving after the war ended. I am the rightful heir to House Baratheon and the throne. And I will not be afraid of anything at all. I had to stomach the brutality of war at five and ten, and I had to do what was needed to be done. I eliminated my first man at thirteen and it was a bandit near the gold road. It was the first time I had seen Randall Tarley ever smile with that grim look of his. He was prouder of me than he was of his own sons. The blaze of the nightfire was right in his sight. His nose wrinkled at the smell radiating from the flames, as its putrid scent was of wood burning, and there was a lot of broken crates used by the queen's men to make their flame burn brighter. Jacob had seen plenty of nightfires, especially seeing his mother praying to the red god, alongside the men, who named themselves after her. At corner of his eye, the prince caught a glimpse at the she-bear and greyjoy leech standing as far they could from the sight of the queen's men. Were they planning on burning her, even though his father denied them their thirst for her blood? It would be a shame thought, not have the satisfaction of not dying in battle and only be used as fodder by demon-worshipping fanatics, who were only converted this religion because they were in love with the Red Priestess from As High. Prince Jacob stared hawk-eyed on the few he knew. The ringleader Godry faring with his big puffing chest his right hand Clayton Suggs, who cruelty to him was like wine to a drunkard the cowardly Corliss Penny and Robin Peasbury, the one with no mind of his own. The prince sniffed the air to catch the putrid odor of rotting flesh, as it was prominent. It must have been from the men, whom died from the cold. He did not know the ones, who died, but he knew the ones, who were still living and were in his face. Jacob trekked further to get closer to the rising flames of the nightfire he would not mind if the queen's men were cooking what was left over of the food reserves into one big crockpot to share amongst them. The Lord of Light shall protect us from darkness and halt the storm. Ser Godri said, in a tone that was of a praying man, but a fanatic. The prince observed on his left to see that a few of the queen's men had recognized him from the northmen they were feuding with. Jacob had to stop this before the two side began killing each other, and he did not see any king's men in sight. He tried to be civil with these men, but he could not stand by whilst innocent people were subjected to their torment, all in the name of their god. Your grace, we are glad you arrived. Reason with these savage tree worshippers. Lord Robin said, in a tone that reminded him vaguely of Joffrey's callous way of talking to people. Why? What you done to insult the northerners, who have come down from their homes to support us in the war? The prince asked, not trusting a word the pea lord said. The snow is the wrath of the old gods, it seems these sovereigns are ignorant to the north's ways. Artos Flint said, and he looked to be close to at least breaking Lord Robin's arm for that insult. The old gods are watching us all. Red Ralu means nothing in these parts. You fools will only ignite the wrath of the old gods. Hugo Wool replied. You Northmen and your demon trees brought this snow upon us. The Lord of Light will save us. Corliss said. Your God will doom all of us. The king's men, the northerners, and my father most of all. As your future king, I demand to know why you are lighting such a big night fire. It's obvious the wood is not for your nightly prayers. You a lot are wasting good firewood that could have lasted for at least four days. Your grace, we discovered a sickening plot. For men of House Peasbury were caught red-handed, eating the flesh of the men, who have died coming south with us. The dead man, they were eating was of House Fell, and we caught them shoving his fingers into their mouths. There were others like them, but they felt the flames of Rulaller tonight. Ser Godri admitted. The prince placed a hand over his mouth, trying to stop himself from wrenching. Gods be good, were these men apprehended for their crimes? Yes, your grace, and they will be prepared for sacrifice in due time. The penny man said, agreeing with Faring's testimony. Prince Jacob was sickened of what he heard. He heard stories of cannibalism from Rob and John years ago, as it was about a small island invisible to the north. It was Skagos, a place where horned horses would wander about and where the flesh-eaters lived. 
As a southern boy, Jacob never believed these depraved people were real, until now. A dead man was feasted upon by starving men of a house that neither southerns or northerners respected at all. Whom would respect men, who bored the sigil of a small green pea? It was worse than the Tyrell Rose, which looked awfully boring on its own without the thorns. It was stomach-wrenching to even imagine it, the poor man of house fell with nothing to his name will now be known as the man, who was eaten by the queen's men. He never liked the queen's men's routine burnings, but there was a special exception he could make for them. Give them what they want for now, and they would leave the thought of burning Asha Greyjoy alone. The prince could not be seen watching from a considerable distance, it would raise suspicion between the northerners and the southerners. He was already being forced to marry the Karstark girl, someone he hardly knew and only saw her once in Winterfell. At the back of his mind, Prince Jacob knew the food stores had run out. The leftover rations were all but small bed crumbs, enough to feed the ravens lurking about. As the prince, he was fortunate to eat a good meal with his father, but for lesser men, they were lucky to even taste cooked meat. He hated to miss Storm's End and Renly, but the only decent memory he had of his traitor uncle was how Renly would spoil him out of spite towards his father. As the last son born of Baratheon coloring, his uncles made sure he was loved and provided for. He may have been born into meager prospects on Dragonstone, but he was treated as if he was the heir to Storm's End, and not any son Renly would have had. Jacob wished his relationship with Renly was not full of poison, and they would have gotten along otherwise. It was too late for any sorry sympathies. He and his father were the last trueborn Baratheon men alive. He was the heir of a great house close to collapsing, like the Targaryen dynasty, whose only surviving heir was a young woman on the other side of the world. The men being punished had resorted to eating their own dead, after the food had run out. It was disgusting to think about it, but he understood the reason why. It did not excuse them for eating a fellow man at war. They had to die for their crimes, as it would be payment for how their victim had no burial and was how in the stomachs of the men, who had eaten him. The brutality of what men would do to survive dawned on him, as the worst thing Jacob had ever done was tell his father off, and the disgrace of House Peasbury had become cannibals to survive the torturous snowstorm. Sir Clayton, bring in the sacrifices. Sir Godfrey commanded, solidifying his status as the now ringleader of the Queen's men, with Uncle Axel at the wall protecting Jacob's mother and sister. The man was the bigger of them all and was the one the others feared. The prince witnessed the four flesh eaters brought before a curious audience. Sir Clayton was a man of little subtlety and liked the taste of cruelty on his tongue. The wrists of the cannibals were tied behind their backs with leather strips. The men lowered their heads, as they were disgraced in front of the Queen's men and the Northmen. Prince Jacob caught sight of the youngest of them weeping, as if he did not know what he was being punished for. It was a pitiful sight to see. All four men were as thin as with sticks and short of stature, compared to the puffing chest of Sir Godry. His initial thought of the flesh-eaters was to condemn them as monsters for what they have done, however seeing them tied and subjected to Sir Clayton's torment made them look more like victims of unforgiving circumstances. There were king's men in attendance, but not to watch the man-eaters be punished, as they were there to protect the prince, if the queen's men or the northmen decide to target him in their forever anger in their difference of faith. Prince Jacob had a strong stomach, as he has grown up now. He would be lying to say he was not afraid. As the prince, he was lucky to be protected and sheltered from such horrific punishment, but the queen's men were displaying this all for him. The oldest of the man-eaters must be their ringleader. He was alone in his resistance to his conduct by the queen's men, who pushed him along with their spears. The man let out a blood-curdling laugh, and then confessed how he laughed when Sir Godry's cousin died and described in disgusting detail of how he and his men wished they had eaten the king's dead squire. The man suffered a blow from Sir Corliss's spear, which drove the men to his knees, but it did not keep him quiet all, as it made him more defiant against the queen's men. The cock's the choicest part of all, crisped up on the spit. A fat little sausage to devour. The man continued, as it made Jacob's stomach queasy of hearing such gruesome detail of how a man desired eating another man's manhood and was not at all ashamed of it. All you Red God fanatics, all of you to the seven hells. The man said, in a darkened laughter. 
The prince's eyes widened when the flesh eater turned to stare at him after he finished insulting the others. And you boy, watching these red fanatics burn us alive. What sort of king will you be when your father dies? You will be one of them when they get done twisting your mind and turning into a raving fanatic like their leader Axel Florent. The prince could not show weakness in front of these men, and not even the Greyjoy woman in Ali Saint Mormont, who looked to be miserable of having to watch this display. The man began crawling towards the prince's direction. Jacob's heart was racing, and his fingers were shaking. He did not know what to do in this moment, as he was numbing himself to what was going on around him. The prince took a few steps back, but the men clad in the red and white sigil of House Follard unleashed their swords in order to protect the prince from the crawling madman. Sir Clayton opened the man's throat in front of them all. The blood seeping from the man's throat splattered the ground to stain the white snows in red. At least, Sir Clayton got his fill of blood for the day and Jacob was surprised to be saved by a knight he had no love for. The Queen's men may be an annoyance, but when it came down to it, they would do their duty in protecting him from danger. The rush of blood through the prince's body tempered, and he caught his eye on the weeping man, who was sobbing even more. It was too pitiful to look at, but the man knew what he was being punished for and the consequences of his crime. The prince's followed knights were alert and did not take any chances with anyone. The sobbing man's physique was gruesome to see. He was so thin, as his internal organs and bones were visible to the eyes. Prince Jacob wanted to get closer, but he knew the follard knights were on guard to shield him. He wondered where Sorel was, as the man was his sworn shield and was supposed to protect him. It seemed Sir Clayton did Sorel's duty for him by opening the defiant man's throat for cussing at him. Please. Your grace. He was dead. He was dead so hungry we were. The weeping man was begging and looked his eyes at the prince. This moment would traumatize Jacob more than the aftermath of any battle would. The four flesh-eaters were chained together, two on each stake and the queen's men were staking split logs and broken sticks upon their feet. The most devout of Rulalares followers finished wasting good logs that could have lasted more than two days. The pile of wood sticks was doused with lamp oil, which was in short supply from the portion given to them by Sibel Glover. Jacob hated to see valuable supply items go to waste on such fruitless things, especially when they were struggling to maintain the small food rations they had and the fish from the frozen lakes were empty. The Queen's men were on borrowed time, with the snows falling harder and it would spell doom for the firewood they were using to punish the flesh eaters. Where is the king? Sir Corliss asked. Prince Jacob never thought of his father's whereabouts he knew his father Stannis never came out of the watchtower, unless he needed to. It had been four days, since Brian Faring, one of his father's squires scummed to the cold and died. The funeral pyre was short and to the point, seeing the boy's body being burned did not move his father at all. The prince knew, since then his father locked himself in the watchtower, and would not talk to anyone, unless it was him, Sir Richard Reluther. Jacob had known his father had experienced seeing people die in war before, but it was not new to him because he saw men die in the Greyjoy Rebellion, and saw men die in the wildfire explosion trick by the imp. For the prince, it was the first time it had been just him and his father. Without the niggling sight of Melisandre costing about. As they got further south, it was better his father was further away from the corruption the Red Woman had done to him. It had been Jacob's plot, to use the opportunity of war to separate his father from Melisandre. He would have his father back, and not see the sullen shadow from Castle Black anymore. The king has arrived. A dry-toned voice said, with the prince turning to see Sir Richard standing in a knightly fashion. He was in his quilted doublet, as it was well made for a man of his status. It was in the death head moth symbol of his house. Jacob wished more knights were like Sir Richard, obedient and loyal without a question towards his king. The prince was astonished to see his father, King Stannis with the queen's man. Behind them, was a face Jacob hoped to never see again. The man sees Arnulf Karstark struggling to keep at his father and Sir Richard's pace, hobbling on his blackthorn cane. He had not known the Castellan had arrived so quick. Jacob knew from the night before how Arnulf was bringing his two sons Arthur and Harold, and his three grandsons with him to the table to discuss the arrangements for the alliance and the eventual wedding. 
The Castellan of Carhold was also bringing four hundred spears, two score archers, a dozen mounted lances, a maester, a cage of ravens and only enough provisions to sustain his own forces. The crooked man before him was gaunt, with his left shoulder taller than his right by a foot. Arnulf had not changed, since Jacob last saw him, and he was the same man, but his eyes were squinter and his yellow teeth would scare the most impressionable of children. The castellan was close to being bald, but only a few white hairs remained on his head. His forked beard was always ragged, as it was in grey and white. The man's sour smiles made Jacob decide Arnulf was one of the worst men he had ever met in his life. He made a promise to John at the wall, that he would never allow that man and his horrid brood to sit in Winterfell. What was a Karstark doing? Watching the Queen's men burn cannibals alive. Was he curious or was it something he could tell his sons and grandsons about later? The sight of his father made the bound man plead for clemency and for their lives to be spared, but he did not care at all. The prince could sense his father knew he was around and would want him to come to the watchtower after the sacrifice was done. Lord Arnulf and the Karstark retinue were here and it would be rude for the prince to dismiss their company. The king was rubbing the side of his forehead. Get on with it, as you may. Jacob knew his father was numb to seeing men burnt alive, but did he know the men being sacrificed to Rulaller were flesh eaters and one of them tried to attack him. Ser Godri, the giant's lair began the first rites of prayer, and for a man, who liked to show off. He was dedicated to the religion Melisandre brought over from her homeland in the east. The man and the rest of the queen's men were chanting the words of their prayer towards their god. As someone who opposed Rolalares' religion, Prince Jacob saw a frightening beauty in what these men were doing, they were punishing criminals in the name of their lord, but this time, the punishment was fitting to what the flesh-eaters had done. The giant slayer's display of passion was foreign to Jacob, who was only used to the man tormenting or killing people, but he had to remain neutral when it came to the petty spats between the queen's men and the northmen. We thank you for the sun that warms us and pray, you will return it to us, O oh, Lord that it might light our path to your foes. We thank you for the stars that watch over us by night and pray that you will rip away the veil that hides them, so we might bask in the glory in their sight once more. Ser Corliss stepped forward with a torch in hand, he used it to spook the captives even more. For someone, as hard-minded as Jacob he had seen their night fires many times, but nothing like this because he shielded himself from the reality of Rolalares' sacrifices. As a younger man, Jacob thought of the burnings to be barbaric, and he still did, but his mind has changed through the course of his travels through the north. It was war and there was no time for having second thoughts nor was it the time to start thinking of the days before the war started. Rolaler. We give you four evil men. With glad hearts and true, we give them to your cleansing fires, that the darkness in their souls be burned away. Let their vile flesh be seared and blackened, that their spirits might rise free and pure to ascend into the light. Accept their blood, O Lord, and melt the icy chains that bind your servants. Hear their pain, and grant strength to our swords that we might shed the blood of your foes. Accept this sacrifice, and show us the way to Winterfell, and we may vanquish the unbelievers. Ser Godri chanted, and the other queen's men followed him in prayer. The prayers of the Red God were dark in nature, but it was strange to Jacob. These men truly believed what they were doing was righteous. It was a thought to be extended towards the Lady Melisandre, who also believed in her mission to help save the world from the White Walkers. The man was starting to have a sudden change in perspective and growing up has made him wiser to how his earlier views were of a young boy. Jacob knew why he disliked the Red Woman, and it was because he wanted to save his father from being eliminated by the faith for what Melisandre has been poisoning in his mind. As he was further away, he began to understand how the snowstorm in the north a sign of even more dangerous times was to come, and how Melisandre's goals were more for making sure the world survived and finding a savior to fight the Great Other in the Battle of Dawn. Oh, Lord of Light, accept this sacrifice, as the token of our appreciation. The hundred voices of the queen's men echoed over the other voices. The first pyre was lit, and the smoke from the rising flames were spreading. The prisoners began to splutter coughs, and then the flames came out from the shadow of the dark and grey smoke. The fire was spreading rapidly, and both stakes of captives were engulfed in even larger flames. 
Seeing these men burn was awfully like how Jacob had to witness great-uncle Alistair Florent be burned alive for his crimes against his father. It had been an unpleasant experience to witness, a member of his own family be punished this way. He never thought of Lord Alistair until now. Seeing these things were bringing back small reminiscences of the past, things Jacob wanted to keep buried and never see in broad daylight again. The weeping boy from minutes ago, the only one with any sense of sorrow in him was screaming as the flames roasted through his legs. He was dead, your grace. We found him dead please. We were so hungry. It was unfortunate, as the poor boy should have been put out of his misery, so Jacob could not hear him wailing no more. The broken shrieks of the burning men rang in the ears of the prince, what was more disturbing was how neutral his father's expression was. He must have been told about what those four men had done and how the queen's men could have explained to him in the horrific detail they did to him. Prince Jacob's stomach began to be queasy again, and he was almost close to losing the meal he had eaten long before. He was more than capable of holding the sick feeling in his stomach at bay. The man had never experienced a full-on burning, since Lord Alistair's death, but unlike the fallen lord, he had some pity towards the cannibals, for they only did what they had to do to survive with no food rations in sight. The screams of the men roasting to death will in no doubt haunt Jacob for years to come, and that sight will still haunt him when he gets to his father's middle age and he is the king. For the night is dark and full of terrors. Ser Corliss said, and the other queen's men followed and repeated the forever recurring line of their religion. After the dead man, Ser Clayton eliminated burned. The screaming stopped at a complete silence, and the four flesh-eaters were a pile of ash and bones now. The prince sneezed, due to the dust itching his nose and he did not want to catch a cold in this dreadful storm. He had to be as healthy as he could to fight the war against the Boltons further, and it would do his father any good if Jacob got sick at the wrong time. At the corner of his eye, Jacob sees his father go back to the empty watchtower and finally go blind from staring into the fires of the hearth again. Arnulf hobbled after him, with Sir Richard giving the aging lord assistance to go towards the long hall. Claimed by the captains and minor bannermen to eat their meals and to have somewhere warm to rest in, before they had to go back to their cold, snow-feasted tents for the night. The man was in the watchtower, and it was like a gilded cage. All the good freedom he had over the last six days were gone, and he was stuck in the tower. Jacob had to separate himself from Luther and Sorel, because the two men were not of importance in a discussion relating to the marriage and the future prosperity of House Baratheon and House Karstark. Prince Jacob was sitting on one of the wooden chairs and had his left leg over his right one. He was forced to shave some of his beard growth for the occasion, as he was going to have supper with the Karstarks and his father. A shiver went down his spine, when Jacob entered the watchtower to see the equally hideous sons of Arnulf standing there, hawking at him, as if he was a piece of new jewellery. He hated them all, and maybe marrying Alice might save her from being stuck with these men for the rest of her life. The prince had to put on his best southern good boy face on and try to be civil with these men until his father had no further use for them. He sat next to his father Stannis on his right side, and the Karstark men were sitting on the opposite side of them. The grandsons of Arnulf were sent away because this discussion was for the eyes of men and not little boys, all was left of them was the crooked lord and his two middle-aged sons, who could be mistaken for cooks and not lower-class members of a proud northern house. Jacob had a separate plate of food, as he refused to eat any of the food cooked by Karstark servants or drink wine poured by Arnulf or his sons. Seeing the men arrive in the watchtower made Jacob think of where Arnulf's firstborn and heir Cregan was. He knew the hobbling lord had three sons, and yet he only brought two of them south with him. Somebody had to oversee Carhold whilst the other Karstarks were gone. The prince's father was welcoming of the supper and appeased the most dedicated of his northern allies the best he could. The three Karstarks brought as much as they could south, including food and a considerable amount of wine because Harold was known to be a drunkard, it was known in the north and it was why the man never married at all. The watchtower was warm enough to shield the five men from the freezing cold of what laid outside, but for Jacob it was another reminder of how the battle against the Boltons and Freys will be delayed longer than he would have wanted it to be. Jacob sensed discomfort within himself, knowing Harry and Karstark was going to be eliminated because of what these men had done, by declaring fealty to his father. It was even worse thinking about what would happen, 
if he refused to marry Alice, would he be responsible for her being subjected to God's know what, in the hands of Arnulf and his sons? As a man used to having his freedom, it was sore to be restrained in having to be commanded to marry a girl chosen for him by his father. These Cretans would have chosen an even worse husband for Alice, most likely from Roose Bolton's northern allies and Fry Good family. I'm guilty of refusing the responsibility of being a northern woman's husband, when we do not even worship the same gods. The difference in faith had no bearing in Ned Stark's marriage to Caitlin Tully, and maybe the difference in belief might bring us closer together. The supper was pleasant, as it was better than what Jacob had eaten before. He drunk water, and not the wine provided by Lord Arnulf. The sight of Harold, the third son deep in his wine cups made the old lord raise an eyebrow and twitch his mouth. It seems Arnulf wanted his sons to be on their best behaviors, as they should be honored to have supper with the king and his heir and should not act the loose drunkards from Carhold. Was the roasted meat to your tastes, your grace? Lord Arnulf was the first to speak, in that grating voice that reminded him of that strict septon Jacob had to deal with in Horn Hill as a boy. The supper was fine enough, my lord. King Stannis replied, in a drier tone. He did also not touch the wine poured for him by the servant in Arnulf's retinue. Traveling all the way south has made this old man weary, but I do what I must to lend my support to you and your son against the Boltons and take back Winterfell. I thought you and your sons were here to discuss the marriage alliance, and not the war that is ahead of us, my lord. Prince Jacob interjected, sipping his water cup and was satisfied from the taste having water gave him. Of course, it was one of the reasons why I pledged House Karstark to your cause in the north, your grace. Harold. Do you have anything to contribute to his discussion? The lord's third son Harold was not coherent because of him being drunk, but he was alert enough to hear his father's command. Our cousin is fortunate to find a good husband, such as yourself, Prince Jacob. Her betrothed being eliminated in Rob Stark's war was a tragedy indeed, but with death comes new opportunities. It's terrible to know Roose Bolton was vying for Alice, due to House Karstark having blood ties to the Starks going back generations. To sell her off to some Whitehill or Fry trader, and we would not allow such a thing to happen. With Lord Ricard and his sons dead, she is the legitimate heir to Carhold which could make this marriage more complicated than it seems. What are you talking about father? I thought we were going. The second son Arthur spoke out, with his father hitting him with his blackthorn cane, his brother Harold was amused by the sight of the other brother being disciplined by his father, as a man grown. Silence yourself, Arthur. Your tendency to talk too much will have you at your deathbed, sooner rather than later. Such poor conduct in front of his grace, the king and his son, the prince. You will speak unless you have been spoken to, Arthur, do I make myself clear? Yes, father. Arthur said, in a drown-out tone. The man kept his mouth shut, as he was nursing the spot where his father had hit him with his cane. Lord Arnulf crossed his fingers over the ones on his other hand. The man may be old, but he was no feeble man. He was just like Grand Maester Pycelle and that Septon from Horn Hill in that regard. Using his age to make people blind of how much of a morally despicable man he was. The Lord was good, and he almost convinced Jacob that he had any genuine regards to his bride's safety. We shall have the wedding in Winterfell's God's Wood, a perfect marriage of the North and the South, just like Lord Eddard and Lady Caitlin. It matters not, Your Grace. A son from the prince and Alice's marriage will also be the heir to House Karstark as well as the throne. A wedding in the gods would would be a good suggestion, to appease the northern lords, but my son is of the faith and would not take to marrying near the religious territory of other gods. The southerners in my army and my wife would not take well to it. The king replied. I had never taken the difference in religion to be a barrier, your grace. We Karstarks are of the old gods, and Lord Ricard would not take well to his daughter being wed in a southern sept, and not in the eyes of the old gods. Lord Ricard is dead, father. What does his thoughts and opinions matter? Harold said, in an arrogant tone of voice. The man had his arms folded and did not care what he just said made Jacob's father raise his eyebrow and thought the man was just drunk and not making sense of what he said. He was related to you and the Lord of Carhold, before Rob Stark took his head. 
Alice is the only child he has that is free from the Lannisters, unlike her unfortunate last brother, who is being held in Maidenpool. And what are you doing to ensure your rightful lord's freedom, Lord Arnulf? I have not heard you doing anything for Lord Harrion at all. Prince Jacob wondered, and he glared at the old man and his empty-headed sons right in the face. The poor boy will be dead one way or the other. Alice is the future of House Karstark, woman or no. A good husband such as yourself will benefit her and our house for years to come. You must see, my prince. How important you are to the survival of our house and your father's house. Lord Arnolf said, and there was a tinge of sincerity coming from his voice, but Jacob doubted it to be true. The dowry Lord Ricard prepared for Alice's marriage to the Blackwood boy was fair, and the dowry for this arrangement will be higher than her last betrothal. Your son and yourself are the last surviving men of your house, and only deserve the best from us. The prince wanted to bust out in laughter, did Lord Arnulf expect him to fall for those finely tuned words of his? It was enough to make an ignorant court lord feel sorry for the old man, but a wiser man knew better, and he was wondering what this man's motive behind was selling Alice off to him and his father. It must be the ultimate lordship of Carhold and all the Karstark land surrounding it, with Lord Harrion a captive of the Lannisters and Alice married off to him. Jacob knew Arnulf wanted to grasp power this way, and for his three sons and grandsons to benefit from it. The man was only a castellan with no rights to the Karstark lands, unless he was still alive by the time a son was born from Jacob and Alice, and that boy would have more rights to Lord Ricard's lands than a chinless castellan. The dowry is sufficient enough, but spoils from the Boltons and Freys will be good enough for the wedding to go on in Winterfell. The wedding will not go ahead, unless I have seen the bride and met the girl for myself, alongside my lady wife. The Queen has been looking forward to seeing our only son be married and it might take longer for her and the rest of the Queen's men to arrive from the wall. A great idea, Your Grace. Using the spoils from our enemies to finance the wedding would be a mutually beneficial plan for both sides, since House Karstark has already pledged a significant amount of coin and resources to your cause. Said Harold, in a duller tone. If it's not much, I would like to meet my future wife after the battle with the Boltons and Freys is done, it would be improper if I did not meet the girl I am going to spend the rest of my life with. Prince Jacob asked. It will be done, Prince Jacob. It would be an honor to be the man, known for planning the next great northern and southern marriage, in times of war. It will be settled my eldest son will bring Alice from Carhold to Winterfell after the battle. Lord Arnolf agreed. There is also the matter of keeping your end of the deal, my lord. With other northern houses vying my son as a husband for their maiden daughters, it will be prudent for us to keep our alliance a secret until further notice. King Stannis said, in a blunt tone. I understand, your grace. With the Lannister and Tyrell alliance close to collapsing, and your son being a man grown and unmarried. Other lords like Riswell and Manderley will circle your son like vultures around prey and will push their daughters and granddaughters onto you. Like the prince will marry any of them, since their lords failed to support their rightful king and allowed the Boltons and Freys to tread on our northern rights. Harold sneered. Those other lords, my sons will be punished by the king in due time. We shall reap the benefits of such a grand opportunity in front of us. Wouldn't Lord Ricard be proud to finally have his daughter married off to a suitable husband? Prince Jacob and King Stannis both saw that Arthur did not speak much, after his father hit him with his cane. The man, who brought his young son south with the rest of the Karstarks was more fool than a man, with his arms folded and did what his father commanded of him, and kept his mouth shut. At the back of Jacob's mind, it seemed that Arthur's outburst told more than what he had heard, was he about to speak on something his father and brother did not want the prince and his father to hear about on the table. The supper was not great, but it was better than what the soldiers and men outside of the watchtower were having to eat. The prince placed a hand under his chin and leaned his arm on the table. He was bored and wanted this meeting to be over. Jacob was careful to not have his father see his heir clearly tired of the talk between men and dismiss the Karstark lords from the tower. He was not looking forward to marrying Alice, all because this war was the last bastion of freedom he had as a man, before the Baratheon man had to be tied down to a northerner, who did not know him. 
the prince caught Harold slipping in another cup of wine, in no doubt also bored of the proceedings and would drink the entire wine stores if he could. As older men, the prince assumed the sons of Arnulf had fought in his uncle's rebellion and had seen real war, where men died, and the stakes were high. It was a fleeting thought that passed through the prince's mind, trying to distract himself from listening to the talks of dowry and the location of the wedding ceremony. As a man of the north, my lord. Where is the turn cloak? I heard from one of your grandsons that Bolton's idiot has been flaying him for two years and a half. It's strange how Roose Bolton allows his idiot to have the same privileges as a trueborn son and to practicing something that has been illegal for centuries, as equal to first rights, which is also illegal. The prince said, in a hardened tone. The prince saw the eyes of Lord Arnulf and his sons widen at the thought of Roose Bolton and his idiot, maybe such proud lords were afraid of a man, whose house is known for extreme torture and using knives to peel the skins of their victims. All the North was afraid and did not have the right motivation to rebel against the Bolton usurpers. It was sad to see such proud people be subjugated by cutthroats, who only got their position of power because of the Lannisters and the Red Wedding. Jacob did not trust the Karstarks in front of them. One of them was too fidgety for his liking, and was the one, who could expose his family in front of the king. Lord Arnulf was trying too hard to impress him, but it seems the prince's father was not as convinced by the aging lord's sentiments. He knew his father was only entertaining them because they were the only house in the north, whom have declared for him openly, whilst other and more wealthier houses cowed behind their castle walls. You are a smart man, Prince Jacob. We never expected talks of such a man to come at the table, are we not discussing how to unite our houses together and, not talking about the ironborn turncloak? Lord Arnulf said, in a grating tone. The old man was beginning to get agitated, by the raising of his eyebrow, and how tight he held on to his cane. My son is normally intrusive, it's a quality I value in him. If you cannot deal with such a man, then it seems your house will not be marrying into mine at all. Unlike most men, my son is valued and my most important counselor on my side. King Stannis replied. It's good you value your son, your grace. Family is highly valued in our house, and we would be honored to welcome the prince into our family. Harold said, in a more gleeful tone. My lords, you are all too kind. It's not every day, high lords show appreciation towards me. Most are afraid of me because of my appearance or how I serve my father loyally and cannot be corrupted like others. Prince Jacob exclaimed. It is settled, my lords. Do you and your sons agree to have two ceremonies that honor both the old gods and the seven? I know the southerners of my forces and my good family will be uncomfortable with the idea of my only son marrying in the eyes of the old gods, when he was born in the light of the seven. The king said, in a grim tone. The two ceremonies would be a great way to reunite both faiths together. I'm sure your lady wife, the queen will be pleased to see what we have to offer to both bride and groom. We are glad you considered our house to marry your son into, because we know Lord Manderley was itching to come to the table first, but his granddaughters are marrying two stunted frays. Lord Arnulf said, sniggering at the last thing he said. You have mistaken me for someone else, my lord. I am not a forgiving man, but I do reward loyal allies for their service to the rightful king. The wedding will take place days after the men have recovered from battle and when the traitor lords have been punished for their treachery. I'm pleased to know we have come to a fair arrangement that benefits both sides respectfully, I apologize for the less than behavior shown by my sons. I expected nothing less from a fool and a drunkard, when their eldest brother is in carhold protecting his cousin. The prince thanked the father, the discussions were over. He did not have to sit in front of these men any longer than he needed to. Jacob was not happy with the idea of being linked to these Cretans as good family, but he knew he had to be ready to take on the new challenges of being someone's lord husband, and that day was coming soon. It was strange, the idea of not being an unattached man was going to be a reality and he was going to be responsible for trying to make his wife happy, as opposed to the other Baratheon marriages that have failed in his lifetime. He did not want his marriage to Alice to be unloving like his parents or poison like his uncle and Cersei. Maybe Jacob could break the cycle of three unhappy or short-term marriages in the same generation, and House Baratheon will have a chance of surviving beyond the battle in Winterfell. 
the snows outside of the watchtower did not get better by the day. Prince Jacob needed to get away from the sniveling Karstark lords. He wanted them gone, but his father Stannis needed Lord Arnolf's support against the Boltons and Freys in the war. The prince had to act the good Southron boy and be polite to these bootlickers, but they offered him Lord Ricard's daughter to wed and bed. He knew the old lord had something to hide, because he hit his middle child Arthur with his cane for talking too much. There was a larger plot that Jacob wanted to discover, but he needed a rest from using his head and wanted to be just a man for the rest of the day. He was deeply angered by Luther's decision to go drinking with the king's men, and not spend time with him. Jacob had not thought of the consequences of his cousin running away from home would have on the members of House Estermont. The lord and his family would be severely punished by the Lannisters for Luther joining the prince and his father against the Boltons. Jacob did not give two shits about his grandmother's maiden house. They were traitors, who abandoned his father in the war and supported Renly, when they should have supported their rightful king from the beginning. Jacob did not care if his great-grandfather Lord Gerald had died before the Blackwater. It was the feeble old man, who threw all the Estermont strength behind Renly. It was difficult to decipher all his family members when the war went on. He only had his father Stannis, his mother Celis and little sister Shireen to think of. The others did not matter because they were all oathbreakers and traitors in the eyes of the law of Westeros and the laws of family as well. The white cold did not deter Jacob from navigating it. It was just another challenge to him, as everything else was. He spent the days after training in his swordplay and was building muscle strength by going out to get more firewood for himself and his father in the watchtower. Carrying all those big logs would be hard for an ordinary man, but Jacob was born to be strong as a Baratheon should be. Being alone gave the prince some time to process everything the thought of becoming a North woman's husband and becoming the man he was meant to be for his family and his house. I only met Alice Karstark once, it was at a gathering in Winterfell years ago. I was only a year into my northern stay, but it was a punishment. Seeing the other northern lords and ladies enter the gates of Winterfell for celebrations or talks of how to strengthen their region made staying there less of a prison and more of a home to me. The prince knew the Starks and Karstarks were intertwined as blood ties go. Alice looked the winter's lady compared to Desmara, who looked the summer maiden. He put all thoughts of his first love behind him, when the war began. Jacob was a man of nine and ten and did not need to think about a silly girl from his past anymore. He was to be married and had to focus his attention on making his own marriage better than the other men of his house. He did not want to repeat the destructive cycle of poisonous or unhappy Baratheon marriages he had seen growing up. Jacob kicked the slog of snow under his heavy brown boots. As a southern boy, the snow amazed him, as he always wanted to see it as a little boy growing up in High Garden. He never had the opportunity to grow up the way he should have to be a big brother to Shireen, to comfort his mother through the miscarriages and to even train in swordplay with his own father. The man had been forced to grow up in the households of other people, whether it was Highgarden or Winterfell he had learned a lot during his times away from home and would not change his lessons learnt for the world. I learnt most of the lessons I had were in Highgarden or in Horn Hill. As a boy, I thought Randall Tarley had assumed the role of my father he was more invested in my future as a warrior than my own father had been. He trained me alongside his own son Dickon in swordplay and archery, but I had progressed better than the proud lord's two sons. There were times I thought Randall wished I was his son, so he would not put up with Samwell's disappointments and failure to meet his lord father's expectations of being a man by his rigid standards. Meeting Samwell again at the wall was bittersweet to Jacob. The night's watchman saw the man, his father measured him up to and someone, who was his kin through House Florent. It had been better this way, and Sam would have companionship in John, who was also an outcast in his family and the two found kinship in a place where their societal flaws did not matter. He missed the camaraderie at the wall and how the Black Brothers supported each other no matter what. It was better than how Jacob was not allowed companionship in his own highborn circles because of the dreaded Game of Thrones, and how that game has damaged the way boys and girls in noble circles interacted with each other. The prince's eye caught on someone standing a few feet away from the long hall. The closer he got to the place, the clearer it got for him. He was surprised to see Asha Greyjoy there, alone and without the she-bear guarding her or Ser Justin hovering around her. It was the first time he had seen her alone, 
since he initially captured her after her surrender in Deepwood Mott, but her injured leg in battle made beating her a lot easier for him. She was unlike any other woman Jacob had met, maybe it was because she was ironborn and did not care or she knew she was alone in the world without any allies or family members to help her. Of all the things Asha told him, Jacob did not believe at first. Her uncle Euron forced her to marry some old ironborn reaver and that made her less of a threat to her uncle being the ruler of the Iron Islands. He had some pity for her, to have her birthright taken away from her by an exiled uncle, who won the hearts and minds of the ironborn reavers, who wanted to spread more violence and terror. Throughout the Seven Kingdoms, and this time the richer lands of the Reach and the Westerlands were the main targets of Euron's reaving campaign. Jacob understood Sorel's thirst for ironborn blood because of the madman terrorizing the Shield Islands and his sworn shield having guilt of not being able to help his family members trapped in the Reach. At first, Jacob looked at Asha as nothing more than ironborn scum, who deserved to spend the rest of her life in Winterfell's dungeons. She had to answer for the crimes of those pirates and rapers she called people, and for the crimes of what Theon had done to Winterfell. As the days went on, he saw Asha had resided herself to accepting the consequences of her crimes and the crimes of what her people had done in the north. It was like she had lost every bit of strength she had, since becoming his father's prized hostage. The prince sniffed the air for the scent of cooking meat, as it was mostly from the horses that expired on their journey south. Jacob was no lover of horse meat, but it was what the men in the long haul had to eat to keep themselves alive and to survive another day. It was difficult having to eat the food brought over by the Karstarks, but he requested the cooks of the Follard retinue to cook his food for him because he was convinced Lord Arnolf and his sons were plotting to poison him at the dinner table. A gust of chilling winds blew past him. The heavy blizzard had lessened, but the storm continued. It seems the great sacrifice the Queen's men had done made no difference to the weather, nor did it grant Lawlaress most faithful anything. Seeing the flesh-eaters be burned alive made Jacob more aware of how desperate men can be to survive, and how it was easy for them to turn cruel for the sake of survival. The prince sported a ponytail to tie up his growing hair. He missed having long hair, as it made him feel like a man, and having it cut short made him feel like he lost something of himself. The prince trekked past where the makeshift stables were to keep the horses, whom were still alive and did not perish in the storm. Jacob was lucky to have his horse Misty kept in a warm stable, and to be fed with the nourishment brought from the Karstarks. He may not like those men, but they brought horse feed and was grateful for the soldiers they brought from Carhold. His horse was a well-bred southern horse bought by Uncle Robert from a great horse breeder in the Westerlands, and the breeder also got rich from selling and breeding strong horses for Tywin Lannister and his most important of war captains and bannermen in the West. For Jacob, old memories of fonder times were uncomfortable because most of the people, in his memories were either the enemy or have died, since the war began. It was saddening to have the future of an entire house on his shoulders, but Jacob had no choice. He was his father's only son and was the heir apparent to King Robert Baratheon, even though the late king was only his uncle. He missed his favorite uncle and felt guilty for not being there when his uncle needed him to serve him at court and even teach Ned Stark to be less honorable when playing the Game of Thrones. They should call you, the Wandering Prince, as it's what you like to do all day. A voice said, in a haughty tone. Jacob turned around for it to be Asha Greyjoy. Even as a hostage, she still exuded a kind of charm that would have any man begging at her feet or wanting to bet her. I'm bored, what am I supposed to do? Have tea with grubby old Karstark men. The prince replied. Are you always in a foul mood, my sweet green prince? It's that Greenlander charm you lack. I don't know what you are offering, but I'm not taking it. Most men would take what I have to offer, but you are different. A Greenlander that is not tempted at the sight of a woman. Like I said before, Greyjoy. I'm a different man, an enigma amongst my own kind I guess. I hope your father doesn't throw me in Winterfell's cold dungeons too long. I'd like to see you in some fancy court cloths, when you marry the northern girl forced on you, by your father. Aren't you married yourself, my lady? It was a false marriage, an obstacle to keep me away from the sea stone chair, which is mine by rights. The man is old enough to be the same age as an ironborn grandfather. Did you like the display the queen's men showed? 
You were lucky to be highborn, to be spared of such punishment from those red fanatics. Yet, they serve you and your father. You don't worship their red god or swear fealty to their red queen in return for their devotion of burning men alive. Prince Jacob growled under his breath. He did not take insults towards his mother lightly, especially when it came to iron-born filth like Asha. He was not blind to the influence Melisandre had on the men fighting for his father, since she arrived on Dragonstone years ago. The prince was not aware of how the queen's men had believed the red woman to be the queen they named themselves after, and not the rightful queen married to his father and the mother of his two children. He heard the rumors on the wall, how even though Melisandre did not wear a crown, many men believed her to be his father's true queen, being the only woman, his father listened to and not dismissed from his side, unlike he had to his mother. Watch yourself, Greyjoy. Speak of such things again, you will be seeing the end of my sword soon enough. The prince said, in a threatening tone. I did not mean to upset you, Green Prince. I see you are sensitive about the Red Priestess, Sir Justin has told me about. Has she replaced your mother at your father's side or is she some common witch brought from the east? Prince Jacob grabbed Asha by her upper arm and did not let go. He was close to strangling her, but she was to be kept alive for his father and was going to keep his word. I warned you once. Speak of business that is not yours again, and you will have to deal with me making the rest of your time as a hostage very hard, and Sir Justin will not be able to save you this time. The prince gritted between his teeth. You have a strong grip, it seems our last duel has inspired you. Getting yourself strong to face the Boltons and Freys. I have my own grip with Lord Bolton. His idiot has been flaying my brother, and I don't know whether he is dead or alive. The man had released his grip on the iron-born woman. He took a deep breath and looked at Asha, in a more neutral way. He saw someone as broken as jaded as he was from the war. The difference was that Jacob did not enjoy having to eliminate people in the war, and Asha reveled in conquering the north in the name of her father Balon Greyjoy, who was dead now. Why should I care? As far as I'm concerned Theon deserves his flaying for what he has done to Winterfell and murdering the Stark boys. Your brother is a turncloak and a child killer, how does it feel to be the sister of such a creature? Jacob glimpsed Asha's trembling lip, and stern face. He touched a nerve, and it served her right for talking about things that did not concern her. His family may be flawed, but at least he did not have a sibling that was a turncloak and murdered two highborn children. It was just like the times the two of them would antagonize each other, by using each other's families to insult one another. As the days went by, those insults got old and served nothing, but get the both angry with each other, because of their common attachment to their flawed families. He knew the Greyjoy woman missed her brother, as Theon was her last living sibling, since the two older brothers were eliminated in the Greyjoy rebellion. Jacob missed his sister too, but he knew Shireen would be okay with mother and many of the queen's men protecting her. He did not care if he crossed the line because she crossed the line also. The prince knew using Theon to poke at Asha was the easiest way to antagonize her. I'm not proud of what Theon has done. I tried to warn him of his actions and the consequences of it, but he did not listen. He was eager to prove himself to a father, who thought the Greenlands made him too soft to be truly ironborn. Asha said, gritted between her teeth. No matter what he is he is still your brother and you have to bear the consequences of his crimes, and the crimes of your people. Be fortunate you are not dead. I'd rather be dead than be treated like a wounded animal. Asha declared. What happened, Greyjoy? Did your drowned god desert you in your time of need? Or did you forego religion altogether? Pox to all of them. The prince chuckled at Asha's sentiment, as it came from someone who never believed in any faith whatsoever. She was not bad for a Greyjoy, which was telling because the rest of her family members were nothing, but rapers and reavers. He saw at the nightfire that she was not impressed by the show the Queen's men put on, it was almost as if she was afraid of being thrown into the flames by Ser Godry and his men. As Balon Greyjoy's daughter, the woman did have king's blood, but a false king's blood nonetheless. What is your relations with Ser Justin? I'm curious to know why one of the more cowardly of the Queen's men has chosen you to socialize with. Prince Jacob asked, with his arms folded. The man was courteous towards me, unlike you, Green Princeling. 
He gave me good food and good company away from the she-bear. You know better than I that Sir Justin, like many of the men around here are ambitious. Most of them have lost their holdings and their lands because of siding with my father in the war, even the lands of House Florent were given away to Tyrells, when it belonged to the Tarleys by rights. The Iron Islands is nothing to be clamoring for, as long as Euron lives and is king. No other lord can marry me, as long as I am shackled to the husband the crows I forced upon me. What about a lord with a high station, like me? Unless you want to fight Euron and die for it. I eliminated many men before, and I'm looking to add the idiot of Bolton onto my slow but growing list of men I eliminated, along with Lord Whitehill and all his sons. Why? What have those poxy Northmen done to occur your wrath? Lord Ludd and his sons ran away before I could eliminate them. Their castle and all their lands now belong to my father and their rivals, the foresters, as reparations for what their enemies have done, since the Red Wedding. Would you allow the Queen's men to burn me? No matter how much you dislike me. No, because I have a duty to keep you alive and to make sure you make it Winterfell unscathed. It is not a promise, but it is something I'm willing to do, even if the Queen's men have to stomach not having you as fodder for their blood ritual. The prince's stomach began to stir. It was as if he enjoyed Asha's company and had more to talk about than igniting her temper. He realized he and the Greyjoy woman were not so different from each other, but both were cut from the same cloth. Jacob smiled, knowing Asha would see it, to see the Greenland prince break the stone-cold look on his face for once and see the human side of him. The two of them were thrown in the middle of this northern war and had a common enemy behind the walls of Winterfell. Chapter 46 The prince swung his blade to counter the attack from behind, with the sword of his opponent almost knocking him down. He looked to see Sorel huffing out of breath again, even though the man was a sharper swordsman than his cousin Luther. Jacob needed this time, to retain and to get his skills sharpened again. He was going to be on the front line, when the war with the Boltons and Freys comes to a head in Winterfell, and he will need to be at his best and full strength to win so he could and stay alive. Through the battles in this long war, Jacob has grown up and not compromised anything that could cost him his life on the field. He had grown from the arrogant boy, who wanted to go to war to eliminate Lannisters to a self-assured man, ready to do anything to reclaim the North from the cutthroats, who rule it now. The prince kept banging away with his sword against Sorel's, as the knight made a good sparring partner and was someone, who would be willing to challenge him, unlike his scared cousin. Luther is too much of a chicken to fight me he is afraid father will punish him for injuring me by accident. He was an important member of the king's men and spent most of his time with them through the last seven days. He was home with them, as they worshipped the seven like him. The sword of Sorel was flung across the snows, and Sorel healed in defeat. Not when the knight then pulled out a knife from under his jerkin, and the prince kicked it out of his hand. Sorel didn't mean to have the knife out, but it was an example of the trickery the Freys and Boltons might pull on the battlefield and have the prince's guard down to eliminate him. Jacob knew the price of making a mistake, and a small mistake like that could cost him his life and the lives of the soldiers fighting with him. The knight stood to his feet and brushed off the snow from his clothes. Sorel's hand didn't look to be too sore from the prince's heavy boot kick. He was chuffed, at the thought of the snowstorm continuing, even though Jacob lost track of time, since the remain ants of his father Stannis's army left Deepwood Mott. The storm kept on raging and he knew Roose Bolton was too comfortable warming himself in Winterfell's hearth and fires that did not belong to him or his demented house. He was more distant with his father, since the Karstark forces came to the encampment. All he dealt with was the blatant arse kissing from the grandsons of Arnulf, whom all three of them were the sons of Artha, the foolish of the Karstark men. They were despicable and entitled little boys, who needed to have their mouths sewn shut by needlepoint. He knows he will count down the days, where he will be miserable being Alice Karstark's husband and having to be lord over these insignificant Northmen and their ilk. You could have broken my left hand, my prince, Sorel said, in a neutral tone of voice. He didn't seem angry at what the prince had done. My sword hand would still be intact. I can't afford to be reckless, not this late in the game. Your training has improved, since we started sparring together. I needed to do something with myself and sitting in a warm tent wasn't going to do anything for me in the meantime. Must you be reminded of your duty to the Karstark girl, 
you are meant to marry days after the battle or are you too busy conversing with the Greyjoy woman to notice? The knight said, with bitterness in his tone. Whom I talk to is none of your business. I'm only looking out for your best interests, your grace. The Greyjoy woman has something foul about her. All Greyjoys are foul, Ser Grim. It's who they are and who they destined to be. Pirates and rapers and nothing more. What would keeping her with us do for us? It's only for show, for my father to present a token to the lords of the north. Here, he would say, throwing the Greyjoy woman in chains in front of their feet. All that to gain another army to fight for the throne again. Do you want to continue this war? I want it to be over, Sorel. I'm tired of fighting to be honest, but this war determines the future of our house whether I like it or not. The Karstark men are not too pleasant to look at either, do you truly want to play lord over them? I have no choice. Alice Karstark will be my wife and my mother, the queen and the other Florence will have to adjust to it. I am very sorry for you, my prince. It is clear on your face, you do not want to marry this girl. Your father is desperate for this alliance to work out, but the Mandalay one proves more fruitful for us. The prince never thought Sorel, a king's man would be on his side, in terms of the difference in the northern alliances on offer. He must be as Jacob's sworn shield and someone, he gave a purpose to, as he would have resided to fixing ships in Old Town had the two not met each other. He sensed something crawling down his spine when he thought of his bleak future as a member of the Karstark household. It would not be so bad, had Lord Ricard and his sons had not died in the war. The Karstark men were terrible and were not making a lasting good impression on the prince, but they were able to fool the king this long with their false niceties. Jacob hated looking in the eyes of Arnulf, as it reminded him of the all the times, the Septon in Horn Hill would discipline him for small things he considered a sin, like looking at noble girls from House Ashford or even having flaws. Such as jealousy and anger creeping on the forefront of his mind when Jacob fell short of something Garland Tyrell did with ease and he was a second son of the Patriarch, who benefited more from the Lannisters' downfall than being allies with them. It does not matter now, Sorel. As my sworn shield, your loyalty will extend towards my future wife and she will need your sword against her great-uncle and hideous cousins. Prince Jacob said, in a dull tone. Killing them would be considered a pleasure, my prince. Sorel said, with a smile on his face. He was sharpening his blade with a whetstone given to him by Luther. Only if I have seen them acting disloyally and playing my father for a fool. My father will believe his only son and heir over these arse liquors. Why do you think they are here? They are desperate. With Lord Ricard and his sons dead they want to get rid of Alice the only way they could. By selling her to me and my father for an alliance and then taking her birthright of Carhold and the land surrounding it away. The king will not listen to a common knight like me, but you he will believe if you see anything. You do not know my father like I do, sir. He is a stubborn animal, who does not listen to reason when it comes from someone else. What if his life was in danger? The only time he will actually listen to someone other than his obeying knights. The Karstark men need to be watched. I do not trust their intentions, as they may seem good on the outside, but they will want to take advantage of our weaknesses. You may be right, sir, but I do not know yet. I have to investigate further on. The prince does not know what to think. He needed to see what the Karstarks were really doing and if the marriage alliance was a guise for something else they were planning. They could have gone over to the Boltons and submit to their rule and they would be safe in Carhold, but they defied Roos Bolton and all his authority and joined the prince and his father in the war against him and his fry good family. Prince Jacob was glad to have Sorel around, even though he was only a sworn shield. His opinions mattered to Jacob more than the opinions of the high lords around him, all because the man was honest and did not bite his tongue around him. Jacob cherished what alliance he had with his sworn shield, but did not want to consider him a friend. As he was afraid of growing too attached to him and being too trusting, which was what led to the betrayal of his great-uncle Alistair. Jacob shook his head at the thought. He did not need friends but needed good allies who made good on their promises on their deals. The man was never away from his father this long, but it was a good thing as it was helping to develop his leadership skills and how to hone them when he is alone and without his father's guidance. He was a man of eight and ten, 
but he still has the thoughts of the boy of five and ten, who valiantly joined his father in fighting the Lannisters and his own uncle Renly. Why am I thinking these things? The battle is about to happen, and I should be ready to remove the head of Bolton's idiot and let the snows be painted with his blood. It should be justice enough for the things he had done to the northerners. The snows did not let up, with the prince and Sorel retiring to Jacob's tent, which had the sigil of the black stag on a golden field, the original Baratheon sigil before the war between brothers began years ago. He never took the new sigil his father had taken, due to his association with Melisandre, as it presented a bad omen and a warning from the Seven. As a loyal worshipper, Jacob kept to the Seven, even though he still questioned his faith from time to time. He knew his gods needed him in the battle against the Red God, who sought to set the Seven Kingdoms alight through blood and destruction. The prince listened to the Karstark men talking to occupy his time, most of the conversation was about the turncloak Theon Greyjoy and how he was not at the Dread Fort anymore, but inside the walls of Winterfell and was a sorry sight to see. Jacob did not want to think what his old enemy would look like, after the idiot of Bolton was done with him. He heard the legendary tales of the torture chambers and the flaying knives the members of House Bolton used through the centuries for their own sick pleasure, until the Stark in Winterfell put them down, like the dogs they were. As a boy sentenced to Winterfell for his punishment, listening to stories and such things from John, Rob and Theon were the norm to him. Even though stories like that were abhorrent in the South and people there liked to soften the horror stories to make themselves seem superior to each other. The man liked sitting on his own created seat, as it made him feel powerful, as his father, but he knew how to retain such power, unlike his father who always threw away valuable alliances all because of his morals and hard sense of justice to the law. Jacob sensed he may not know his father as well as he thought he did. The distance did them some good, but they were better together than not, as a united family. He did not understand why his sense of morality was rattled suddenly, all for an iron-born woman sentenced to imprisonment for life. Asha did not fit the qualities Jacob liked about women, she was brash, proud scum of the Iron Islands and never had her convoluted sense of mind challenged, until their last meeting. He hated to admit he liked having the iron-born around to make things interesting, Stopping the king's men and queen's men from opening each other's throats bored him, and Jacob was a Baratheon and craved excitement in an otherwise boring war camp. The tent opened to reveal just the woman he was thinking of. Asha's legs may not have been shackled anymore, but she was still trapped in this war camp, as much as Jacob was. The difference was that she always had an armed escort with her, whether it was Sir Justin or Lady Ali Sane with her. The two sods were lucky to be in her company all the time, she was not bad to talk to and could keep up with Jacob, unlike the Tyrells he had grown up with Highgarden. Underneath the pirate bravado laid someone as wanton as he used to be, before good old Ned Stark decided to train that wildness out of him. Asha liked what she liked, and that was what stayed with Jacob in his memory. He had nothing to offer her but his cock, but as an unmarried man, he knew what she could be after and maybe she fancied herself with a southern crown on her head. The prince raised his hand to dismiss his sworn shield, he saw the agitated look on Sorel's face. He could not believe Jacob was asking him to leave him alone with a woman, who would rather eliminate him than make any kind of peace with him, as long as he was the son of the man, who ordered her imprisonment. The knight left the tent in haste, which widened Jacob's eyes. He did not want Sorel to feel like he did not matter, but the knight was important to him in the grand scheme of things. Sorel used his sword to defend Jacob, and openly talked about his dislike for King Stannis in front of his son. The man integrated himself into Jacob's life not by fate, but by happenstance when they met each other on the ports of Old Town. It made Jacob remember, he was dumped further south by soldiers of House Rowan, but he never really had a problem with that house, knowing he was close to marrying Mathis Rowan's daughter, had the rumors of her being soiled not reached his father's ears. It was years ago, and when the Seven Kingdoms was somewhat at peace. Prince Jacob was empty inside. He felt nothing when Sorel left, but he was alone with the woman, who may not end up being his best friend, but could be a useful ally when the time came to eliminate Roose Bolton and his idiot Ramsay on the field of battle. The man rubbed the side of his forehead, not to show any ounce of weakness or the dishonorable Greyjoy will use it against him. He was tired, and he did not want to admit it, of the war, the politics of marriage and everything else. He wanted it to be over with the snap of his fingers and everything will be good, 
but life did not work out that way, and it was a lesson his father taught him. Is there something I can do for you, Greyjoy? The prince said, in a biting tone. He was in the mood to talk, especially to someone who made him question what he knew over the last month. There is plenty you can do for me, sweet green prince. Asha replied, in a haughtiness in her tone. I warned you not to call me that before. What's wrong? Don't like being called sweet at all, it's better than being your usual unpleasant self. Better than being compared to the likes of men, whom I despise. You have a lot of anger in your heart, Greenlander. As false as your marriage may be, you are still married, and I do not philander with married women. I have my principles. The man is old enough to be my great-grandfather. Pity he does not have the coin to bargain for my release, but staying with you might make things much more interesting. The ironborn captain said, placing a hand on his shoulder in a ginger manner. The prince's eyes widened, not used to the touch of a woman for years, since he left Highgarden. I'm not buying what you are selling to me, Greyjoy. The man said, pushing the Greyjoy's hand away from him. You are the only Greenlander to reject me, other than your father. Thought about seducing him before I knew he was married to your mother. You might have to do, an unmarried Greenlander in the middle of a war. Asha winked her eye at the prince. That's repulsive, how do you sleep at night, my lady? I sleep, quite comfortably under the extra furs provided by my champion Sir Justin. You are just as jaded as I am. We are not so different from each other, the only thing that separates us is our families and our sigils. None of our families have a future if we don't survive this war. Asha said, not in her usual bravado, but as a genuine person considered about the survival of her house when she is its remaining heir. The prince never knew Asha had that side of her, maybe it was only reserved for those closest to her. He envied those men languishing in the dungeons of Deepwood Mott, but especially the two men he captured, who were apparently her lovers and shared their affections for her between them. Sad men, but as ironborn men, those two were fortunate to have been in the service of Balon Greyjoy's last heir and to have shared her bed as well. Why did his mind have to go there? Was his mind full of filth and deviance that he could not stop thinking these things about a woman, who he had no intention of being allies with, unless it was on his terms and he controlled the circumstances of such a union between them? The man was good at pretending to be a chaste boy, when he was just as vulgar as his womanizing uncle. But the difference was Jacob was able to hide his wild nature more than his uncle did with his public displays and did not bother hiding his whores, even when married to the daughter of the most powerful man in the Seven Kingdoms. Isn't Sir Justin supposed to watch you, he will get a tongue lashing from my father, knowing he lost you again, under his supervision. Prince Jacob said, in a somber tone. I have little of my freedom, I use it to my advantage. I am not shackled as I was anymore. Smile, Greenlander. Your enemies will be dead shortly. Asha replied. Not the enemies in Winterfell I worry about, my lady, but the enemies closest to home I concern myself with. I'm a killer of sorts, and I will do such for you. I'm not the idiot Rob Stark was, and no way will I ever accept any help from the likes of you. Keep your hands to yourself or else you will not have hands. Are you threatening me, Greenlander? I threatened lesser men, and you are no man as you pretend to be one. Jacob did not understand, when Asha chuckled at his sentiment. He was confused, but did not get why she was not seething with anger with his direct threat. He knew she tried to fling herself onto him, as the only available man she could stand to look at. The prince was not swayed to what she was offering to him, to eliminate his enemies with the swing of her axe and he liked the idea. An idea he would take to bed with him later tonight and mull over it. The ironborn woman had a big, sharp nose, as he always noticed and strangely, he found it attractive on her, but it was something he would never admit to anyone, especially the overly critical Sorel and the fool Luther and it was a secret he wanted to keep to himself. All princes and kings had secrets, so why could not Jacob have some of his own, to occupy his time away from his father Stannis? Your father said something of a sort to me long ago. Asha said. You should listen carefully my father is not a man to be trifled with and I know the consequences of those who try to. Jacob replied, in a stern tone. Are you truly made of the same stone as your father or something more? You may know or not know, 
as it said before, my lady. I am an enigma amongst my own kind. I offer to eliminate your enemies, and a blank answer is what you give me. I never said yes or not, maybe you still might have a chance with me. More of your pretty southern lies or are you considering my offer? You will have to work it out for yourself. The prince said, with a triumphant smile on his face. His great aunt Malara always said his wide smile brought out the best of his Baratheon features. It made him look attractive to the southern girls of the Reach, as he remembered his great aunt saying. The prince knew at the back of his mind, what he was doing was wrong. Conversing with one enemy, whilst thinking about ways to eliminate the others, who were circling his father like crows. As someone branded a rebel by all of Westeros, he lived up to the rebel title given to him. Asha sticking around mattered to him, even though he was never going to ally with her, but things were exciting with someone to challenge everything he believed to be true in his life to think a whole new way of being. He learned more from being in the war camp with Greyjoy than he did at Castle Black stuck with his father, the king. The prince and his sworn shield were trekking through the trenches of snow, which landed on their boots and the snowflakes almost covering their dark-colored furs from the storm blowing in this direction. Jacob was needed by his father, as it was heard someone important arrived in the crofter's village and he was called to be there. He would be foolish to ignore any vital summons from his father, even though the two never saw eye to eye on the same problems, but if there was someone of importance who was useful for their cause in the north, then there is no harm in meeting this person and even sharing bread and wine with them. He hated the thought of the Greyjoy woman getting to him, as it was a weakness to admit it himself. Jacob was his father's son and she was a prized hostage. He did not like the nagging tone of Sorel circling his mind of how conversing with Asha was wrong, but it was none of the knight's business whatsoever and he can talk to whomever he wanted to. The sworn shield should know his place, before offering his useless criticism on such matters. Jacob was a man grown and he could make his own choices, for better or worse. It was his badge of dishonor to wear and he was happy to. He had enough of the vain notions of honor, all because men like his father Stannis and Ned Stark abided by them so much. He was not perfect and made his own fair share of mistakes, which cost him dearly as a boy of four and ten, but it was something his father refused to acknowledge about him, being his only son and heir. There was commotion in the war camp, as it was to be expected. As everyone was on constant alert because the closeness of the village to Winterfell. It reminded him of the watchtower's view of the seat of House Stark from the distance. He hated looking it because the castle had been a prison for him, after the Reacher dispute years ago at first. A southern boy was not meant for a northern castle at the time and he hated the cold when he first arrived there. Taking a glimpse of the castle every night before bed became a regular thing for the prince to do, even though staying in Winterfell at the time had been a punishment, but he didn't regret having fonder memories of his time there as well. The prince and the knight walked past the numerous flags of the smaller houses, whom joined his father in the war against the Boltons and Freys. It was a thing to see northern unity amongst those, who wanted to bathe in the blood of Boltons. He ignored Sorel on their journey to the watchtower, as there was nothing to be said between the two men. Jacob knew Sorel was someone, who would tell him the harsh truth, even though he did not like to hear it. He was a man, who was starting to enjoy the freedoms of making his own choices, even though most of his choices were not the best in terms of leading by example, as the prince. The umber men are acting strange, my prince. What do you think it is? Ser Sorel asked. I don't know, but northerners have their way of doing things, Prince Jacob replied. It's best not to get in their way. You are putting your future in jeopardy, all for ironborn scum condemned by your father. What do you mean by it? Jacob asked, in a raised voice. I notice the way you have changed, since she became your father's prize and you dismissed me when she is around. You are my sworn shield, not Davos. As I remind you of your place, Ser. Your future is not to be a womanizer like your uncle. Do not speak to me, as if you are my father or Davos for that matter. The man stiffened, when Sorel made light of Uncle Robert's womanizing. Jacob knew about it, since he was a child, and even used it against his uncle when he dared to judge him for being young and in love with Desmer. Talking with Asha did not make him alike to his uncle, as the prince did not enjoy the company of anyone looking to bed him at all. He was a patient man and wanted to keep it that way, 
until his wedding night to the Karstark girl. The fostering in Highgarden taught Jacob lessons he would not have learned in the Vale or in the Stormlands he learned about the pleasures of the bedchambers and the Tyrell girls were not shy of teaching him what women liked done to them. He may have less than honorable qualities about him, but all Jacob desired was to be the best husband he can be to Alice, better than the men of his house. As the war came to a standstill, Jacob knew the shortage of brides affected him and his father, in terms of gaining alliances with other houses. His father claimed Alice was the best bride he could hope for, but it was the same thing he said about Sansa Stark years ago. It was not true, as his sire was a terrible liar. Jacob knew the best bride he could be offered came from House Manderley and his father knew it. Why go along with the Karstark alliance, when a better one was on offer? He did not understand his father Stannis' stubbornness in ignoring the better opportunities in front of him, just so he could prove his way was the right way. The prince and his sworn shield climbed the steps to get to the watchtower, as it was made of great stone bricks and this place lasted if it did. He was excited, to meet this mystery guest his father wanted him to be around for and he was happy to be host to anyone, who could help support his father in the war effort. Jacob would gladly say goodbye to the watchtower soon, as he was sick of it and its monotony and grayness. It almost made him believe the maiden trapped in tower stories might be true. The sworn knight opened the hard, stone door by the brass handle, and the two stepped inside the tower. The place was warmer than it was before he left. As the heat radiating from the flames heated the stone-cold walls around him. The prince was gladdened to be embraced by the warmth, rather than he suffocated by the storms of snow outside. Sitting on the long table was his father, King Stannis sharing a goblet of wine with a man Jacob raised his eyebrow at. The man's fashion looked compatible to a mummer's showmaster, with his brimless three-tiered hat in purple and eye-catching robes with a high stiff collar. He was tall and thin underneath the heavy clothes he wore. The stranger's eyes were dark, which made the prince aware if the man was a potential enemy to him and his father. His long beard was almost to his waist, which made the prince and the sworn knight insecure about their own facial hair on their respective faces. The prince had his arms folded, with his heavy furs on him causing discomfort, as the warmth of the hearth's fires were getting to him and his shield. I see you are entertaining our mystery guest already. Prince Jacob said, pulling up a chair for himself to sit on. As Sorel closed the door of the tower behind him, standing by the prince's side as he should be. Is this your esteemed warrior son, your grace? It is a shame such a man is still unwed. The man asked, in a tone, which made Jacob mind his manners, when around this foreign stranger his father hosted. Father, who is this man? This is Tycho Nestoris, an envoy of the Iron Bank of Bravos. You know of these men and their work, since you served Robert in administrative work long ago. King Stannis replied. The men, who collect the debts of the throne and give loans in hopes of a return investment on their parts. I was guided by men in the service of the Lady Sibel Glover and released a few iron men to help guide me through the storm. I have been searching for your father for some time. And you found him and what is it you are offering to my father and our cause? The service of the Iron Bank and an opportunity to push your father, his grace closer to the throne. As my most valuable counselor, Jacob. You have a much of a part in this as I do. King Stannis said, in a strained tone. He must be dedicated to survive the worst snowstorm in the north and to still be alive in one piece. I had a pleasant stay in Castle Black, and kept company with your Queen Mother, Prince Jacob. What you are asking of my father is a lot, banker. To potentially pay the debts of Uncle Robert and those two blonde abominations on the throne. Your father will have the support of the Iron Bank, as long as there is a return investment in our mutual agreement. As long as he is sat on the Iron Throne. Did the Lannisters forget to pay their debts? For a house famous for paying their debts, they have done a poor job on paying the debts of ill-born kings. I understand your reservations, no one can be trusted these days. I'm offering you and your father the greatest opportunity possible. My son needs time to consider such an offer on the table, as we will not walk into this deal blindly. The prince noticed his father glaring at him, as if he was going to ruin the whole deal with the Iron Bank before it has been signed. He was bothered by the presence of the foreign banker, as it was within his rights to feel this way, Jacob trusted no one and played the game well because of it. 
He examined the banker closely and wondered if allowing him in was the best of ideas. The Iron Bank, unlike the wealthy Northern Lord had the means and the resources to help his father on his path to the throne. He looked at Sorel, who stood at his side and did not want to ask his thoughts, whilst Nestorius was in the room with his father. Jacob did not like the fact this mummer's master man had the iron-born men he imprisoned released for coin. It was the soldiers of Asha Greyjoy he helped to defeat and put away in the dungeons of Deepwood Mott. Was Nestorius trying to undo the hard work Jacob did in the Battle of the Wolfswood or was he trying to antagonize him with his willful ignorance of everything? Prince Jacob and his father had different views, but when it came their ambitions, they were one in the same. To depose the Lannisters and anyone, who stood at their side go down with them. If this man from Bravos was going to help them on their path to the Red Keep, then Jacob will have to trust his father's judgment about him. He knew being this far in the game and being alive was all due to awareness for his surroundings and his way of being critical of people. Jacob had one leg over the other, as he knew this meeting was no small talk, especially when the future of his and his father's successes in the war depended on the proper supporters with the financial backing for them to succeed further in the war. You said you kept company with my mother, the rightful queen. The prince said, wanting to know what the answer would be. He had not seen his mother, since he and his father left Eastwatch to go to the west of the mountains to ask the mountain clans for support in the war. She told me great deal about you. I see why she is so proud of you, the esteemed heir. The banker replied. Enough of the niceties, you are here because you want to offer a deal and to contribute significant coin to me. King Stannis said, in an iron tone. Of course, and I see you value your son enough for him to be involved in this meeting. I apologize, Prince Jacob. I did mistake you for one of the Northmen around here. I did not realize you were the king's son, unless he told me so. You sought to undo the work I did imprisoning the iron-born rapers, you paid to be released. Those men were complicit in the invasion of northern lands. They deserve to rot in the dungeons for life. This is not the time for this. The king interrupted, not wanting Jacob to dwell on things from the Battle of Deepwood Mott. Those men could have died in those storms, and still you will not be satisfied. A hard man to please, just like your father. When the battle comes, my son will stand by me as he has always done. It is what I expect of the men around me. I must not forget. The queen requested me to give something to the prince. It is right a mother misses her son, when he is so close to the battlefield. The bravosi said, handing Prince Jacob two letters, to his hand. The prince did not understand why Tycho Nestoris would do such a thing for him, even though it was a favor from his mother. Holding the letters between his fingertips made his fingers shake, Jacob had not seen his mother, before departing from Eastwatch. As a man grown, he still allowed for moments of weakness, only for those he loved and mainly his mother, Queen Celis. He hated to remember her aching sobs when he left for the west of the north. It dawned on Jacob how much fighting in the war affected his mother, knowing how many noble ladies in Westeros have lost their sons in the war and some end up motherless because of the Game of Thrones. He held the letters in his hand, as they were visible reminders of his mother still caring and loving him from a distance. The man saw the letters scrawled in his mother's writing and he opened the first letter in his hand, and it had more than one page to it. My son. I am writing to tell you how much I love, and I miss you. I am furious with your stubborn-minded father for allowing you to continue fighting in the north, but I understand why you need to fight. You feel you need to prove something to your father, but I know you will make a great leader to the men fighting for the futures of you and your sister for years to come. I was in the company of Tycho Nestoris of the Iron Bank, and we had great talks in East Watch, even though he was searching for you and your father, and in need of his counsel. This man is important to the future of you and your father's victories in the war, as the Iron Bank deposes those who do not pay their debts to them. I'm glad you ended whatever sordid friendship you had with the idiot Lord Commander, it's not right for a prince to socialize with those beneath him. It is great you have agreed with your father's command for you to marry the Karstark girl. It breaks me to know, I will never see you get married, my only boy walking down the altar with his northern bride. It's unfortunate because I wanted a southern bride for you to settle with when the war ended, I knew you were fond of the Rowan girl before she soiled herself. I hope to Rolala you are still alive when you get these letters, 
your sister Shireen misses you more than she lets on. You should have stayed with me and your sister, as we are surrounded by savage wildlings and black brothers. You are a man and your place is on the battlefield with your father. Uncle Axel has been keeping the remaining Queen's men in order in your father's absence and misses your keen sense of humor. I am proud of your victories in Highpoint and Deepwood Mott, and I never thought my boy was the one, who defeated Balon Greyjoy's daughter in those savage woods. You do not need to worry for me, I have the Queen's men, Uncle Axel and the Lady Melisandre around me. I pray to the fires of Rolaller every night and day for your safety. I hope to see you soon, after you crush the Boltons and Freys on the battlefield. From your mother. A tear fell from one of the prince's blue eyes. He did not know what to think when reading his mother's words in writing. Jacob began to realize how much his mother was suffering without his presence with her. He knew she was strong enough to handle anything, especially being married to a solemn person like his father for many years and to endure the misery she did for him and Shireen. The queen was able to cope before, especially with Melisandre at her side, but this time Jacob leaving has rattled his queen mother to the point of her asking a foreigner to pass letters on to him through the north, the middle of a rebellion and a war. The prince was alone during a heavy day of the storms brewing. The snows were never going to let up, as it has been this way, since they all left Deepwood Mott and how it was a sign of this winter going to be a long one. He missed the long summer, as it was easier to wear clothes without the excessive furs and hard boots on his feet. He adapted to the storm, as best he could, even though he was a southern man and was used to the cold the north brought upon him. Prince Jacob had just left the long hall, after seeing Luther entertaining the remaining bannerman his father had left. His cousin never paid much attention to him because he wanted to gain popularity amongst the northerners and the southerners in the army. It must be Luther's way of dealing with the homesickness, but he never cared to tell anyone, all because he wanted to gain glory and honor for himself in the war. There was something wrong, as the crofters' village was close to Winterfell and why haven't the Boltons attacked them yet? The prince shook his head at the realization if the newly released ironborn scum from Deepwood Mott were responsible for the discord in the war camp. He was furious how Tycho Nestoris had released ironborn men he personally had captured and locked up after the Battle of the Wolfswood. It was like his hard work and bravery on the battlefield meant nothing, but the envoy from Bravos offered his father an opportunity, and it was another stone set on the path for his father to claim the throne. Why did Nestoris give me the letters from the wall? He was not obligated to do so. It must be his way of trying to win my trust and the trust of my father. Foreigners are not to be trusted, as Melisandre is an example of such. My mother missed me a lot, and it shows within her writing. She was also torn between wishing me luck on the war and being angry with father for bringing me further south to fight the war. The prince stepped on the heavier mounds of snow on the ground. Little white flakes of snow were covering his arms. He needed a stroll away from everyone else, and even his sworn shield and cousin. There were rumors of Moore's crow food bringing in two runaways to his father and did not want anyone else to know about it. Jacob was not concerned at all, as people are brought to his father all the time and nothing happened to them afterwards. The Karstarks would not do anything that jeopardized their ambitions of being linked to the rightful royal family, by doing something that would endanger Jacob and his father. He had his three layers of black cloaks and furs wrapped around his body, and the golden trim around his neck to make him look a true Baratheon, unlike the blonde abominations, who sat on his father's throne and stained the Baratheon name. It made his skin crawl of the idea of making more difficult choices, as the war went on. He did what he needed to do to secure his victories on the battlefield, and even say the vows in front of the Seven and the gods would to Alice Karstark to secure the future for his family. Uncle Robert said war was the last bastion of manhood before being constrained into the prison that was marriage, but all Jacob saw growing up in terms of marriages were discontent and poison between the couples in his family. The man's thoughts were moving towards Asha Greyjoy. He shook his head, every time he thought of her. It disgusted him to even think he enjoyed her company. The company of an iron-born invader and the last of Balon Greyjoy's line. Jacob was meant to be focused on the incoming battle against the Bolton and Fry armies, and not his mind straying towards a woman destined for life imprisonment. No one understood the true symptom of being lonely, and the pain that came with it. There was no one Jacob connected with on an equal level, 
who was not a mindless knight or servant who obeyed him without a thought. Sorel nor his cousin Luther could understand the gnawing ache of isolation within Jacob, them only being knights, who could make friends with any one of the king's men or any of the northmen fighting this war on their side. Was what did I feel towards Asha than I would feel towards Desmara? Was it disgust of who she was and how she is proud to be an iron-born invader? Or was the disgust more towards myself for subconsciously lusting after her when I am going to marry Alice days after the reclamation of Winterfell? It's so wrong and I was raised in an environment where sexual freedoms in secret dens were the norm and the reach, away from the watchful eyes of Lord Fathers and Lady Mothers. The prince was twiddling his fingers, and the thoughts towards his budding adolescence and trying to find himself in a world, where everything was laid out in front of him. He was no novice to the pleasures of the bedchambers and enjoyed his dalliances before he met Desmara, and all hell from that meeting broke loose. Would things have been different had Jacob not fallen in love with Desmara and one of the minor Tyrell girls instead? It was just nonsense from his adolescent years, that should have been snuffed out of his mind, the moment Jacob was punished and sent to Winterfell so dear old Ned Stark can correct his wild ways. Prince Jacob walked past a few of the northern tents, as it had the sigils of those houses, with the southern tents being on the other side of the camp. He held on to his mother's letters under his cloak, as it was the only thing he had of her that was new. He raised an eyebrow, as he caught a few voices from the distance and he did not know who those voices belonged to. The man walked further, towards the Karstark tent and stood at a considerable distance, as he could not afford to be seen lurking about like a spy. What do you mean, my lord? The king is not as imprudent as you believe him to be. A gravely tone of voice said, as it sounded as if it came from an old man. Of course, he's not. He's got that hairy son of his whispering in his ear. A false alliance was needed to get us closer to the king. Another voice replied, as it sounded familiar with its brazen arrogant tone. You made a big mistake, Lord Harold. You gave the prince a cause to be suspicious of you and your dim-witted family members and the other brother, the fool almost exposed us for good. Maester Tybald, may I remind you who you work for? Unless, you want me to tell Stannis what you have been doing and see who the king believes, his soon-to-be good family or a no-good maester, who serves the Boltons. You and your family are despicable, lying to the king for a marriage alliance that will not happen. Lord Arnolf informed me of your family's plot for your brother to steal Carhold by marrying Lord Ricard's daughter behind the king's back, knowing he intended to marry the girl off to his son. My father trusts you too much, maester. No one is afraid of Stannis, because of his poor defeat at the Blackwater, but his son is more formidable than him, all because he is a man and unmarried, there are many high lords, who will throw their daughters at him the second they know he is alive. You are right, Lord Harold. The man must be dealt with, knowing he is the main instrument behind Stannis's successes in ridding the north of the Ironborn, the wildlings, and cleared the White Hills of their own lands and gave it to the foresters. Get rid of him and Stannis Baratheon will falter and will have to rely on the narrow-minded soldiers of his council to advise him. The benefits wait for more than the risk, Tybald. For years, we were stuck under the thumbs of Lord Ricard and Ned Stark, and this marriage my father proposed will put our family under the thumb of Stannis Baratheon and he will have control of Carhold, and whatever grandchildren Alice births him. Your brother Arthur, my lord. He will ruin this, unless he cannot handle the pressure these plans require. We are almost close, the war for the north will begin and we will finally have that which worshipping demon and his whelp off our lands and his armies scattered across the north. My father will have him straight, but there have been complications. The wretched girl ran away from Carhold, as soon as she knew she was not marrying a prince. She was our most valuable pawn and to give her away to the spawn of Stannis Baratheon will be a waste of a good opportunity for us. What if Stannis marries off his son to one of the unwed Umber daughters or even Lord Mandalay's granddaughters, your lot and the Boltons will be in trouble. An unwed son is the greatest advantage Stannis has. The prince could believe what he was hearing, as it validated his doubts about the Karstarks, and him wanting to find out if there was a bigger plot surrounding this alliance. He knew at the back of his mind Lord Arnulf was plotting to seize Carhold and the Karstark lands, from under the main line and passing it on to himself and his sons. It was an underhanded play, and Alice was a pawn in all of this. She was not going to be his wife, 
but forced to become the spouse of that disgusting rat known as Cregan Karstark. Terrible as it was, Alice was the heir of House Karstark, if her brother Harrion is still alive and held hostage at Maidenpool. Jacob needed to tell Sorel and Luther what he had learned. He knew the voices belonged to Harold Karstark and some maester called Tybald, the one brought with Arnolf's retinue, but he was not the maester of Carhold, but from the Dreadfort. It was a wide plot involving the Karstark men, Maester Tybald and Roose Bolton, all in an alliance to get rid of Jacob and his father Stannis, to cripple their successful war campaign in the north and to crush them. He was glad, even though it was wrong to have relief, knowing Alice ran away from home and must be seeking protection from Cregan and rode to the wall. The enfolding of this treachery has consequences, knowing the men involved will be executed on his father's orders and Jacob will be without a bride once again. He was guilty of being relieved his former bride has fled her captors and false marriage to find freedom. The men in the tent were still there, but were not ready to leave, even though the prince was hiding behind another tent, belonging to a smaller northern house. Jacob had a habit of spying on people, especially on Mace Tyrell and his banner men, when he was young, by listening through the walls of High Garden, even though he never got caught by them. My father requested you send another map, as the raven for the previous was eliminated by a renegade arrow and he wants it done quickly. The voice of Harold said, in a tone of malice, clearing trying to intimidate the maester. It will be done, my lord. The voice of Maester Tybald replied. You are the key to this plot being a success. I am grateful for your information of the happenings with Cregan and Alice. My father will appreciate your service when everything is done and those Baratheon Southerns are dead. If the wretched girl is gone, it does not matter. Lord Bolton will reward you and your brothers with fry wives and the castles of empty houses, if everything goes to plan. My father will need to see you soon, Tybold. Prince Jacob hid behind the tent, as he watched an old man leave the tent with his maester chains jangling, as he walked out. His heart was racing, knowing he was in dangerous waters, but he could not help it. He enjoyed the thrills playing the game gave him and the risks it involved. It was much more interesting than swinging a sword on the battlefield, but he noticed Harold was still in the tent, unknowingly smug with himself and thinking his plans will ever blossom. Jacob knew the Karstarks led by Arnold were no good, but it seems his doubts were proven right and they were plotting to eliminate both the prince and his father for Roose Bolton. Anything to dampen their successful campaign and have it end at being stabbed in the back by the uglier Karstarks and that smug maester, who deserved to be strangled. What if Alice goes to the wall? She will surely get help from John, being distantly related to him through blood. My mother is also at the wall, and is also pushing for the Karstark marriage, as well as father does. She will surely protect her, knowing she is an unwed bride. The poor girl has had a rough time, in terms of betrothals with her previous two being eliminated on the battlefield against the Kingslayer and being forced to marry her distant cousin for power. The man realized what Arthur said at the dinner table, almost gave his family away and could have ended their plotting, but Arnulf stopped him in his tracks. It was not the mouth of the youngest son that would have exposed them, but it was the mouths of the Dreadfort Maester and the middle son, which will unravel their plot for them. In Jacob's opinion, Bruce Bolton was lazy and relied on fools to do his dirty work for him, as his list of war crimes mount up. The leech lord can hide behind Winterfell all he wants to, but sooner he will face to face the rightful king and his heir on the battlefield with sword in hand and not by being a coward. Jacob knew his father Stannis was still hosting the banker Nestoris, as the man had the means and finances to allow his father to succeed in the Game of Thrones. Whilst the Lannisters and Tyrells fight each other for whatever scraps of power there is for them to fight for. As much as Jacob hated hiding, he liked it as it gave him the advantage. Being a man of eight and ten and unmarried in the middle of a war, which is still going on, even though the other side believe they have won it. He and his father knew Roos Bolton had a fry wife, and she would make a lovely prisoner next to Asha Greyjoy and the treacherous Barbary Dustin as well. On the bright side, with Alice a runaway and the Karstarks revealing themselves to be traitors, it seems the doors of opportunity are open to the North once more. If only it was easy to sit his stubborn father and the fearful Lord Wyman on the same table, but it could happen if they won the battle, reclaimed Winterfell and had the heads of Lord Bolton and his idiot on spikes. The prince was thankful of hearing the plot between the Karstarks, 
Boltons, and that maester unfolding before his ears, as it means a new bride can be found for him from the right noble house. It was not easy, being the most eligible unattached man in Westeros, with every opportunity for marriage being crushed. The earlier plans for a Reacher marriage folded, after the dispute between Pax to Redwine and Randall Tarley ended, the after Blackwater betrothal idea was scuppered as they lost that battle and an eligible bride and the third ran away from treacherous relatives. Jacob almost hoped Ser Davos would return with a marriage proposal that would change everything for them, but he was still missing, and he did not know when he would come back to him. The prince got out from the hiding place and thought for a second what he wanted to do. His eye was on the Karstark tent and the man inside of it. He could leave and go tell his father, Sorel and Luther everything he heard from Harold and Maester Tybalt about their plot against them. He started to pace towards the tent and pulled the covers of it to see the man fidgeting with his fingers, with many swords and shields grafted with the white sun sigil of their house. Even though it's not their rightful sigil, around the tent, as it could be for him and his brother, when they fight on the battlefield. The prince kept his calm, and held his black gloved hands together, as the man turns around to see the prince, unexpectedly as he should come to expect, kings and princes come when they want to without any warnings, especially when they want to talk. Prince Jacob, what can I do for you, my almost good cousin? Harold said, in a tone of voice he would not normally use towards anyone. To talk about a serious matter, which you can help me with. Your father being the man he is, might withhold things from me. Prince Jacob replied, in a similar tone of voice. Of course, anything to help the man, who will elevate the status of our family further. I want to know about my bride, Alice. Your cousin and if your father will make good on his word on bringing her to Winterfell after the battle is over. My lord father will do anything the king requires of him. After all, your father would have pledged your hand to another lord and married some other tart in the north. Why is your brother so tight-lipped, whenever I mention her and why did your father hit him with his cane? when he was about to say something. Arthur and that big mouth of his, it's what won him his current wife. Father always hated his mouth, as it would get him in trouble. He hit him because it was bad conduct, in front of your father and yourself. Unless, your brother wanted to say something, but your father was afraid it was going to get out. Out about what? The fact my bride ran away from Carhold, explained that to me, Lord Harold, because I cannot understand, why a highborn girl would run away from her own home, unless she wanted to escape, let's say a false marriage and being lied to about who she was going to marry. The prince said, raising his voice against the Karstark lord. What do you mean by that? Who told you? I bet it was Moore's umber spreading rumors, so you could marry one of the Grajan's daughters instead. Harold bellowed. I'm asking you, my lord. As I assume you have the answers, unless you know more than you are telling me. Your brother is a fool and your father a halfwit, and it's why I came to you instead. Jacob said, with his voice tightly controlled, as he sounded like his father. The look on Harold's face with his gritting teeth, suggested he did not like being put in his place often. I only know what my father tells me. Or what you tell others or who your father orders around, like a certain maester. Maester Tybald is of our house and he must obey my father's orders, as the castellan of Carhold and regent head of House Karstark. No. That maester came from the Dreadford, because I met the maester for Carhold before and he was a different man and more pleasant than this one. You are on thin ice, undull filth. You dare to accuse me of lying about some maester. Why make it such a big issue? It's more than the maester's loyalties, but more about the loyalties of you, your brothers and your father. I know what I heard, my lord. You Karstarks are nothing but snakes the day I saw your retinue come into the village. My father, as stubborn as he is, does not believe your father to be true to his word. You bastards intended to steal my future wife and give her away to your older brother to claim lordship of Carhold for yourselves and plan to stab my father and I in the backs. I did what I had to do for the north. You and your father brought nothing, but chaos and war upon us. The boy Rob Stark lost the north, the day he married that western whore in the south and broke his promise to the phrase. He got what he deserves, as well as his mother, his dead brothers and the Tullus destroyed. You would want them dead too, after all, they refused your father's claim to the throne and bluffed his fealty as if it was a jape. 
your family will be dead, all within hours of each other. When my father knows, you will never see your brother, your nephews, or your father again. Is that a threat, Prince Jacob? My family have always been beneath those, who see themselves as better than us. You and your demon-worshipping father are no different. He will destroy the sacred weirwoods and replace them with flames with men burning alive. I hear the rumors from other Southerns about your father, the great Stannis Baratheon, who had his wife's uncle burned alive and destroyed the idols of the Seven on Dragonstone. Tell me, my prince. Why would you fight for a man, who does even respect your faith at all? Prince Jacob hated to admit Harold, the despicable Karstark was right in some cases. All his reasons were of superstitions and rumors he heard from others. Arthur had a big mouth, Cregan was a wife killer and Harold was the one, out of his brothers, who made the most sense in his convictions. He hid behind his drunken personality to make people see the surface and not look inwards. The man looked at Harold in the eye, and realized he was a bad liar, but was good at twisting the truth to suit his own purpose. Everything he said about the Starks was true, even though most hated to admit it because they were loved in the North and all the Northern houses had respect for them, except for the power-hungry likes of Roose Bolton and Barbary Dustin. He needed Harold to tell him everything in front of him, by him being rattled gave him control. You are right about one thing, Lord Harold. You are loyal to your family without question, as I am to mine. No matter what people say about my father, I am still on his side and you are on the side of your father, even though he berates you and your brother in our company. I'm glad to see you are not as blindly ignorant as you are, Prince Jacob. Your treachery goes many bounds, my lord. You pretend to be a drunkard, but you are truly the brains behind this plot with your father and that maester. Arthur would have ruined things, but father saved his skin again. Father warned us about you, how intelligent you are and how you are able to sniff out treachery in an instant. I must applaud you, undull filth. You uncovered a plot, even your grim-faced father never found out about. As Harold began to laugh, the prince punched the pretender lord across the face, seeing two teeth fall out of Harold's mouth. His knuckles must be bruised from smacking him in the face. Harold was knocked onto the ground with teeth missing from his mouth and he still grinned. He must have enjoyed being knocked down by someone stronger than him. The prince had no time to entertain the pretender's sick desire to be beaten up by Jacob's own hands, as he started to walk away. Harold pulled out a dagger from behind his trousers, it was not a glamorous one, but it was still a deadly weapon in the wrong hands. He glared at Prince Jacob, realizing only one of them was going to leave this tent alive. You think you are tough, us Northmen are stronger than you, git. Harold gritted between his teeth, with a tooth missing from the right side of his mouth and another at the bottom left. He charged with his dagger pointed at the prince, but Jacob brought out his own very jeweled one to counter the attack on him. He had been in confrontations before, and even eliminated a bandit, but fighting a lower class lord was going to be a challenge because Harold was a lot smarter than he pretends to be. Prince Jacob reflected Harold's wild and uncoordinated strikes with his own dagger, but the man was able to avoid the sharp end of the dagger. He moved away from where the pretender lord could see him, by appearing on his right side, and used his right arm to knock off Harold on his feet and him landing onto the ground. It was a shame, for Harold fall this way, but a Baratheon is as strong as the antlers of his sigil. It seems Lord Karstark learnt that lesson the hard way, and tasted Baratheon fury for a moment. The lord was planted onto the ground, holding onto his right leg, which must have been twisted during their bout and the prince looked on with a sense of apathy for someone, as treacherous as he was. The man turned his back on the pretender lord and looked past the covers of the tent to see Asha coming towards it, but out of the blue, something struck him in the left side of his stomach. He was negligent, in turning his back and started to notice something trickling down his leg. Jacob placed his hand on the spot to realize it was his own blood, and he had been stabbed on the side. What he feared would happen to his father has now become a reality for Jacob. The prince's vision was becoming cloudy and he could not see what was happening. He heard the shriek of a woman in his ear, and a low laugh coming from the man, who stabbed him. Jacob closed his eyes, knowing this could be his eventual end, but he did not want to die in the middle of a tent. He held on to where his wound was, and then collapsed on the ground from the dizziness circling his mind. 
He did not know this is where his life might end, but if it was then it would have been a poor end for such a man like him. Chapter 47 Was the hour of the wolf, when Asha Greyjoy was seized from her camping accommodation by knights adorned in red and white. She knew they were Stannis's southern men. She may not be chained again, but she was still marshalled by them, who ordered her to go with them willingly, unless she wants to face five knights alone. The men in red and white were under instructions from King Stannis himself. Ali Sane, the she-bear knew a little of what was happening, but it was big enough to cause discontent amongst the men Stannis brought from the south and the northerners fighting with him. Asha did nothing wrong, but she knew what she did to stop things getting worse than they were now. I did what I had to do. Why did I save the Greenlander from being eliminated by that Karstark beast? I saw the man stab him when the Green Prince saw me coming. I disarmed him, not aiming to eliminate because Stannis will have fun skinning him alive for wounding his precious son. Why did the Northmen stab the Green Prince, unless the man found out something foul about the Karstark men worthy of exposing to his father and he got stabbed for what he knew about it? The knights Asha saw were from House Follard, the men who guarded the Green Prince against one of the cannibals, who tried to attack him. The stick man had no chance in doing anything, as Ser Suggs opened the man's throat in front of his esteemed future king. She did not know what came over her, what drove her to save the life of a man, who openly disparaged her in public and in private. It must have been to make her prison sentence lesser than what the southern king instructed, but Asha knew Stannis paid no debts to anyone, he viewed as his enemies, but would he grant a favor for one, who saved the life of his only male heir. She was motioned by the guards to go towards the watchtower, the same tower the king and his son made themselves comfortable at, whilst the other men froze within their tents in the middle of the snows. Asha did not have much time, before any of Stannis's men found out about what she did. She would be seized by them to be dragged before the southern king and would have to explain herself. It was hard enough seeing her dear brother again, haggard and broken beyond recognition. What she did for the sweet green prince could have consequences for the life of Theon and the girl he rescued from Winterfell. The watchtower looked huge in front of her eyes, but she knew it was the dead of the night and men patrolled this area. The followed knights allowed her bread to eat before they seized her, as it was unusually good of them to do so. Asha had nothing to answer for, as she did nothing wrong, only saving the prince she tried to seduce. The trouble with Stannis would never see it that way, and see her for the person responsible for almost killing his son, and not the Karstark man who tried to it. She knew the southern king will put the blame on her, and not on a member of a family he desperately wanted to tie his son to for a northern alliance. It's not so simple, my lady. Prince Jacob's hand is sworn to the daughter of House Karstark. His grace is pleased to have secured an alliance in the north so soon. The South believe he is dead from being eliminated on the Blackwater and it can be used to our advantage. The King wants us to accommodate the Karstarks as much as we can, as we will be linked to them through marriage and most of us will serve the future Lady Karstark when she weds the Prince in Winterfell. Asha paid no attention to what Ser Justin was telling her at the time. As one of Stannis Baratheon's most valuable knights, Ser Justin was privy to a few of the King's secrets once every moment and was able to tell her as much as he could. He was keen in impressing her and, even courting her for titles and lands she does not own. The frigid prince was right about the night about the ambition of men in this camp, and Ser Justin was the most ambitious of them all, hiding under courtesies and treating her well. Unlike the queen's men, who would have dragged her out of bed and taken her by force to the king, but the followed knights gave her time to gather herself, before she was escorted by them. It was a shame the green prince had to be stabbed, for it was not what Asha wanted. She may have disliked for the frigid man, but she did not wish for his death, as it would complicate things even more. The knights entered the watchtower with the iron-born woman in their possession, as they passed the other knights of the southern king's host. Asha had to defend her tattered honor against a king, who would want to eliminate her, but all she did was disarm the man, who stabbed the prince not killing him, as Stannis would want to save her torturing the Karstark, who hurt his son. Within the watchtower was a sizable audience, with King Stannis sitting on a crafted wooden chair at the center. He had both his knights, Ser Richard and Ser Justin at his right side and the grim knight, Ser Sorel on the left side of the king, with a few minor lordlings and soldiers in attendance, even a few queen's men were there as well. 
The king gritted between his teeth and clenched his fingers onto the sides of his chair, as she knew he wanted someone held accountable for what happened to the prince and punished for it. You know why I have brought you here, Greyjoy. The king said, in a strained tone. He was not in the mood for formalities, knowing the severity of the situation at hand. You blame me for what happened to your son. Asha replied, standing straight with the follard knights getting her go. Noya were there when Harold Karstark, the drunkard attempted to murder my son. Yes, your grace I was. King Stannis turned his iron glare at Sorel, who was meant to be the sworn shield of his son, but the knight clearly had a look of guilt on his face. And you failed at your duty at shielding my son, Ser Grimm. You are to be dismissed from my son's service and therefore a common knight amongst others. It is your incompetence that almost cost me my heir, maybe the Lady Greyjoy should take your place, as she did what you were supposed to do. Asha was in a room full of foes, but she could not help, but be entertained by the king's jape made at the disgraced knight. I am honored at the offer, your grace, but I am your prisoner. I did not mean to be literal, my lady. I did nothing wrong, your grace. I was wandering around the camp and I heard an argument between the prince and Harold Karstark about him unfolding a plot. I already have knowledge of the Karstarks attempting to have me eliminated, with the help of their false maester, who serves the Dreadfort not Carhold. I was fortunate to have an ally, who informed me of the situation and how the Karstarks led by Lord Arnulf are working with Roos Bolton to have me and my son destroyed, and my son's bride stolen from us. Asha glimpsed the expressions on the faces of Stannis's loyalist knights and those to his they were of disgust and anger, especially Ser Sorel, the man who was meant to be shielding the sweet green prince from any harm or danger, but the man failed. The men thought the Karstarks were on their side in the war, but with what happened to the prince and Asha's own testimony on what transpired between the prince Jacob and Lord Harold, things were tense in the room. The men were muttering amongst themselves, as it irritated the king not to have full control his babbling court of king's men, queen's men and others he brought to the northern war. You decided to save Harold Karstark for the king's justice, I commend you on thinking such of me. King Stannis said, in an iron tone and had his eyes on Ser Sorel, the former shield of the Green Prince. And where were you when the Karstark almost eliminated my son? He was in the long hall with Ser Luther and others, your grace. Ser Sorel said, in a forlorn tone of voice. He looked to be ashamed of not doing his duty and now an injured prince lies in a healing hut because of his failure to be there for his charge. As far as Asha was concerned, he deserved to be dismissed from his post. Getting drunk with my distant cousin, while my son fights for his life. I never trusted you, reach man and you proved your disloyalty. You will be under Ser Richard's watch for the time being and keep yourself away from my son, unless you want to join the Karstarks on the execution block. Yes. Your grace. The disgraced knight said, with a bitterness hinted in his tone. He was not allowed to be anywhere near the prince he served, and he had to be watched by Sir Richard Horp, the most loyal of Stannis's knights and a queen's man. And as for the Karstarks, who conspired against me and to have my son murdered. The crooked lord, his sons and grandsons have been arrested for conspiracy and treason. The middle son will answer for his attempted murder of my son with his own death and those of his family. To think I considered marrying my son into their house, after knowing they conspired to steal his bride up from under me in order to seize power on Lord Ricard's lands. What if the iron helped the Karstark stab the prince in the back, your grace? Sir Clayton Sugg said, in a tone laced with malice, if she was there, then it makes her guilty as well. The Lady Greyjoy is not guilty. Sir Suggs, unless you want me to remind you. She saved my son's life and makes the rest of you look foolish in comparison. The Ironborn was pleased to see a terrible knight such as Suggs be put his place, but it was strange to have the king defend her and even believe what she told. It did not mean Asha was out of the woods yet, she did not know whether the king was going to keep her or let her go. She was a witness to what happened to the prince, which made her more valuable to the king. They say Stannis Baratheon had no weakness, but she knew his son was his sore spot and it was what made him stir more than normal. The men in his gathered court were fearful, but lucky they were not the ones at the center of the king's ire, like the failure knight. Ser Sorel looked down and didn't look up, when court was being held in the watchtower. 
He was out of place, as the king focused his ire at the knight, who failed to protect his son. Asha thought nothing of it, because the knight was no friend to her, but had some pity for him for being dismissed as the Greenland prince's shield and was just like any of Stannis's knights in the barracks again. The Ironborn knew not to test her luck, especially surrounded by Queen's men, who want to set her alight for their Red God and King's men, who want her eliminated alongside the Karstark, who tried to eliminate their warrior prince in a brutal way. The Karstarks played me false, I ate their salt and bread, and this is how they repay their rightful king. Attempting to eliminate my son and cripple my war efforts in the north. King Stannis gritted between his teeth, and he was eager to punish all the Karstarks for the crime of treason. What should we do, your grace? Sir Luther said, making his voice known within the court of burly northmen and shivered southern men. The treasonous maester will be brought to me at once. Sir Godry, you will be the man to bring the maester to my feet immediately, when this court has been dismissed. I will be happy to do so, your grace. Sir Godry replied, with a wide smile on his face. As for you, Lady Greyjoy. You may have redeemed yourself here, saving the life of my son and being a witness to the falseness the Karstarks presented to me. Unlike my son's failure of a sworn shield, you proved your innocence and I will not punish you today. Asha was relieved to hear it, as it was what she feared when she was brought the king. She was going to keep her head for now, as the king believed her over the louder voices of his queen's men, who were keen to see her be eliminated, alongside the Karstarks, who betrayed the king and his heir. She knew she was alone, in a room full of enemies and no allies to defend her, but she did not expect the defense to come from the southern king himself. The man may seem harsh and cold on the outside, but when he spoke of what happened to his son, the king's shell was breaking at the bite of his anger towards the knight, who swore himself to protect the green prince and failed. Stannis Baratheon claims to have no weakness or vulnerable spot, but Asha saw what it was. It was his son and his only male heir, which is the source of his current anger of what happened to him. The king's son was his only weak spot and the Karstark sought to use it against him, but too bad for them, all of them will be executed later in the coming moons. Asha may not have wanted to see the queen's men burning men alive, but a good chopping would do the trick for the Karstarks, who tried to eliminate the Greenland prince. The king loves his son, as cold as he seems. He does care for his son, in his own way. Stannis dismissed Ser Grimm from the prince's guard because of the man's failure in doing his duty. The king had it out for the Reach Knight and this was the perfect opportunity for him to make him the one at the target of his fury. At least his ire is not directed at me for once and his loyal knights can rest from being under the king's constant biting comments and scrutiny in his eyes. She was fortunate to be spared for now, but it would not last long before the southern king has knowledge about how his precious heir is lusting after ironborn scum like her, and the man will be ruined for all potential northern brides. The ironborn reaver considered the king's search for a northern bride for the prince to be pointless. The eligible ones are either dead or already married in the Greenlands, but Stannis Baratheon was not a man for giving up and will do whatever it takes to get his son matched with a northern girl by any means necessary. Even if the prince himself may not like the girl, he must marry her on his father's orders and for hope the stag's bloodline will replenish itself through the king's young and fruitful son. Her hopes of becoming a southern queen was fading through fast, even though Stannis would never allow his son to wed ironborn scum like her. Asha could sense the glares of all the king's knights all on her, as if she was the one guilty for attacking the prince. She was reminded again, of how she was surrounded by northerners and southerners, who wanted to eliminate her or even shed a little of her iron-born blood for the pleasure of it, but she was the king's hostage. She was alive because of the king and her fate was in his hands. The captain was groggy the next morning, after the night of being trapped between King Stannis's knights and some of the northmen. Asha could tell the war camp was in high alert, after the prince's stabbing by Harold Karstark, who was arrested alongside other members of his family for apparent treason against the king, as the southern king had eyes at the back of his head to know what was going on. She was stuck with Sir Justin Massey for the day, as he was her permanent escort because she cannot be let out of sight, as most of the king's knights still blame her for what happened, even though the truth was right in front of them. The snowstorm kept increasing through the days, as it eliminated off some of the army's horses, with them being a small amount of them still alive on the journey south from Deepwood Mott. 
she was fine staying away, as it was what she was told to do. The southern king didn't like her, as she existed as proof of his son's victory against the remnants of her men in the northern castle. It was Prince Jacob, who defeated her in single combat on the field and yet his father was the one, who took the credit for it. A few tents were blown away by the heavy storms, but it kept Stannis resilient and never wanted to turn back, unless he was dying on the field. Asha could sense Sir Justin's gaze on her, as he was still pretending to be the shining champion, who would win her at and her iron-born lands, but her thoughts were on another man, another who was fighting for what was left of his life in a healing tent. Why would she think of a man, who openly hated her and called her scum to her face? It was the thrill of it, she liked about the prince, nothing else. He was the only decent-looking man in this camp and was the king's son, which made things more interesting in her mind. Sir Justin is a sad knight, all he cares about is his own ambitions. He would never willingly disobey Stannis, like his son does because he was born a high lord and can do anything he wants. The king put away my iron-born men to ensure my good behavior, but it would be easy for him to eliminate them in front of me, as a warning of staying away from his son. The forbidden is always more inciting than what was allowed because of the prince being married off to some Greenland woman, who is only a broodmare to birth his children and keep Stannis's bloodline from dying out. The iron-born captain was bitter, bitter towards everything that happened to her. Her mother was a lifeless corpse, barely alive and grief-stricken for Theon her father dead, murdered by the mad uncle who wears his driftwood crown and took the iron fleet with him to the south and the uncles, who stole her birthright from her. Asha had nothing, apart from her name. As a grey joy, she still had value to the Greenlanders and was going to be a prisoner for the rest of her life. It was penance for what the Ironborn had done to the North and what Theon had done to the Starks, who used to rule the North. Her brother was responsible for allowing the Boltons to have a foothold in Winterfell and for the war to continue in the North. Asha loved her little brother dearly, but never forgot his faults and the consequences it brought. It was unlikely she was going to take him home to see their mother again, not after Stannis beheads him in front of the Northmen, as a show of faith to them, as their rightful king. She wouldn't want Theon to die so far away from the sea, where he was born and where he belonged with her and their ailing mother, who missed him so much in Ten Towers. She couldn't think about him now, especially with her diligent escort next to her with his smiling face. Sir Justin was good company for the road, but she looked at him in a new way, after the prince revealed his true intentions towards her. You should not wander off, my lady. Sir Justin said, in a dull tone. Should I be shackled again? Asha replied. Of course, not my lady. Things are tense and with the situation with the prince, it's best you stick by me. I am not guilty, if it's what you think. I believe you, about those Karstarks. The king arresting them all proves what you said to be true. Why would I be foolish enough to hurt him? The prince is often targeted by his father's enemies. I should be rewarded. For what, my lady? Saving his life, ungrateful green man. The iron-born captain said, with a brittle bite in her tone. His grace, the prince will thank you, but his father will not. The smiler was right in a way. Stannis Baratheon was not the kind of man, who thanked anyone for anything, as it was in him to be a stubborn and self-righteous man. The king inspired obedience, never loyalty out love like some Greenlander lords did, but it kept him in the game. He was brittle man, who accepted nothing, unless it was an advantage for him in the long term. She wondered how Prince Jacob could tolerate a father like Stannis. Who was Asha to judge? As her own father Balon was a bitter man, lamenting his loss of his own foolish rebellion and the two sons who died because of his folly. Asha was her father's heir, all because of the sons he lost in the war, and he was sure his bloodline continued through her, even though she was a woman, who would eventually take her lord husband's name and not keep her own last name. There was an irony of the false marriage forced on her, as long as she was Stannis's prisoner. Asha will never want to stare into the face of the old reaver, Nuncle Euron made her husband in name only. She was in no hurry to go back to the Iron Maker, who occupied the Iron Islands and Pike in Euron's absence. The man cannot afford the ransom for her release, but even if he had enough coin for her, King Stannis would never let her go. She was too valuable to him, as a hostage and a pawn in his game with the Northern Lords. 
Take me to the healing tent, my noble champion. Asha said, in a different tone, as it might surprise Sir Justin. I cannot, Lady Asha. The king has forbidden any knight from going there, only the maester brought from the forester retinue and the prince's cousin, the Estermont boy, are allowed there. Sir Justin replied. You are my guard, are you supposed to go wherever I go? I am already under fire, by the king for doing my duty poorly. I will not disobey him again. You could be the prince's new shield, Sir Justin. Why, my lady? The king dismissed the reach man and this could be your opportunity. Asha had gotten Sir Justin to think. The most obedient of Stannis's knights could be elevated, from the vacuum of Sir Sorel being dismissed by the king and other knights could be in contention as well. She saw through the gallant knight he pretended to be, as it was Prince Jacob, who told her the truth about the smiler. She was growing used to the discomfort the war camp brought her, as one of the only women present, which made most of the men around here stir more, as some have never seen a woman in years, since they started fighting Stannis's war for the throne. Asha was more aware of what would happen, if she stepped out of line, surrounded by Southerns and Northmen, who want to bleed her dry and believe she hurt the prince. She didn't like him, the grim Prince Jacob, who inspired fear and hatred of those around him. He was no green man and could have eliminated her at Deepwood Mott and left her in the snows to bleed out. The stag kept her alive to secure the victory for his father and for his forces that day. He treated her as she was the true enemy, and not Roose Bolton. It didn't matter to Asha, as the deaths of the Boltons and Freys will satisfy her hunger, for revenge for what they did to Theon, behind the walls of Winterfell's dark dungeons, where the idiot of Bolton broke him. Sir Justin was a knight desperate to rise through the ranks he had nothing to his name, since the Lannisters took everything from him. Asha knew the Smiler wanted to be connected to her, as a way of furthering his own ambition to be Lord of the Iron Islands through her, but it was never going to happen. Euron was king and had the loyalty of the old-minded Reavers, who wanted to continue terrorizing the Greenlands, not knowing the consequences, with the Lions and Roses on the throne. The madman was going to lead the Ironborn into more death and violence, as the Greenlanders, who hold the South will never forget the Ironborn and Euron's invasion will get her fellow Ironborn eliminated in this war. The Ironborn captain was being led by Sir Justin through the treks of the Heights of Snows. It was going to get colder, and the armies will perish day by day, waiting for their moment of glory on the battlefield. Asha knew it was a risk, knowing she will face the Northmen, as it was a northern house, whose maester is mending the prince's wounds. The knight was risking a lot for her, even though he still has hope of becoming her husband, as a reward from King Stannis, for his loyalty to him. Sir Justin was persistent, even though everything is stacked against him he was unpopular with the other knights and the prince personally disliked him. Asha had extra furs on her, as it was colder than the previous days. The bones of the perished horses were bare to see buried in a foot of snow. Horse heads were scattered around the blown-down tents, which couldn't hold against the fury of the heavy storm coming this way. As a hostage, she was fortunate than most. However, she was still a gutter rat compared to Stannis's second cousin, the Estermont boy with hair like dragon fire and his son, the lord of the storm and fury. The cold had caused her to lose some feeling on her nose, as her fingertips were filthy from sleeping in cramped conditions with the she-bear most days. The tent ahead had the banner of the white branched out tree, on a black field. It was the banner of House Forester, a proud, but small northern house in the north near Deepwood Mott. There were guards from House Follard guarding all areas surrounding the tent. Sir Justin's newly found status might allow her to pass them, but the guards sneered at her, without saying a word. All Greenlanders thought she and her fellow Ironborn were pirates and rapers, and in their eyes were the worst kind of people on their shores. Who passes here? One of the red and white knights said, and stared down at Sir Justin, looking down upon him. Sir Justin Massey, good sirs. Sir Justin said, introducing himself to the knights, even though Asha assumed all of Stannis's knights and soldiers knew each other by name. You cannot pass here, sir. Why not? The king had specific instructions to guard this area. As one of the king's most loyal knights, I am allowed inside, just to check on how the prince is doing. The king will want to be updated. Do you take us for fools? One of the other knights said, 
in a bitter tone. Of course, not good sirs. I would never do such a thing, knowing the king placed your house knights here to protect the prince. You are only allowed inside, until we say you come out, but the ironborn filth stays with us. The Lady Asha is my responsibility. As her escort, she goes everywhere with me. Keep a tight leash on her, since she is the king's prize after all. Sir Justin led her into the tent, as the curtains opened her nose to the stench of bleeding flesh, which she hoped the maester cleaned up before she came in. The healing hut was not much, as it only had a portly maester dangling his long chain around, whilst cleaning up his station to make sure the infections don't spread through the camp. Asha saw what was in front of her, the prince who was full of life and brazen force was now a living corpse laid out for her to see. She didn't know if he was still alive, after losing the blood he did, being stabbed by the Karstark days ago. She used the trim of her fur cloak to cover her nose from the unbearable stench, but Sir Justin didn't mind it at all. As a man at war, her champion must have smelt worse than this. Sir Justin was quivering, underneath the guide of a confident knight. Men who feared anything were closer to death than they knew a lesson Asha learnt as a young reaver on Pike years ago. She never forgot what her father taught her, as she was the only child he had left, cutting ties with Theon altogether, as he was too soft and more Greenlander, than Ironborn when he came home to them. How can he be still alive? The prince looks dead, and if the flowers bloomed in the frozen wasteland of the north, then I would give one to him. The place stinks, no wonder why the horses have perished in the storms with a smell like that coming from the forester healing tent. Sir Justin is unfazed by the terrible smell, as a soldier used to bad smells. I could not have gotten in here without my champion, even though those knights outside could do with a leash on their tongues for being rude, without manners, it's how Stannis trains his men. A drawn breath was sounded from the prince's frozen, pale lips, and Sir Justin turned around. He was gleeful, to not have a dead prince or to be next ruled by the little girl, Stannis left behind at the wall with his lady wife and his red witch. The prince being alive vindicated Asha, and no longer should she bear the guilt of doing something decent. When the sweet green prince wakes up and still hates Asha, she is better off for it, as it will remind her, he is himself, his brittle and hateful self. She stood by Sir Justin, as she knew her champion was willing to defend her against the higher-ranking knights of Stannis. He was risking a lot, all for a chance to further his ambitions in becoming her lord husband in name only. How is the prince, maester? Sir Justin asked, not wanting to know the extent of the prince's wounds, but it was formality for him to report to Stannis about his son's recovery. The prince's wounds have been healing well, luckily he only lost a small amount of blood and wasn't dead. A strong man, he is. I expect he will awaken soon. The maester replied. The king is thankful for what you have done for him. It matters not, sir. Prince Jacob has done good for the foresters, giving us the reparations for what those ghastly Whitehills have done to them. The Karstarks responsible have been arrested for their crimes. Better safe than sorry, good sir. Asha couldn't help, but fidget with her fingers. She could not stand still forever, as it bored her not to do something with herself. She knew what the Karstarks did, Stannis will never forgive and will be gleeful in seeing them all executed for their crimes, even the little boys Lord Arnulf brought with him. All children inherit the sins of their parents, even if the children do not know or are ignorant. Asha carried more than the tattered ruins of her father's legacy, but the guilt of her own failure to secure her birthright from her meddling uncles. It was what she deserved for being beaten by a Greenlander in single combat, and for allowing her injured leg to be her downfall. The injured leg was fully healed, and she still limped on it, as a memory of what happened in the Wolfswood that day. The ironborn captain tried to put on a face of not caring, but she could not because she had a hand in the prince still being alive. Asha never saw her brother after the big umber man took him and the frozen northern girl away, after their short reunion with each other. There was no way, she could ever take Theon home to their mother, as Stannis means to eliminate him in front of the Northmen to gain their support. She was his sister, but never forgot what he was to the rest of the world. A turn cloak. A child killer and a traitor to the young wolf. The maester has done a good job with the prince. He should be a part of the king's retinue, but the foresters value him well. 
Sir Justin said, in a low tone. Should we stay when he wakes up? Asha asked. I do not know, my lady. The maester will want us out of here, and the knights of Follard will want us on our way. Unpleasant, are they? The king likes their diligence to his orders, unlike the failures like Sir Grimm. What happened to him? He is just another one of the king's men now, not so privileged anymore. The king blames him for his son being in this state. Asha never thought of Ser Sorel, to her his identity was his association with Prince Jacob and being his sworn shield, but he was dismissed by the king in front of his court. She did not care for him, as he was not ironborn and a southern from the reach, who wanted her dead for her nuncle's actions. With the grim knight gone, more of Stannis's knights and captains will want to step up to such an important duty, even though the chosen man will be allowed a warmer sleeping area than a cold. Damp tent for most nights, and will not have to eat frozen horseflesh for supper and eat something warm from the fires. The maester was putting his finishing touches onto the prince's original wound, which had gotten smaller through days of working to clean it up. A groan was heard from the prince's frozen form, with his still fingers now moving as a sign of life in him. Sir Justin turned to the prince's now conscious form, and his eyes widened at the sight of the young man's fingers wriggling, as if he had seen a ghost come back from the dead, he had a gleeful smile on his face, as did the maester, who saved his life. Asha had seen plenty of her men wounded before, but she kept all her feelings under the guise of being a leader to her ironborn soldiers. This time it was different, as the man was Stannis's son and a man, who she should hate with every fiber of her being. The nephew of the Yo Robert Baratheon, who ordered her last brother be stolen away from her by Greenlanders. All that mattered now, was the prince was alive and was waking up. Will he remember the Karstark, who almost eliminated him? Or will he be the same again after being under for so long? The prince's head gave a slight movement, as it indicated he was very much alive and not a lifeless corpse. Asha could give Prince Jacob his due, of surviving death like it was nothing. It must be in his Baratheon blood not to give in to death so easily, when he had so much to live for and a throne to see to the end. Chapter 48 An ache shot through the prince's body. He rose to his feet and they touched the ground. He could not believe the stall this long, all because of a snowstorm at the worst possible time. The prince looked to his right see Maester William, the maester who saved his life and dedicated much of time to helping his recovery. Jacob wanted to strangle the life out of Harold Karstark for trying to eliminate him and his brother Cregan for stealing his bride from him. It didn't matter to him, as his father King Stannis was going to deal with Harold and the rest of his family. It was another blow to him, to have another bride lost away from him yet again. The man was bitter, being addled on milk of the poppy for so long. The effects were wearing off and Jacob was able to think straight. The first person he saw when he woke up from his unconscious state was Asha Greyjoy, a terrible surprise and he never wanted to see her face. He didn't care she saved his life she was scum and he was going to enjoy seeing her locked behind bars in Winterfell forever. He rubbed his hand against his forehead, remember how great of a sleep he had, whilst on milk of the poppy. It was no wonder Uncle Robert wanted the milk of the poppy dose before he died, because it numbed the pain and addled his mind onto other things, rather than focus on the pain he was experiencing from the stab wound. Jacob was helped by the maester to put on his clothes and his furs, but his muscles were stiff. He never thought being out cold would make him lose strength, but he will need to retrain himself at some point before the war began. The fact of the matter was, things were getting worse since the Karstarks turned cloak on his father, but they were never loyal to him anyways. He knew at the back of his head, the Karstarks were no good and he was right about them. Arnulf Karstark promised his father men for the war and a bride for Jacob to marry the army was delivered to the rightful king, but the bride was about to be stolen away, had Alice Karstark not had the senses to run away from Karhold. The prince was getting used to moving his body parts again there was an emptiness within him, almost black and sucking everything he liked about himself down. Jacob never thought, he would be foolish enough to allow himself to be stabbed. As a man grown, he should have been more careful, but there was no use in dwelling about the past now. He needed to recover, in order to be at his father's side, as he should be as a son of House Baratheon and the rightful prince of the Seven Kingdoms. What was I thinking? Allowing Harold, the drunk to gloat me into a fight, knowing he was just as much of Snake, 
as the rest of his family. I almost died as a result and Shireen would have been burdened with being father's true heir to the throne had I died. It was something I never wished on her. I only take the burden of my father's expectations, just so Shireen doesn't have to and can be a child, for as much as she can, before she is grown up enough to know about the cruelty of the world. Jacob was pacing back and forth in the tent, as a way of exercising his legs and the muscles in them. He didn't like being stuck in one place, as a Baratheon he didn't like being cornered or trapped in one place, as he needed to roam and to express some form of freedom. The prince sees the maester is doing his work, but he never knew what to say to him, even though Maester William wasn't a part of his father's retinue, as he rode in with the forester procession led by Lord Asher. One of the last of his family with his younger siblings Ryan and Talia being looked after by Lady Sibel at Deepwood Mott, whilst their brother went to war with whatever remained of the forester armies after the decimation of the Ironwood by the White Hills and the Dustins. The man was more revised in northern politics, as he was the southern because of how long he has been in this region for. He knew the Northmen wanted their fair share of Bolton blood, as well as skinning the remaining White Hills alive too, as that house were the lapdogs of the Boltons and Karstarks led by Arnulf. Jacob considered himself lucky not to marry Alice, as it was impossible now, since she ran away and is at the wall under protection of the Lord Commander. It might leave room for other loyalist houses in the north to come forth to the table, House Umber had maiden daughters ready for marriage and so did the Sirwins and Flints. But the traitor houses also had unwed daughters, who are likely to be sold to the Boltons' northern allies and the Freys. I'm glad to see you walking again, Maester William said, in a hoarse tone of voice, whilst his chains of office were dangling against the metalwork. I was afraid the wound would eliminate you. I am a Baratheon, we don't die so easy. I'm glad you are alive. My father will be grateful for all you have done for me. You know the Greyjoy woman came to visit every day. Never thought of it. She was most saddened of what happened to you, but that unpleasant night was always with her. Always smiling in a way that would scare children. Sir Justin, not easy on the eyes, but obedient and loyal, just what my father wants in men. The Karstarks will never live to see the winter, when your father is done with them. It was what Jacob wanted, to see the heads of all the Karstarks roll, even the young grandsons of Arnulf to be eaten alive by the big guard dogs brought east by the mountain clans. He didn't care at all, even when Asha came to see him, but what was her aim in all this? She was a prisoner for life, but a married woman. She wasn't allowed to marry anyone else, unless she could change religion and that marriage would be null and void, if she converted to the seven rather than worship the drowned god. Who was Jacob to be japing? Why did Asha's life affect him so much, even when he was going to confront Harold about what he heard him and Maester Tybalt say to each other? It was something at the back of his mind, which was the darker voice in his head, telling him of all the forbidden things he desired, but could not act on because of his loyalty to his father Stannis and their war campaign in the north. The prince was miffed, how the Greyjoy woman was one of the only visitors he had, since he was injured. Sorel Grimm nor his father paid him a visit at all. Jacobs gritted, like his sire, but not loud enough for Maester William to hear it. He was thrown to the side, as if he didn't matter to anyone at all. Jacob was a Baratheon, the king's son and the next ruler after his father. He was no common knight to be thrown away to the side, after an injury. From the things Maester William told him about how he came along it was because the previous Maester of the Foresters was murdered by Whitehill men, days after the Red Wedding members to House Forester were scattered. Until Lord Asher returned from exile to restore order and secure his remaining siblings from High Point with the help of Jacob and his father's armies in the battle to restore House Forester to their rightful place and to control an advantage point in the Wolf's Wood to then battle the Ironborn in the forests. He never stopped and think of the battles he has been through, one after another and never had time to grieve for his dead uncles. It didn't matter to Jacob because he was taught grief was a woman's outcry and not for men, but it was not true. His father grieved for his brothers, the tatters of his house and being nowhere near close enough to be on the Iron Throne. Jacob fought for his father's cause and for his own glory at the same time, it built his reputation for being a formidable warrior on the field and a shrewd politician outside of the battlefield. 
The Iron Bank were just another advantage he and his father had over the Lannisters and with the bank support, they could be on the throne without even fighting the Tyrell and Lannister-backed armies anyways. But a debt will have to be paid to the Iron Bank, during the start of his father's reign as the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. The prince's eyes always widened, at the sight of Ser Justin, a knight who believes himself attractive, but he is average compared to most men. Even that pretty boy Loras Tyrell was pleasant to look at for the girls of the South, but Jacob hated the Knight of Flowers. It pleased him to know the pretty knight is close to death on Dragonstone, through letters and whispers through the mouths of the men, in his father's army, the leftovers from Dragonstone, the Stormlands, and the Reach. To outlive Loras Tyrell and the Kingslayer is Jacob's only motivation in living through the war, to live while his enemies are dead is the great pleasure Jacob can cherish from the demons of war. The maester was cleaning his workstation, because of the cold and the easy spread of infections. There was nothing worse than the maester seeing soldiers, who were getting frosted fingertips and their feet were discolored from sleeping in the freezing tents for many nights straight. It was gruesome to see, but Jacob was fortunate to be the king's son and to be highborn to never suffer from anything to this level. He noticed himself through the only handheld mirror Maester William had with him on the journey. His beard had grown around his face, but the prince had to cut off some of the overgrown facial hair from his face to make it look as if he had never been wounded and was still the same great warrior on the battlefield. His eyes, sapphire blue, but steeled and were unrelenting. The optimistic man was dead and this new man rose from the maester's workstation and was hungry, starving for the blood of his enemies and to eliminate Harold Karstark by his own hands. Prince Jacob picked up his sword, the jeweled dagger and found his letters were still in his cloak pockets. He was glad to have his property back to him, as it would have made him more anxious about not being comfortable with anything in this frozen wasteland. The prince clutched onto his pendant of the seven-pointed star, knowing the faith of the seven never left his side at all, even at his time of need. The stranger could have taken him away at that moment, but it was the other gods, who spared his life and to bring him back to fight the war for his father if he wanted to. He was tired of being stuck inside the tent and wanted to go outside and breath in the cold, winter air. Jacob never liked the north at all, with its cold climate and its stark loyalists he was only here to fight a war and then leave the north in the hands of the people. The man decided to take the first few steps, by pulling the curtains of the tent, to be hit with a chill only heard in northern stories. It was colder than before, and he kissed his pendant for luck to still be alive in these bad times. He didn't care, unless he was fighting the war, but more important politics had to be played. The Karstarks needed to be punished for their crimes and there was going to be dissent in the ranks because of what happened to him, but he was treading through the snows. Wondering what happened to Sorel and why his sworn shield was not at his side, during his dance with death and maybe find his cousin Luther. Jacob needed his redhead cousin, all because something wasn't right in the camp, and no one was telling him anything. Maester William told him what he wanted to hear, not wanting to upset him or set him off balance, it was his job as a healer and a medicinal man to do so. The man wanted to see a familiar face, rather than see the smiler every day with the ironborn scum he brings with him. Jacob was alone, but there were men potting around the war camp, not noticing the prince back from the dead. It did not matter, when the camp seems to be in high alert, more than usual since he was stabbed by Harold Karstark. He held on to the hilt of his sword in caution and his eyes were analyzing his surroundings. It was to be aware of danger happening at any time. Where could this idiot be? Luther must not have gone far, with my father wanting him at his side. Luther was an Estermont, therefore it meant he was family, no matter how distant of a cousin he was to my father, Shireen and me. He could be in the long haul but would not be there anymore because of the high alert. I wonder where father keeps the prisoners that are not Asha Greyjoy I know he keeps Gwyn Whitehill under the guard of the Knights of House Follard. That girl is a bargaining chip to lead Lord Whitehill and his sons out of the Bolton's range, if he wants to see his only daughter again. The prince looked to see an orange-haired man, coming towards him with a smile on his face. Jacob had always mistaken Luther's hair color one too many times Luther's mother was from the Riverlands, his hair was too bright to be of distant Tully relation, but it made him stand out from other nights. He grumbled of how his cousin is coming now and not visiting him when he was awake. Jacob did not hold it against him because his father nor Sorel never visited him either. 
all he wanted was an explanation why was that the case. Or what was happening in the war camp had the soldiers on high alert. Jake. I thought you were dead. Sir Luther said, in a mocking tone. Not realizing it was a jape in poor taste to the prince. I'm good now. I'm glad to see you back on your feet, cousin. A lot has happened, since you were out. What do you mean? Theon Greyjoy is alive and looks like a haggard old man. Could barely recognize him. Why is he here? Moore's umber brought him and some frozen girl to your father he said they jumped out of the window of Winterfell to escape the Boltons. I don't believe it. It's impossible to think he would try to get himself eliminated. You are cold, cousin. Did dancing with death make you bitter? I know better now. No one will be spared all enemies will die, starting with the Karstarks and Theon himself. What happened to you? I saw the other side, Luther. The world between life and death, and where the stranger almost took me away. Are you better or are you claiming madness now? Luther said, in a concerned tone. I feel better than ever. I can't wait to start retraining again with Sorel. Luther had a saddened look on his face, tucking his hands under the sleeves of his bearskin furs. Did anyone not tell you what happened? What do you mean? Sorel Grimm was expelled, as your sworn shield. Your father's orders, since he was getting drunk, when you got stabbed by Harold Karstark. He should not have made that decision. I hired him as my sworn shield, and I should have expelled him on my own. The king's orders, he said. I agree on that perspective. You almost died in your sworn shield, the man who is tasked to protect you goes drinking with common soldiers. If I was your father, I would have done the same thing in good riddance to him. How can you say that? Look, I know it's upsetting to hear this news, but think of it this way. Your father can rest easy knowing he is not around you anymore. My father never came to see me, the maester told me. That's rough, your own father leaving you to the wolves. The prince rolled his eyes at what Luther said. The knight tolerated Sorel for his sake and defended him in the war council against the queen's men, who wanted to discredit his contribution to the northern war effort, but he saw it from a common perspective of what happened. The reach man failed at his duty to be Jacob's sworn shield and his father dealt him the consequences needed. It was a shame not to see Sorel any more at his side, but it was for the best. The man failed and was just another knight of the king's men, which meant he would see Sorel on the battlefield, but not in the watchtower anymore. Jacob knew Sorel will be subjected to sleeping in frozen tents with the rest of the men, as a great way for his father Stannis to punish him further for his failure to protect him. Jacob and Luther began trekking through the mounds of snow on the ground, little clusters of snowflakes falling on their faces, signaling a harsh winter to come. The two cousins didn't speak after their conversation, but the prince was guilty of chastising his cousin that way, but he could not help it. His feelings were compressed when he was comatose and never had a chance to express his true anger, anger at his father for not visiting and dismissing his own knight when he was the one, who gave Sorel his title in the first place. Jacob never understood how callous his father was in not seeing his own son in his time of need, why could he not spare a minute or a day to be with him? The prince departed from his cousin, whilst Luther was needed by the king. Jacob began to stumble on his feet, as it took him some time for him to walk normally again. The muscles in his legs would have stiffened when he was unconscious, but he was getting around fine and no one needed to question his ability to function, as he did before. He wrapped himself within the furs around him. Jacob did not have an easy time recovering from his wound hot flushes through the night when he woke up from his comatose state and the loud rants spewed towards the maester, who healed him. He apologized to Maester William every time those rants happened he had a lot of pet up anger inside him. It was a Baratheon flaw passed down through the generations. His father Stannis's anger was more simmering and silent, Uncle Robert's was more expressive and louder, but Uncle Renly never showed any anger, unless his pretender plot for the throne was in danger. Jacob was never the man to be angered easily, but it just erupted days after he woke up. He kept his feelings inside because it was inconvenient to him and his father. The prince's anger was directed towards his father and the patriarch position he held in what was left of House Baratheon. There was no excuse for a father not to visit his own son in the healing tent, 
he didn't care if his father was busy or not he needed him at his side through the trauma he was dealt with at the hands of Harold Karstark. The man laughed at the thought of his mother, Queen Celis. His mother would have stayed by his side through everything, because a mother would never abandon her child, no matter how ill they are, but it made him miss her. He had sickened thoughts in his mind, darker thoughts of strangling some minor lord to death with his own hands. With blood trickling down hands and a smile painted on his face, when the man was crushed to death in his own clouded dreams. Jacob would shut those thoughts from his head before, but they were coming up from the surface and he strangely liked it. The emptiness within him was a result of something dying inside him when he was stabbed. He was changed, more cautious and less sentimental in his thoughts. The prince wanted to be alone, isolate himself from everyone else. He remembered wanting to recover fast enough for him to get back to sword training, but Maester William never gave in to his demands, which would have made things worse to Jacob. As a Baratheon, he was stubborn as hell, even his mother told him so, but there was a time for him to grow up and mature, and the war did its job for him. I never read the other letter from my mother. I didn't want to because I was busy recovering from my injuries. The situation didn't get any better, but at least I will see justice done with the deaths of the Karstarks by the chop, as the Northmen would do so. Killing their own enemies, instead of having someone else do it for them. It's something father hopes to take to King's Landing when he is finally crowned, to be his own king's justice rather than give the job to someone else. The prince sees the bones of dead horse parts littered in the snows, but to Jacob, he was fortunate he still had his horse. He missed his horse, the horse he had since he was eight and was looking forward to seeing her again. He could not believe Ser Sorel was dismissed but be understood why his father expelled him. The Reacher Knight failed Jacob in his hour of need, and it was for the best to never be around him again. He had his cousin Luther Estermont for company, so he was not alone again. Sorel has been nothing, but a good sworn shield to him. The man helped him escape Old Town and out of the lands of the Tyrells. He never would have gotten back home, if it had not been for Sorel Grimm, but he did nothing to deserve being humiliated by his father, who always disliked him. The man was almost like a friend to him, even though having friends in the Game of Thrones was not allowed because attachments were a weakness and the easiest way to the grave he made a mistake of turning his back on Harold Karstark. But he will never make that mistake again. This was war and there was no time for second thoughts or even thinking of getting out of it. A deserter can run away under the guise of the night, but not Jacob, the king's son and a leader in his own right. His face was too familiar, his look was too, and his last name was as well. The man trekked through a big mount of snow, as its snowflakes coated his fur cloak. Jacob was growing used to the cold weather, but it was not getting easier for the remains of his father's host. Southern men could not handle such temperatures, as they account for the deaths of the men, who came with them south from Deepwood Mott. The ones, who were still alive were lucky and could keep up with the Northmen, when the great march towards Winterfell started. He never saw any of the soldiers loyal to his father for some time, as he was sick from a bad fever and trying to heal from being stabbed. The prince was usually healthy, and nothing happened to him, until he was vulnerable, and Harold Karstark took advantage of it. What was left of the cavalry was pulling carts towards the long hall, as it was the only place, where it was warm enough to stay in. Jacob visited the long hall once, and never again because it was for other men to enjoy and his father needed him at the time. All he did in those times was read letters from frightened northern lords, who refused his father's rightful claim to the seven kingdoms and professed loyalty to Rob Stark and his memory. These northmen made him angry, how dare they when their precious king of the north is dead with his body attached to a wolf's head. Prince Jacob and his father were their last hope in deposing the Boltons and Freys from Winterfell and they refused their help because of northern pride. The prince had respect for the clansmen of the north, whom were only small in their numbers, but had more heart than the rest of their kin. He looked old enough to be one of them, but he was happy enough with the dysfunctional family he has already. Jacob sees a bone, must be the bone of a guard dog that perished moons ago. He was not used to seeing things perish, but it reminded him of how the North is a cold and harsh place and only the toughest of people can survive here. As a Southern man, Jacob needed to survive here for the sake of his life and the lives of the soldiers fighting for him and his father's Northern War. He did not like waiting for a battle to come, but he knew his father will need him to lead on the front lines. 
Jacob only tolerated some of the northerners for the sake of the war and for the sake of having the honor of slaying Roose Bolton himself. The Mormonts, the Umbers, the Serwins, the Hornwoods, and the Foresters were all stark loyalists, whom Jacob could not give less of about. But he needed their soldiers to fight for the freedom of Winterfell and the rest of the north from the stranglehold of the Boltons and Freys. As a man grown, prioritizing was a lot easier at manhood than it was at boyhood, to think of the more important things rather than the minor things, which didn't matter to him in the long term. The man saw someone coming towards him from the distance, and he could barely see them. The harsh blows of the snowflakes falling got in his way he pulled out his sword as it could have been some renegade Karstark ready to finish him off. It was a reaction expected of someone, who was attacked and did not trust his surroundings. The war camp was filled of soldiers, warriors, and cavalry ready to fight the men behind the walls of Winterfell, but only so few commanders and leaders to lead the rabble into victory. He wanted to work with the Northmen in liberating Winterfell, but not become too friendly with them, as they were the same people, who rebuffed his father's fealty like a bad jape. The prince saw the person coming towards him more clearly, a woman to be exact. He thought it was the she-bear, as she and her soldiers were some of the only women in the war camp, but there was another woman around, whom he did not want to see. The iron-born scum herself, and the queen of nothing, Asha Greyjoy. She was the queen of hardly anything, since her father fell from a bridge. The only metalwork she has worn were iron chains through the first few miles from Deepwood Mott. As terrible as she was, Asha was not the worst person there was, since Roose Bolton and Lud Whitehill were the ones, he wanted to eliminate, and Asha was the lesser of three evils in his mind. The iron-born woman was alone, which was strange, considering she always had an escort with her, whether it was Sir Justin or Lady Alysane. Someone must have lost sight of her, but having her in his grasp was better than allowing the king's prize to wander around the camp on her own, looking for a way to escape. The prince had a grim look on his face, as he always had when meeting with one of his enemies, it did not matter, if she saved his life. She was still the enemy and he was the righteous man, who won Deepwood Mott back for House Glover and won High Point and all its riches to give to the foresters, for their loyal support towards his father in the war. Prince Jacob grumbled to himself, thanking the Greyjoy will not hurt him too much, just an easy gesture to get out of the way. He didn't like seeing her face, as the rumors of iron-born women being ugly was untrue, as Asha Greyjoy and other women of her kind were more attractive than the women of the Stormlands. Especially when the iron-born have been stealing salt wives from the Westerlands and the Reach for centuries, as those two places were where the more commonly beautiful women of the South came from. He once fancied himself a Westerlands woman, only to spit in the face of the uncle, who punished him for the crime of being young and in love with a girl at the time, even though Uncle Robert was dead, he still had not forgiven him for the things he did to him long ago. The man looked like a brazen Northman, to the Greyjoy's point of view. He liked the look, as it made him as unrecognizable as possible to those, who knew him before. Only his father, Sorel and Luther knew what he looked like underneath the growth of beard and long, shaggy hair. Jacob did not want to be too close to Asha, or else he would have found a way to eliminate her, but as much as he wants to eliminate her, he could not, as his father wanted her alive for the northern lords to do away with. Better to see the Greyjoy rot away in prison for the rest of her life, rather than her having an easy death, as a way to escape the consequences of her crimes in the north. I'm glad to see you up and walking, Green Prince. Asha said, in a cold tone. Better to shove you under the burrows of snow. Jacob replied. Are you not going to thank me for saving your life? You may have done a great deed, but it still doesn't change you for the criminal you are. How harsh of you. What do you want from me? A little gratitude. Do you truly believe saving my life, separates you from your crimes, Lady Greyjoy? The same pirate, who took a mother and her small children hostage from Deepwood Mott to stuff in your mother's castle. The prince gritted between his teeth. The two had their arms folded, and it made Prince Jacob think about what he said. He wanted to be just as uncompromising as his father and model himself after him, but was it what he wanted or was it expected of him, as his father's son and heir? Pride is another fatal flaw of a man, especially a Baratheon, he was just as prideful as his uncles and never lied about it. It made Jacob feel great to have the upper hand in a situation that called for it. Asha saved his life, 
but it did not excuse her for the crimes she committed, and she needed to answer for her wrongdoings, as well as her brothers and the Ironborn as well. No one was coming to save Asha Greyjoy and that was what she knew, no one was coming to free her, as a woman, she was nothing to her meddlesome uncles, who commanded the Iron Fleet and the rest of the scum of the islands. A stiff, just like your father. Are going to be at his beck and call. Asha said, in a mocking tone. Almost eager to antagonize Jacob, and it was not going to work this time. I can change my name, if it pleases you. Jacob replied. A man cannot do that. He keeps his name and passes it on to the next generation, unlike a woman, who must give up her name and take her lord husband's name. A pity for you. My husband will have your eyes out, Greenlander. What husband? The reaver two years close to death, lucky he did not bed you or otherwise would have died of exhaustion. Asha did something Jacob did not expect, a laugh left her lips and his eyes widened at the thought, he thought Ironborn only laughed at the misery and death of others. But this one seems to have a sense of humor, and it did not come from that corpse she called a father. The Ironmaker will not have enough time to lift his axe, before you open his throat clean. She said, calming down from the fit of laughter. You know what happened to the king? Poisoned at his own wedding feast. Jacob said, to continue the conversation between them. At this rate, only the two of us will live. Asha replied. Not concerned about your uncles? No. I expected them to abandon me, as I am a woman to them. Not a legitimate threat to the salt throne. My uncles are dead, if it makes you feel better. It does. What happened to my sworn shield? He was dismissed because you were almost eliminated, sweet green prince. Such a man, cannot protect you, your father said in bitter words. What happened to you after I was stabbed? Those followed knights took me from my bed to face your father. His grace hates me, but did not condemn me, unlike the queen's men. They are only small fry, since the rest of them are at the wall, with my mother and sister. Jacob didn't like the truth, lying to himself was a lot easier than facing it. He caught Asha Greyjoy smiling for the first time, since the two dueled each other in the wolfswood. The prince thought her smile reminded him of Desmer Redwine and the happier times in his life, where he had no immediate responsibilities and could be a knave boy. He never thought of Desmer once, and it was for the best. She was caught in the middle of a heated dispute between three powerful houses and did not know what to do. Desmera only did what she did to survive and to preserve her honor and take Dick and Tarly as her lord husband. Strangely, Jacob had no resentment for either Desmera nor Dickon, as it was not their faults, but the faults of their fathers and packs to Redwine. Lords and ladies should stay out of the business of their children, especially when they are young and ignorant to the world. Asha was stuffed in big furs, as it kept her warm, but she must have thought of her brother, who was the prisoner of King Stannis. Two Greyjoys for the price of waiting was good for his father, and it gave him more leverage, as Theon was a man the last son of his house, no matter how broken he was. He knew he was going to face Theon sooner rather than later, Jacob needed to see his father and tell him how he was still a capable warrior and was ready to fight the war for Winterfell. You are lucky, Greenlander. To still have your siblings safe and no harm come to her, while my brother is the shadow of the man, he used to be. Asha said, with her voice trembling with fear and wiping a tear from her eye. She still loved Theon, even though all his crimes and flaws, she was his big sister and his protector. As far as I am concerned, Theon deserved what he got, invading Winterfell and allowing the Boltons to take over. Jacob said, in a biting tone. He meant it, as the Boltons and Freys may have committed crime of the Red Wedding, but Theon was the one, who gave Roos Bolton and his idiot a foothold in the Winterfell and gave the castle to them on a silver platter. You will never forgive anything, just like your father. This place is not your home and why make it so? It's because a crime is still a crime, my lady. You and your brother are criminals in the eyes of the law. The prince was more lenient towards Asha, but was harsher than he was. He needed to be cruel because there was a war going on. There was no time to slip up, even for a moment because every mistake could mean the end of his life. Jacob could never make Asha a willing ally, knowing he will be the son of the man, who will eliminate her brother for his crimes. Things will be a lot harder, 
as he liked talking to her, even though she was still the enemy. He needed to do what had to be done, to secure the greatest victory in his life and to finally settle down with a wife. It has been too long, too long to remain unmarried, during a war. He blamed his father and his mother for not settling him down sooner, since both could be the worst good parents there will be to his future bride. Jacob looked at Asha once more. She was a woman alone, no allies or family around to help her, she seemed to cope with loneliness better than the prince could. She was a rare breed of woman, the kind the lords of Westeros like to snuff out or oppress until their rebellious ways are corrected. He turned his away to now show the vulnerability on his face, his lips trembled, due to the cold weather being in full force. Jacob never thought of the possibility of liking her, but his feelings were always in conflict with his morals and principles as a man. It was something Jacob had to figure out, before he walks his chosen bride down the aisle, to the sept of the seven or the weirwood tree of the old gods to be with someone for the rest of his life. The man made his long, but cold journey towards the watchtower, where he, his father and cousin slept in for the duration of their stay. He was wrapped warm in his furs, even though the stench of blood was still there, reminding him of the stabbing. It was as it was when Jacob last saw it, tall and foreboding. He was sure he was fully recovered, even though he wanted to hide the scars of what happened to him. His father King Stannis needed him, even though the man never visited his son when he was injured. A boil of anger went over Jacob, as it was a foreign feeling to him, he was never the man to be expressive of his anger, like Uncle Robert, but was more towards keeping his emotions inwards, as most of the time, they were of inconvenience to him. He glimpsed the follard knight standing guard around the tower, these knights were a regular sighting for him, as they did a lot for him. They protected him from the burning man, who tried to attack him and kept guard in his tent, whilst he rested and recovered from the stabbing. He wanted to thank the men of House Follard for all they have done for him, but not yet. Jacob had unfinished business to deal with and a war to prepare for, but he would be facing his father for the first time, since he last saw him when his father was hosting the envoy of the Iron Bank. The prince did not trust the banker one bit, but the man had offered a great deal with equal payments on both sides. The support of the Iron Bank could change the motions of the war and could bring Jacob and his father closer to the Iron Throne, which meant less battles and more focus on gaining political support in the Seven Kingdoms. The watchtower was old, and Jacob knew it had been built, since the times of the Kings of Winter. He knew moons could change everything, and his appearance was a testament of it. It was forever changing, and he kept the growth of beard on his face and the long hair he allowed to grow for moons. The scars on his face were less noticeable with the growth of hair on his face, but the one on both sides of his left eye can be seen and know the story of how that scar was begotten. The warmth of the watchtower will be most welcome to Jacob, as he spent moons in a cold, but unelevated tent and was happy to be somewhere warm and back to the duties he was doing before he got stabbed. Jacob climbed the steps of the tower, and the guarded knights took one look at him and allowed him to pass. They knew who he was, even though his hair growth made him look like the average Northman. He took a deep breath in and out, as a smart man he had no idea how the reactions of his loved ones will be when they see him again and no idea how Jacob himself will react to seeing Theon Greyjoy again. It will be hard to contain the rage in killing him with his bare hands it was the perfect punishment for a turncloak and child killer. The Greyjoy man was punished enough, to know his masters eliminated Rob Stark and the men at the wedding and the northern lords and ladies were forced to pay fealty to a cutthroat to save the lives of their families and their holdings. It was survival that kept the Northmen going, it was survival that made the northerners patient for the chance of revenge on the architects of the Red Wedding and it was survival, which made some betray their oaths to the Starks and took sides with the Boltons. Jacob knew what survival was, as a boy of six and ten drifted out into the uplands and had to crawl his way out of reached territory, unless he wanted his head to ornate the Red Keep, alongside Ned Stark and others. He was still standing, as a testament of what a soldier, a man and a prince should be, fighting against the enemy on the battlefield, but the war was not over and he needed to fight even harder, now he is back in the fold. What if I get pushed out of the fold? What if father thinks I am not ready to be at his side again? It will mean, all the hard work Maester William did helping me recover was all for nothing. Better if Luther had a bigger role, since he must have been sleeping in my bed, in my absence. I will have to speak to him about Sorel sooner rather than later, 
because it's important to get it out of the way. I know Sorel failed as my sworn shield, but it was my decision to put him in that position, which means it was my responsibility in dismissing him. The prince entered the watchtower, and for the doors to close behind him. The northern storm had not defeated Jacob, but the snowflakes coated on his furs proved otherwise. He caught his eye on Sir Justin and Sir Richard, his father's most loyal knight standing to one side, with the two knights eager to see him and breathing a sigh of relief to not bury him or to be ruled by a little girl when the war ended. The men were Queen's men, but Jacob was told by Asha, Sir Justin was having conflict in whether believing in the Red God was right. It was the same battle Prince Jacob went through when he came back to Dragonstone and questioned everything he believed in when it came to the faith and whether belief altogether was one big lie to him. Jacob cited the Bravosi, Tycho Nestoris and his father sitting with each other on the table, reading through letters and parchments. He cleared his throat, as his eye caught on an old and haggard person standing close to his father. The haggard old man was familiar to the prince, even though he did not know many old men, apart from Uncle Alistair or great-grandfather Gerald. He never figured it out, but he must have been of value, if the umber men brought him here under great secrecy. He examined the man standing behind his father, noticing his whitened hair and frail appearance. It was not the common look of a starved man, but of someone, who has endured days upon days of torture in the hands on the Boltons and he knew exactly who he was. The prince could not believe it, seeing someone he knew look youthful years ago to end up looking older than his dead father. It was astounding how things would end this way, but this haggard look was Theon's punishment for his crimes, and he paid for the consequences of his actions, as it was right in front of him. It was all too tempting to Jacob to send the grey joy to his grave early, but his father needed him, even though it was hard to swallow in his mind. He knew small details of how Theon and a frozen girl he was with escaped from Winterfell from jumping from a window, and how Moore's Umber and his men saved their skins from being taken back to the Boltons or freezing to death in the cold. He glared at Theon, as if the two were the only ones in the room. Jacob would be glad to hear of the Ironborn's death at the hands of the Boltons, it would be justice as far as the prince was concerned. Did he feel any sort of remorse when he allowed Rickon and Bran to die on his watch or rob the Stark girls of their home? Anger was almost a shadow to Jacob, as fighting was the only way he could express it, but he was stuck between his own desire for revenge or doing what was best for the war campaign. The prince steeled himself, when he was caught out by his father Stannis, knowing he would not recognize his own son from the growth of hair on his face and the length of his hair grown from the short cut from moons ago. It was not the return Jacob wanted. He thought he would be welcomed by his father with open arms, but that was just the thought of a knave boy. All he had was his mother's unconditional love and she loved him no matter what, but his father was a different beast altogether. All he had to do to earn his father's love was to prove something to him, whether it was of scholarly talents or talent in the training yard. He did not waste all those years in Hornhill training to be a great warrior, just for his father to ignore him like an unwanted street dog at the edge of Flea Bottom. The Baratheon man was empty inside, and there was nothing anyone could do to make him feel any less unwanted by the world. I see your son has returned, your grace. The Bravosi was the first to speak out, nevertheless the man was not his friend, but he said something, which did matter to Jacob. I'm glad you are on your feet and ready to fight the war. My son living matters to me more than the war, unless you and the Iron Bank can buy me a highborn bride. King Stannis said, in an iron tone. We cannot, your grace. It is a shame, another bride lost to you. You will watch your tongue with that, foreigner. You should leave this place, you will not want to be caught in the fighting. Jacob said, in a similar tone like his father. His eyebrow was raised, and a snarl curled up his lips and folded his arms. I should be on my way, and I will call upon you and your father again, when he is seated on the iron throne. You hope to have a return on your gold. Save your pleasantries. It is coin I need from bravos, not empty courtesies. It would be my pleasure. The iron bank is always glad to be of service to you. The bank bowed, as he should. The sooner he left the better for Jacob, as his body will be the next after he eliminated Theon, if he was not more careful with his words. 
The Bravosi envoy left the watchtower, escorted by one of the king's knights, and then Sir Richard the Stout came forward towards the king. Prince Jacob was only too happy to sit on the seat to his father's side, as the banker made the seat warmer, even though the man was thin without any meat on his bones. There was a sense of comfort and amazement within the prince, it was as if he never left his father's side and was always there, even in his own absence from the king and his cousin. The prince removed the fur hood from his head and exposed himself to his father and two knights in the watchtower Jacob and knew what he looked like after moons away long shaggy hair tied up and a beard on his face. Which resembled Uncle Robert in his prime when fighting off the loyalists of the Mad King. His father Stannis was a strange beast. Jacob was only a spring child and did not know things when he was young. As Jacob got older, he began to understand his father a lot more than he did. It gladdened his heart to know his father cared about him in some way, with the arrest of all the Karstarks and the dismissal of Sorel Grimm. He may not agree with his father's choices but understood why he did what he did. It was the difference between his father and Ser Davos when it came to fathering sons Davos would give affection and love to his sons in a way, Jacob envied. The Seawith boys were well adjusted, knowing both their parents loved them equally, but Jacob would look on with envy and sadness, wishing his own stern mind father could give him a share of that love. Jacob's stomach turned at the sight of Theon Greyjoy in his broken state it was expected, not because he had any pity for the idiot. The true reason was he hardly had anything good to eat, since he woke up. He hoped his father or Sir Richard knew where the food stores were he could eat or maybe Luther ate everything like the pig he was. The only food stores available in the entire camp was brought by Arnulf Karstark, but Jacob Baratheon would rather starve than ate anything from the man, whose son tried to eliminate him. The king turned to Sir Richard, his third in command as the second belonged to Jacob. Send in Justin Massey, I have a need for him. Of course, your grace. Sir Richard replied. The prince winced at the thought of Sir Justin. The smiler was not his favorite of his father's knights, but Jacob appreciated Sir Justin and Sir Richard coming to visit, unlike his father who would leave him to rot in a tent, if it pleased him. If Jacob's father Stannis could command the winds of the storm, then the storm would have bent before Stannis Baratheon, and not a single snowflake would appear in the sky. The man was bitter, bitter at the thought his own father not welcoming him back after almost dying, maybe he should have died and then his father would have expressed a small amount of emotion, out of grief for his only male heir being dead. He was fortunate Luther was around, being the new mediator between the two stubborn men in front of him and not wanting to pick a side between the cousins he came to support in the war. The smiler entered the tower with haste, as a true loyalist of his father. Sir Justin was a man, who conflicted with his belief in the Red God, but he was a queen's man and should not be trusted. His jovial look was only to cover up the fact he was unpopular, amongst his fellow knights and whispers of traitor between his own fellow queen's men. The knight stuck to Asha Greyjoy like a sad dog, begging for her throw him a bone, but the woman was married and ironborn. Jacob would have a better chance with Asha than the lowly knight, because of status and looks. He had some pity towards Sir Justin, maybe a fry wife would do him well and make him forget of his ambitions towards Asha and the Iron Islands. I was told, your grace needed my service. Sir Justin said, kneeling in front of the king and the prince. You will escort the Bravosi banker to the wall. Choose six good soldiers and take twelve horses. To ride or to eat. I want you gone before midday, sir. Lord Bolton will be on us any moment and it's vital the banker returns to Bravos before the battle. You shall accompany him across the narrow sea. If a battle is to come, my place is with you and the prince, your grace. Your place is where I say it is. I have five hundred swords as good as you, or better. You have a more pleasing manner and a glib tongue, and those will be of more use to me in bravos than you are of use here on the field. The Iron Bank has opened its coffers to me. You will collect their coin, hire ships and sells words. A company of good repute, if you can find one. The Golden Company would be my first choice, if they are free of contract. Seek them out in the disputed lands, if need be. But first hire as many swords as you can find in Bravos and send them to by way of East Watch. Archers as well, we need more bows. The captains of the free companies will join a lord more than a mere knight, your grace. 
I hold neither lands or titles, why should they sell their swords to me? Go to them with both fists full of golden dragons, the king said, in a biting tone. That should prove persuasive. Twenty thousand men should be enough. Do not return with fewer. Sire, might I speak freely? As long as you speak quickly. Your grace should go to Bravos instead with the banker. Is that your counsel? That I should flee? The king's face turned with brittle anger. That was your counsel on the Blackwater as well, as I recall. When the battle turned against us, I let you and Horp chivy me back to Dragonstone, whilst my son went missing and the battle was over. The day was lost, your grace. I that was what you said. The day is lost sire. Fall back now, that you fight again. And not you have me scamper off across the narrow sea. To raise an army, sire. As bitter steel did after the battle of the redgrass field, where demon blackfire fell. Do not prate history at me, sir. Demon Blackfire was a rebel and a usurper, and Bitter Steel a idiot. When he fled, he swore he would return to place a son of demons on the Iron Throne. He never did. Words are wind, and the wind that blows exiles across the narrow seat seldom blows them back. That boy Viserys Targaryen spoke of return as well. He slipped through my fingers at Dragonstone, only to spend his life wheedling after Sel's words. The Beggar King, they called him in the free cities. Well, I do not beg, nor will I flee again. I am Robert's heir, the rightful king of Westeros. My place is with my men. Yours is in Bravos. Go with the banker and do as I have bid. As you command. Sir Justin said. We might lose this battle, the prince's father said harshly, knowing it could be the reality for Jacob and his father. In Bravos, you may hear that I am dead. It may even be true. You shall find my cell's words and archers nonetheless. Your grace, if you are dead. You will avenge my death and seat my son on the iron throne. If Jacob and I perish on the field, seat my daughter on the throne, or die in attempt. On my honor as a knight, you have my word. Sir Justin declared, with his hand on the hilt of his sword. Take the Stark girl with you. Deliver her to the Lord Commander on your way to East Watch. King Stannis tapped on the parchment before him. A true king pays his debts. The prince's eyes were looking down and was biting his lip the reality was real, and the possibility of death was a reality and not some fantasy he had in his head, as a boy. Jacob didn't want to be eliminated, as it would be selfish to leave his little sister to hold the burden of being a future queen. He only stuck this far in the war because of Shireen and his mother Celis he knew how much his mother wanted grandchildren and how happy she would be with an abundance of grandsons. To replace the knowering sadness of not being able to have any more sons, since his father stopped visiting his marital chambers years ago. It was not the example Jacob wanted to follow at all he will be the husband, who visited his wife's bed regularly and be a better father than his own. He wanted to be the father Ser Davos was to his sons and to give his own children the love he never received at all. Ser Justin was loyal to his father, without a question, but sending him to Bravos would be better for everyone. He was a man in deep conflict of his faith and needed to have his ambitions towards Asha Greyjoy to be stopped, even though the woman was married. Asha's old reaver husband could be dead for all Jacob knows, but the ironborn woman found the idea of being a southern queen to be more attractive. He thought more of Asha lately, since her haggard brother was staring at him, with a piercing look his eyes, which made Jacob turn away from him. He did not like how his father was unfazed by the possibility of dying, but he knew he would carry on the Baratheon cause of the throne and revenge if his father died. The brothers of the Watch will accompany you as far as Castle Black. The king continued. The Iron Men will remain here to fight for us. Another gift from Tycho Nestoris, even though my son is against it. Better to take our men instead of those will slow you down. The ironborn were made for ship, not horses. The Lady Arya should have a female companion as well. Take Ali St. Mormont with you. And Lady Asha too? Sir Justin asked. No. Prince Jacob said, in an acid tone. He never liked the idea since he would lose someone to antagonize and the thought of the smiler betting Asha sickened him within. 
better the night-faced Asha's old husband than for him to take her away. One day, your grace will need to take the Iron Islands. It will be easier with Balon Greyjoy's daughter as a catspaw, with one of your own men as her lord husband. You forget yourself, Sare. The Iron Fleet and majority of the Ironborn strength is commanded by a madman with an eye patch. The woman is wed, Justin. A proxy marriage, never consummated. Easily set aside. The groom is old and likely to die soon. She would be a good bride for the prince, if the northerners turn on us. Facing death is simpler than to imagine, the idea of an ironborn queen. King Stannis said, with disgust in his tone. All eligible highborn girls are either dead or already married. The prince is not getting any younger, sire. The king was unamused by Sir Justin's sentiments, it wasn't like Jacob was older than he was. Serve me well and bring me the cell's words, and you may have what you desire. Until such time, the woman remains as my captive. I understand. Your understanding is not required. Only your obedience. Be on your way, Sir. It was quiet when Sir Justin took his leave, it was better with an extra person, to hold over the tension and to prevent Jacob from killing Theon Greyjoy where he stood. Why was he here being the question? Better he saved his anger and fury for Roose Bolton on the battlefield than killing this lowly being. The sword was one of the only battles Jacob understood he was good at killing, and it was why Theon was less fearful of the thought of Bolton's idiot coming back to get him. From what he heard from Arnolf Karstark's grandsons, being tortured was depravity and he saw the results of it. The turncloak was fearful of the prince's father and he should be, but he saw men worthy of fear in his eyes. Jacob was afraid of Randall Tarley's bullish septon, when he was young, but he had grown up to be braver and stronger throughout this war. The only reason why the turncloak was still alive was his information he saw everything in Winterfell and knew a lot. How many men does Bolton have at Winterfell? The king said, pacing the floor and directing his stern look towards the grey joy in his sight. Five thousand. Six. Or more. The turncloak said, giving the king and prince a ghastly grin, all shattered teeth and splinters on show. More than you. How many of those men is he likely to send to attack us? Prince Jacob said, in a stern tone. No more than half. The castle was too crowded. Men were at each other's throats, the Mandalies and Freys especially. It is them his lordship has sent after you, the ones he is well rid of. Wyman Manderley. The prince's father said, with his mouth twisted in contempt. Lord too fat to sit a horse. Too fat to come to me, yet he goes to Winterfell. Too fat to bend the knee, swear me his sword and marry one of his granddaughters to my son, and yet he wields that sword for Bolton. I sent my onion lord to treat with him, and Lord Too Fat butchered him and mounted his head and hands on the walls of White Harbor for the phrase to gloat over. And the phrase. Has the Red Wedding been forgotten? The North remembers. The Red Wedding, Lady Hornwood's fingers, the sack of Winterfell, Deepwood Mott and Torrens Square, they remember it all. Theon said, with certainty, the phrase and Mandalies will never combine their strengths. They will come for you both but separately. Lord Ramsay will not be far behind them. He wants his bride back. He wants his reek. His laugh was a cross between a whimper and a titter, which Jacob raised his eyebrow at. Let him come anyways. Is he afraid to face a real man, rather than beat broken things and girls? The prince said, pulling out a dagger from his furs, as it was the ruby and gold jeweled one Uncle Alistair bought for him for his fourteenth name day and it would look nice between Theon's eyes. It didn't matter because the blade will look good between the eyes of Lord Bolton, his idiot and murdering Wyman Manderley. Lord Ramsay is the one, your grace and his son should fear. King Stannis bristled at that comment, and Jacob himself put his hand over his mouth to keep the laughter from coming out of his mouth. I defeated your uncle Victorian and his iron fleet off Fair Isle, the first time your father crowned himself. I held Storm's End against the power of the Reach for a year and took Dragonstone from the Targaryens. I smashed Mance Raider at the wall, though he had twenty times my numbers and my son defeated your sister in the Wolfswood. Tell me Turncloak, what battles has the idiot of Bolton ever won that I should fear him? 
you must not call him that. Theon said, sounding like a crying scream, you do not know him. No more than he knows me. I should face idiot on the field, save you the trouble of dealing with him. Go ahead, do it if it brings you glory. Jacob sensed a shiver down his spine, not at the thought of battle, but his father's comment instead. The thought of killing Bolton's idiot was for reasons for himself, to establish himself as a dangerous warrior not to be tangled with, since the Kingslayer is pottering around the Seven Kingdoms a dead man. Theon was terrified of Ramsay Snow and it showed in the way he defended him, every time Jacob or his father named him Idiot or Lord Snow. He was only afraid because the other man had been his captor and master torturer in the Dreadfort, but Theon got himself in that situation, when he decided to sack Winterfell and thought no consequences would come from it. His betrayal of the Starks paid a price and he paid for it. The only pity Jacob had was towards the innocent household servants and guards, who were murdered by the Boltons and Freys. When they intruded into Winterfell, not a man who eliminated two highborn boys and the reason why this war continued, until Winterfell and the North was free. Chapter 49 Prince Jacob sees the blood stains on his hands. He washed most of it off, but he could not ignore it. He winced at what he did, the idea of removing some green boy's hand changed him. The man was not the same, as he was before he was stabbed, wanting revenge for what that boy's uncle Harold did to him. He could see the shriek coming out of that Karstark grandson of Arnulf when Jacob removed his hand swiftly with his sword, with no tolerance for the guilt and sorrow that came afterwards. Seeing the relatives of his attacker face to face made Jacob more ruthless, as the men and boys failed to answer his father's questions of what they knew of Harold's attempted murder and Lord Arnulf's treasonous plot with Roose Bolton and Lud Whitehill. The man spent the last three days assisting Moore's crow food in training the green boys in his pitiful army, but the Northman was happy to get help from a seasoned warrior like Jacob, even though he was too young to be seasoned at war. He liked the thought of sharing his skills with unfortunate souls, who needed it, as he had nothing to do, since his father dismissed him from his side. Something changed with his father, since he came back to the fold. Jacob realized his father Stannis was glad to have him back, but never showed it in a way that was expressive with his emotions. His father dismissed him because he wanted to speak to both Asha and Theon Greyjoy alone and wanted him gone, as Jacob's job was to motivate the troops into the upcoming battle for Winterfell's liberation. Jacob had a great time with the one-eyed Northman, as Moors was a veteran of war and had fought in the days of the Mad King, which meant he heard some of the elder Northmen's stories about the battlefield and how this battle was going to be won for the history books. He didn't share the older man's enthusiasm, knowing the things Theon was prattling about when it came to the Bolton idiot, a sick-minded manic, who needed to die by his hand. Jacob was not afraid, because he tasted death and knew what it was like, one stabbing changed his whole outlook on everything. But as the heir to House Baratheon, he should be more considerate when it came to potential death on the field, leaving his loved ones in sorrow. The boys in Crowfood's forces were less green by the days, thanks to Jacob's stern training. He was a man of eight and ten, but he was teaching boys the same age as he and Rob Stark, when they first went to war on the Lannisters for different reasons. Jacob didn't look at his red-stained hands, but he did to see the kind of man he was transforming into. He had a strange liking to it, never felt any shame towards cutting a man's hand off clean and his mind turned off those feelings of guilt. The prince was sharpening his sword with a whetstone, he borrowed from Luther, knowing it was the same sword that cut off the hand of a small-minded Karstark, who dared to draw steel against his father in his presence. He was not shamed for what he did, even Sir Clayton gave him praise of what he did, calling it the action of a ruthless man who wanted a spill revenge on a Karstark, who was the nephew of the man, who tried to eliminate him. Marching men on foot was familiar to Jacob. He could not wait to break through the lines of the Bolton and Fry Mix army and crash through the walls of Winterfell himself. The trumpeting of northern warhorns were faint and he could hear it from where he was. He had no mercy for the all, Roos Bolton and his idiot will die first, and he might want to have a cloak made soaked in their blood to wear at this northern wedding, as a symbol of victory over them. Hearing what happened to Ser Davos shut Jacob off, as the man was a second father to him. Wyman Mandalay murdered Davos and he must keep his hunger for revenge at bay, when facing the Mandalay infantry Lord Bolton got rid of and his good brothers as well. Prince Jacob despised the thoughts he had of marrying into House Mandalay for duty, 
but he would rather marry into House Riswell for the horses, even though he loved horses as a man and as an exceptional rider. The man turned to see Cousin Luther coming, with the horse he brought with him from Greenstone. It was a brown stallion in the shade of wood, but it was a hard horse to tame by normal men. Jacob was glad to see Sir Luther, since Sorel must be preparing for battle with the king's men and he was alone in the ditches. He did enough, in terms of training Moore's Umber's green boys, but the boys began to learn to fight like proper warriors and not as green boys at all. A gust of black wind blew over him, but Jacob never felt its chill at all, as if he was born in snow and cold for most of his life. He shivered within his furs the first time the storm came for the north, but he was adapting to the conditions better than the southerns in his father's army of leftovers from Dragonstone and the Stormlands. I see you look miserable as always, cousin. Sir Luther declared, sitting on the snows opposite his cousin. Am I or am I just seeing things differently? Cutting off that boy's hand was great, even your father was unaffected by it. I'm sure Lord Arnulf will want you dead now. He was fortunate, it wasn't the grandson that stabbed me. It's not all bad, I have good news for you from the Umber camp. What is it? A shovel full of boys eliminated Ser Eni's fry, digging around in the snows. Most likely sent by Ser Hostine, the man in charge of the fry portion of Bolton's armies. Who cares? One dead fry makes no difference. Unless it was the man in command, who died. Look at it this way, half of Roose Bolton's forces tried to challenge us and lost. It's a shame you will have to marry into the traitor families, especially if Lord Manderley did eliminate your father's onion knight. I'll cut off my cock with my dagger, if I please. You better not, it's the most valuable part of you, apart from your sword hand. To replenish the Baratheon line, especially since Shireen is too young to be wed and mother hopes to settle me with a southern bride. Better than a northern one, who will marry you now, since Alice Karstark ran away and is wed to a wildling. The Lord Commander should not have done that I agreed to marry her for the sake of my mother and father agreeing as well. Being available means more interesting parties coming to the table. Why did Moore's Umber even ask you to help train his green boys? The man asked a seasoned warrior to help him out and I did. He did tell me things about his great nieces, the great Jin's daughters, whom are unmarried. He told me a lot about them. It's better than what the Karstarks would have offers, but an umber lady in a southern court. My mother will not allow it, a Mandalay wife would make her and the other Florence more comfortable, as the Mandalays worship the faith. Which would you choose, an umber wife a Mandalay wife or even a Riswell wife? Neither, if I had a choice. A poor selection to say the least. My father is eager to marry me off as soon as possible. He is worried Luther, with the Lannisters and Tyrells killing each other in court, the Northerners being sick of Bolton rule. My status being my father's only great advantage in the war is fading and the more people know I am alive. There are many fry girls still available. I'd rather die than think of that, maybe a fry wife will do you good cousin. A pretty one to solidify alliances further. How could you do that to me? You know after the Florence, the Freys are the second ugliest house in the Seven Kingdoms. That's my mother's house, you speak of. Say no more or else I can turn myself in for kinslaying. We are more distantly related. At least, the stain will not be too bad on my name. This could be the last time we see each other, before death and glory. I hope you are still alive, Luther. Who will be my bearer at my wedding day, since Davos is dead? and Lord Too Fat will answer for his crime soon enough. If I were Lord Manderley, I would be more afraid of you than Roose Bolton. Them all, Luther. Roose Bolton, Wyman Manderley, Lud Whitehill, the idiot Ramsay and Sir Stupid Fry, let them come. I'm bored sitting here. Jacob said, in a loud tone. Good for you, cousin. The man was sick of waiting, let his enemies come for him so he could eliminate them already. Jacob glared north, whilst sharpening his sword knowing Winterfell was a few miles away. He was turned his head away, as it was going to be a hard trek through the snows and passing the armies of Bolton, Fry and Whitehill and not getting eliminated on the battlefield. Jacob had a lot on his mind, but he did not want to say anything to anyone he did not know. He was thankful to have Cousin Luther's company, 
even though the orange-haired knight was not well versed in politics as well as he is. It was almost reliving a time, of what it's like to socialize with another young man around his age and to be comfortable with him. Jacob never thought to ask Luther about home, since he ran away without his family knowing where he was, House Estermont had plenty of sons so one going missing went over the head of Great Uncle Eldon, who was the head of the house now. He sensed his cousin was lonely, missing his brother and others of his family, but he wanted to fight in a war and not sit in a castle all day and do nothing. The prince had gotten back from seeing the Bravosi banker leave the camp, with Sir Justin and a few men riding towards the wall. The girl thought to be Arya Stark, wasn't the little wolf at all. He was good at remembering faces, and knew the girl Theon rescued was Jane, the steward's daughter disguised as a highborn girl to keep the Boltons hold on Winterfell, but with the infighting with the Mandalays and the Riswells happening. It was only a matter of time before the rest of the North revolted against House Bolton and their Fry Good family. I know the girl. I know she lived in Winterfell, when her father was Ned Stark's steward. There are a lot of faces I remember from Winterfell, like the master at arms, Sir Roderick, who is dead now and his small daughter Beth, who was one of Sansa's little friends. I dread to think what happened to the girls, who lived in Winterfell after the sack of the castle. The girl, Jane was no ordinary runaway, but one of Lady Sansa's friends in Winterfell. The poor girl must have relied on Theon Greyjoy to help escape from being the wife of that monster called Snow. Winterfell held a mix of different memories for Jacob, some were good, and some were terrible. It was not his place, as Stannis Baratheon's son to pity a girl, but Jane was nice to him in Winterfell, when Theon and Rob made fun of him for being brusque and what he did in the arbor. His father Stannis may be a seasoned commander, but Jacob was more focused on the glory at winning. He was young and wanted another battle to his name and reputation. Jacob was the knight, who never wanted to be called Sare. It was for men, who needed the title because he was the prince, the man to rule the seven kingdoms after his father and did not need to have the common title. How is your mother, Jake? Is it too late to write to her? Sare Luther said, in comical tone. There is not enough parchment and ink to go around. Letters are only written for vital reasons. I like your new appearance, reminds me of what my grandfather said how inspiring Robert Baratheon was when he began the war on the Mad King. You could do the same here, but to eliminate at least three houses from the north is an accomplishment not to be japed at. When we get to Winterfell, you will shave the beard off me. It must be hard to be you, Jake. To be unmarried for this long, not even the most handsome man can last if you did, isn't Willis Tyrell still unmarried as well? Only girls marry the pretty fools, but you are too brusque, and the Tyrell heir is crippled. How does that help my dilemma? Jacob said, as his voice was rising in irritation. At least, you can have somewhat of a choice for a wife. With the poor selection of brides on offer, you might as well like boys instead. The orange-haired knight said, with Jacob smacking him upside the head for that comment. Do not jape of that subject, knowing what Uncle Renly did in his free time. Cousin Alan and I were against moving the Estermont strength behind Renly in the first place, knowing your father would stop him in his tracks. Grandfather Gerald liked the idea of a grandson being king, but not the older one and the great-grandson who never visited him. It was for the better, being stuck in a Tyrell-controlled court would have been a nightmare and a lot of Stormland keeps would be given away to Renly's new reach friends. I'm glad you made the right choice, unlike the others. There are not a lot of men left over in the seven kingdoms of your status, the obvious ones are dead, and others are married. We will both be in a sept soon, with father looking for a wife for you as well. You and Sir Justin could marry fry wives and peace will be had that way. I would rather not be married at all I am not the heir as Cousin Alan is the heir of House Estermont. You could suggest that towards him if you like. Marriage is so tedious, no wonder why Uncle Robert had to choose for my father. I would have been married to Alice Karstark, had her relatives not been as treasonous as they were, but maybe the gods made it this way and the right woman might be behind Winterfell's walls or elsewhere. I would give up if I was you. Really? Mary Asha Greyjoy in a northern gods would better than to see you unhappy and without a wife. You must be japing Luther, my father will eliminate me if that happened. Better you than the smiler taking her to the wall. 
Shut up. You were jealous, aren't you? When Sir Justin wanted to take her with him, away from you. You do not know what you speak of, cousin. Prince Jacob was tired of Luther's non-science, but he could be right. He stirred when Sir Justin merely suggested to take Asha with him to the wall, with the she-bear and Jane. The man did not know why he felt that way, but he ignored his hardened heart. He could not believe his cousin would suggest him marrying the ironborn in a god's wood, a place where northerners worshipped their gods. An undull faith worshipper and a woman of the drowned god marrying in front of the heart tree is laughable at best. He never wanted her in that way, but since the Karstark alliance dissolved, he opened his mind to the possibility of who his future wife was and who she could be. Jacob turned his eyes north, which was the way towards Winterfell and the battle ahead of him. Soldiers were preparing for battle with what was left of the horses and the swords they brought. He was going to be leading a part of the royal host onto the field, as it was his duty and his mission to do as the king's heir. The prince shook his head at the thought of Asha penetrating his mind, he could not shut out his own thoughts of her anymore, especially now envious he got when Justin Massey wanted to take her away to the wall. Father might have allowed it, for me and not a knight as lowly as Sir Justin. I don't know why I think and feel this way, so close to the great battle ahead of me for Winterfell. The Smiler wanted her for himself so he could fancy himself Lord of the Iron Islands and as her husband, but I would have stabbed him between the eyes with the dagger, daring to take her away from her hostage situation, which is where she belongs in solitude Anne. With me. The prince's eyes widened, as he clenches his fists together. He could not hide behind his sternness anymore, but less people know, the better. Jacob could not compromise his future for someone, who will be a prisoner the rest of her life he could never marry Asha, even if the tides of the wind was at his command. He was enraged, due the fact of never been allowed to bed anyone, since the victory at Deepwood Mott and it was with one of Lady Sibel's serving girls. The vulgar persona and lack of tact from the female Greyjoy made it difficult for the prince to contain his primal urges, but no woman would refuse the son of the rightful king into her bed. He resisted Lady Asha's temptations for moons, but saving his life gave her an opportunity to woo the frigid son of Stannis Baratheon. Jacob smiled at the sentiment, but betting her would not be too bad, since the furs will keep both warm and he will not do it in the beds of the dead Starks. The man chuckled at the idea of the iron-born woman breaking down the walls, Jacob built around himself, since he was torn away from Desmer. He believed love to be for children and not for a man like him. His mother Celis was unloved by his father throughout their marriage that level of misery led his mother into taking up with a foreign religion and converting members of House Florent and others of the king's court into the worship of Rolaller. He refused all his mother's attempts to get him to abandon the seven, but he saw the happiness the presence of Melisandre brought his mother and did not want to be the one to cause his mother sorrow ever again. All because of his own concerns about relying on a foreign priestess as a member of a royal court. It has been a long time, since Jacob thought of the Red Woman. A bad omen, all in name only. He was a worshipper of the faith and did not approve of a foreign religion spreading through his father's camp, as it made men more fanatical than usual and lose common sense. The prince was beginning work on polishing and sharpening the war hammer in his possession he wanted to take good care of it, as Uncle Robert should have given it to him on the name day that just passed, but it was better than nothing. A warrior must have a great weapon to wield at war, but it will be bittersweet to see that war hammer used on Northmen, who fight for Roose Bolton and his other powerful allies. It was hard to take care of a weapon so well crated, but the Queen's men held the grunt work in cleaning it up and making use it was in good condition for him to wield. A cold chill passed through the prince's dark hair, and he ignored it. He held the handle of the hammer between his frozen bitten fingers, as it warmed them somehow. After his father sent him away, Jacob began training with it against the green knight Sir Richard gave him. He recalls the fear on the face of the moth knight, as he thought the hammer would end him, but it didn't. Training with Sir Richard was not too bad, since it gave the eager Baratheon something to distract himself with, until his father needed him again. To be alone with his father in the room, gave Jacob stomach nerves, but for the grey joys in his custody, it was a taste of what life and imprisonment was going to be like in Winterfell. The cold winds were a sign of what is to come. Jacob never believed in the northern stories about the long night, because he was a spring child and knew nothing of winter. Seeing the wildlings lotter in Castle Black, 
Melisandre prattling on about her prophecies of destiny in the snowstorm washing over the armies were signs. Those northern stories were coming to life and it scared Jacob to be wrong about something he dismissed in the past. He never believed in the prophecies of his father being the great hero, come again. His father was not made to be the special hero, the Lady Melisandre was waiting for, but he was just a man, a man fighting for his rights and for the future of his crumbling house. His father Stannis was a man alone, with only his son truly at his side in these dire circumstances, but he will never go. There are no friends in this world, Rob Stark learnt that the hard way, when the turncloak slaughtered his brothers and took his castle. I never liked him at first, especially when my father's army is plagued by his remaining loyalists. The young wolf was everything I wasn't. Likeable, honorable and first in line to inherit from his house. He rebuffed my father's fealty like a jape and thought he could defeat the Lannisters on his own. I hold no love for him at all, but in another lifetime, we would have been the best of friends because Uncle Robert and Ned Stark would have wanted it to be so to model their historic friendship made in wartime. Prince Jacob shook of that thought. Miles away from Winterfell and he was already thinking of the dead Stark boy with the look of a Tully lore. The Northerners did what they had to do, to prepare for battle, but he kept them at arm's length for a reason. He never forgot it was members of House Umber that gave Rob Stark his false crown in the first place, as it was spoken between the Northern soldiers in the camp. It wasn't good to dwell on the past, especially when a war is coming and Roose Bolton was going to send his good brother Sir Hosteen Fry to deal with him and his father on the field. And keep half his strength at Winterfell, as it was what a man of Lord Bolton's mind and experience in war would do to keep himself out of the field. The storm was getting worse by the days, as it was a storm that started from Deepwood Mott. Jacob didn't mind anyways, he was used to the cold, whilst the weakest of the Southerns died in the storm. He was used to death and seeing the bones of dead people by now. It was normal to him, and it was something he did not want his little sister to think was normal to her. His heart ached to see Shireen again, as it wasn't right for her to be left alone with the Queen's men to protect her and to only have Devon Seaworth as a companion. Prince Jacob was her brother and it was his duty to protect her, but how can be a good brother, from the depths of the northern plains and so close to the battlefield? He hoped to see her again, as a victorious warrior and a married man, to introduce his little sister to her good sister. It was clear to see his sister needed an older sister figure in the form of a noble woman as a companion she had been isolated from girls of her rank for too long. It was only fitting for Jacob to inherit the Warhammer, since his father was gaunt and unable to. He had a sense of guilt, only because Uncle Robert loved him at the expense of his own brothers. As a child, he was glad to be at least loved by someone of his family, since he was sent away from his own mother and father for political reasons. It was a responsibility and a duty to be the caretaker of Uncle Robert's legendary Warhammer, as it was almost as famous as the sword of Sir Arthur Dane and the man himself. Prince Jacob clutched his hands onto the handle of the weapon, with the thoughts of smashing it between Wyman Mandalay's teeth for murdering Davos and getting the man justice for what the fat lord did to him. There was someone coming this way, but Jacob did not mind it. He was lucky to have Cousin Luther by his side. It reminded Jacob of the times he heard his father muttering the name of the Onion Knight in his sleep, the day before Jacob got stabbed. It was when the prince realized loneliness was worse than the sword. He didn't care to see who was coming, at least he could talk to someone else about mortality and death. His fingers were shaking out of control, as he could not control what was ahead of him. He was lying, if he said he did not fear for his mortality, since the battle was going to be in the trenches of the snowstorm and the Northmen on the opposite side have the advantage over his father's southern forces in that regard. The movement of snow by feet was heard, with the prince turning around to see Lady Asha behind him. It must be expensive to have such a weapon, Greenlander. She said, in a haughty tone. Not noticing the men around, them preparing for the war to come for them. I thought you were with your brother. I enjoy your company more, my brother lies about the idiot. I am sorry for you. Is that what I think it is? It is, if you want to know the truth. The same weapon that eliminated the Targaryen dynasty and made your father bend the knee years later. I was in my bedchambers with my mother and Theon when the war started. My father defeated your uncle and will surely defeat Roose Bolton and chop his idiot into pieces. 
Don't let me stand in your way of Greenland glory. Is there something you want from me? There is talk amongst the knights, the ones the king likes to stick around him of your outburst in the tower. What is it about? You refused Sir Justin taking me away. The ironborn said, placing her hand on his shoulder. He flinched at her touch, as it was not warranted. He only wants you for your lands and that is all. And you do not. Do not think too highly of yourself, you are a pirate and raper in the eyes of every man and woman in the Seven Kingdoms. Do you think that? My opinion does not matter, since I defeated you in the wolfswood and lived to tell the tale. My leg was twisted, and you took advantage of that. Better safe than sorry. Spend your last days of freedom well before your sentence. You don't want me in a dungeon, don't you? It's payment for your crimes, my lady. Like you have not eliminated people and taken castles. Asha wondered. The difference was I gave the rightful lords of the house their castles back, after an enemy house took over. You should know the difference between restoration and pillaging, pirate. You resort to pirate now, what happened to your southern manners, Greenlander? Back to Greenlander again, we are. I can fight with you, in the battle against the Boltons. You will be kept under guard, since a prisoner going missing is the last thing my father needs. Can't I stick with you? The man did not know what Asha wanted, because that woman was complicated. She had no shame stealing castles from northern houses, but she claims to want to fight on his side. It was better to be stern towards her and not show any amount of weakness or vulnerability. Jacob was not going to throw her away, as a capable warrior herself. She wanted revenge for what Roos Bolton and his idiot did to her brother and allowing her to get revenge, may not be such a bad thing. It will mean he will be responsible for watching her and making sure she is still alive by the end. Prince Jacob turned away from her, not wanting to show it on his face and for her to figure it out. He wanted her and he was ashamed to admit it. Jacob did not understand, when other men would indulge in their lust for whores, but the stresses of war and fear made it the perfect excuse. He was no ordinary man, but the son of Stannis Baratheon, the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. Jacob did not have the luxury or the time to be lusting over the enemy, when in day's time he will be walking down to the Sept or the God's Wood with his northern bride at his side and become a lord husband. There was no way, he could afford to make a mistake, just so he could think with his cock for one moment, there was too much to lose and he did not want to lose everything he still had left in his life. Your uncle's warhammer, you gonna use it on Bolton and his fry armies. Asha said, leaning against the prince's shoulder with her head on it. The prince did not push her away, even though they were alone in a camp covered with snow and wind. It looks better smashed between the teeth of Wyman Manderley. Did your onion knight worship the Greenlander faith, like you? Jacob's eyes widened at what Asha said he did not have time to mourn for the death of Davos. He stood from the rocks he was sitting on, to get into the face of the woman, who dared to mention Davos. Do not speak of him as if you know him. The prince said, in a voice laced in a sneer and a deeper tone, you should be careful with your next words. Do you always speak to women this way? No, apart from my mother. I stay away from women. A man at war has not seen the warmth of a woman in years. It seems you have not seen a woman's bed, since your yoke of an uncle was still alive. You are a married woman, a shameless one at that. My lord husband will die of old age, by now. Which means I will be free to marry whomever I want. And it will not be me. You cannot blame me for trying. With Theon to be eliminated at your father's hands, I am the last of my father's line. I am very sorry for you, but the sooner your line dies out the better. Do have to be so unpleasant and lack tact. Asha said with her voice rising with anger. She could not believe the prince could be so cold and malicious about her misfortunate situation. It was for the best for him to be this way, as it was the only way this mangled relationship could end. The man looked to see Asha leave with her arms wrapped around herself, with the cold winds blowing past her way. It was better for Jacob to be malicious towards her than act like a wanting dog, desperate for sex, like any other man in this kingdom. He began to finish the polishing of the warhammer, even though it will be stained in the blood of his enemies and the white snow will be with the blood of Bolton soldiers soaking the snow-covered treks. 
the prince knew he should have written to his mother, Queen Celis before his father sent him out of the watchtower, but he knew what he wanted to say to her. If he had the chance to write to her in his most intimate way, in a way his father could never understand. Dear mother, I am fine as I know how much you worry about me. I hope you and Shireen are well taken care of by Lord Commander Snow. I know what happened with my former bride, Alice Karstark and I am glad it happened in a way. The Karstarks, who pledged themselves to father are traitors and one of them tried to eliminate me. I am still the same as I was, but I did something I should not have done. I cut of the sword hand of one of Arnolf Karstark's ignorant grandsons, who dared to draw steel in father's presence. I don't know what is happening to me and the kind of man I am becoming. You should thank Maester William, a maester who came with the foresters for saving my life, even though I was strong enough to survive. I miss you and I feel truly alone in the north, but the battle will start soon, and I will hope to secure a victory for you from afar, from your son Jacob. The prince was afraid, afraid to die when he didn't want to. It was going to be his reality and it scared him, to think of losing the war and his father's cause to be in tatters. He looks from afar to see his goal in the distance, even if the snow slows down the combined armies of his father and the northerners. It will not break their spirits and it will motivate the men and women to keep on going, until they see Bolton and Fry Blood or see the large castle from the distance. Jacob was not going to give up, even if he is feet ten deep in snow, but he will never bend or break until he is the one that wins the battle and liberates Winterfell. Chapter 50 The prince was making his way towards his father in the king's war tent. He needed to see him, to finalize details for the battle and was sure to see Richard Horp and Luther Estermont at his father's side, since Sir Justin left for the wall. The heavy storm slowed, as it was clearer to see the land than it was three days ago under the snowstorm. But the prince was glad because it would make fighting the battle easier and he will have the chance to secure victory, noting the death of the prominent lordlings, who will be on the field. Jacob was in black furs, underneath his gold antler engraved armor, as it was the same armor he wore when he took high point in Deepwood Mott in two battles. The stag helm was on his head, with the antlers made of metal sticking out and causing a lot of the army men to stop and stare at it, especially the northerners, who have not seen such armor before since his uncle Robert fought his last battle on the Iron Islands. I'm back, and in the thick of things. I wish my father didn't treat me like an invalid, as I am recovered, and I can fight this battle. I get he worries for me because I almost died from the stabbing, but the camp was straightened into order by me and Sir Richard, since Sir Justin went to the wall to deliver the impostor Arya Stark to John and then head to Bravos. I could have gone to Bravos to get father the coin and the cells words he needed for the war, but he needed me here to be on the front lines and to marry me off as soon as possible. Arranging a marriage or a betrothal seems like a chore to father, but I hope Shireen has an easier time and gets betrothed soon and not end up like me. The man brushed the snowflakes from his coat, but the thoughts of Asha plagued him, and he could not avoid it. The ironborn pirate was seeing her brother one last time, before King Stannis takes his head himself, to appease the northern lords and for him to pay for what he did to the Stark boys. Jacob could barely look at Theon, without wrenching at the sight of him, it was the price he paid for rebelling and allowing Roose Bolton and his idiot to take over the north. He was not a man for pity, but he learned not to be weak and to be more hardened than what his father expected him to be. It was in his blood as a Baratheon, and he was not going to allow anyone to stand in his way of reclaiming Winterfell. A flock of crows were scattering in the sky, ready to feed on the first of the dead. He was reminded the bodies need to be burned, because of the threat of the White Walkers. Jacob never believed it, until the Lord Commander told his father, it was vital for the bodies that perished in the Battle of Castle Black to be burned, before the dead returned with ice blue eyes. The prince was born in the middle of spring to the elation of both his parents, as they had been waiting a son for a long time and they got one. Jacob did not want to think about, how miserable the marriage between his parents would have been, if he had not been born and only Shireen lived. It reminded Jacob why his mother Queen Celis of House Florent treasured him so much, and how she wanted to keep him in her arms and not let him go to the war again. Deep inside, Jacob blamed his father for delaying the war effort, but it was the fault of the storm. He wanted to fight and was eager to be on the front lines, leading half of his father's host from the south and be with the Northmen and women, who fought wars longer than he had been living. One day, 
the prince will end up like the war veterans in his life, bitter and broken and will not have the capacity to be empathetic or feel anything at all. He didn't want to be like that. He wanted to be the best big brother he could be for Shireen and be the best son he can be for his mother and father. All he wanted was to be better than he was and elevate himself into becoming a legend at an early age. All he will feel is anger, pain and sorrow. The prince saw the war tent in front of him, as knights and lordlings were leaving, as they were preparing for war. He tied his hair back, even though it has grown a lot, since he left his mother and sister at Eastwatch and the wall it was a trait Asha Greyjoy liked and found attractive about him. That woman should have left him alone or made him her enemy, but she chose flirtation in hopes of a southern crown, since her own was stolen from her by her uncles. She was a fascinating creature to him, even though he named her scum and pirate publicly and to her face, but he could not stop himself from having these feelings and he could not hide them for long, even if he settled down with a wife of his own. He will still have feelings for that iron-born heretic. The banners of the red and yellow burning heart, of the Lord of Light were flapping in the cold winds. Jacob hated that banner and wished for it to be destroyed and replaced with the Baratheon banner of black and gold. He was embodied with the true symbol of his house from the armor he wore to his appearance being compared to Uncle Robert in his prime. As a man of eight and ten, he was still the insecure boy he was, when he tried to rebel against his father, but it almost cost Ser Davos his life. He loved Davos, like a friendly uncle and he was gone. His teeth seethed at the thought of tearing Wyman Mandoli apart with his bare hands for what he did and the citizens of White Harbor will beware of the Lord of Storm and Fury coming for their Lord and Defender of the White Knife. The banner of the Flaming Heart Stag is a curse, and Father doesn't know it yet. He is too stubborn to even turn his course, even if it's a mistake and will cost him in the future. I want Father to be here, to live to see the throne be taken back for our house again. Father's face and hands are getting skinner than when I last saw him closely, it was those shadow demons he created with the Red Woman, which is the cause of this, and he has aged ten years more than his actual age. I have to see him, in all his gaunt glory and I have to mind my words. There were men leaving the war tent, but Jacob entered through them, being the prince and the heir to his father's tattered house. He pulled the folds of the tent, to enter and see his father King Stannis, with a flamed crown on his head, even though it was the only thing that provided his sire any warmth, especially in these dire conditions. Jacob cleared his throat, as his eye catches Sir Richard leaving his father's side and exiting the war tent, after seeing the prince at first glance. He was warm enough in his furs, but he knew the coldness his father radiated, and it was the reason why they were in this situation and with no vital allies on their side. Scrapping the last of Rob Stark's loyalists was not good enough in the eyes of King Stannis, as he expected the North to accept him as their king, even though they declared to be independent from the Iron Throne with the young wolf as their king. He was finally going to get the war he wanted, in the form of the enemy behind Winterfell. It had been moons, since Jacob and his father arrived in the northern settlements and no sign of war, but letters and false alliances thrown at them. The Karstarks were dead men, and so was Theon Greyjoy and there was nothing that can be done. It didn't matter to Jacob, as his attention was on winning the battle that will be upon him and his father, and he hopes to survive long enough to make it to the Sept to marry someone. He fidgeted with the seven-pointed star pendant around his neck, even though he always clung on to it and blessed it with a kiss every time he went to bed at night. As a way of appreciating the gods, the same gods his mother Queen Celis abandoned in favor of the Red God. The prince stood by his father, as it has always been this way. He looked over the detailed map his father was staring at, as if he has been looking for hours, looking for an unchecked area, in which passage through the north will be made easier without losing men on the field. There was one thing Prince Jacob never wanted to be in life it was to be as bitter as his father. He was young and had time to get to the age, where bitterness set in and he would have lived his life, to be happy and stable in himself, before he gets to the age his father is. The prince vowed every day, since the war began to never be as bitter and as short-minded as his father, in his quest for the Iron Throne, which was failing until the Iron Bank's envoy came through for them. I know you want to prove yourself, only fools and glory hogs crave glory. King Stannis said, in his usual brittle voice, at least his teeth were safe for now. Why should I, I am a proven commander and leader of men. It was me that ended the Battle of Deepwood Mott, 
while you lingered with the northern host at the gates. Prince Jacob replied, bitterly with his arms folded. What is it you want from me? A little concern that is all. You never came to see me, when I got stabbed. Sir Justin and Lady Asha made better visitors than my own father. I had other matters to attend to. Jacob could sense the fury rising within him, not wanting to believe his own father left him for the crows. Better than acting like a father for once. Jacob never thought he would see his father angry with him again he knew his father's anger was slow cooked in comparison to Uncle Robert's explosive anger and Uncle Renly's quiet anger. The stone blue eyes of the king glaring at him made him pray for the crone to make him change his bull-headed words. He was prepared for punishment, as he had his entire life. Jacob was never punished by the Tyrells or Randall Tarley before, as he was always on his best behavior for them, being a ward for both houses. As the male heir, Jacob was never punished harshly by his father, until the incident with the Redwines and Tarley started and escalated to the point of Uncle Robert getting involved to make the Reach Lords heal as he should have done at Storm's End. It was as if he was reliving his uncle's punishment all over again and was back to the boy of five and ten and frightened of the cruel world. You are right, Jacob. As much as I hate to hear it, if any other man said that to me, they would have been executed. I should not have neglected my only heir. I understand, since you needed to punish the Dreadfort Maester and the Karstarks. Are you afraid of dying Jacob? The king asked. I am, a man who is not afraid of death is not human at all. I was lucky to survive the Blackwater and not be eliminated, but this battle is different. Everything we have worked for has to be proven here, and it will set our path for the throne again. You fear for your mortality, your mother fears for your life too. I would never put you in the front lines, unless I was certain you would fail me. I don't want to fail you again father. I had to take Edric Storm away, or otherwise you would be cursed a kinslayer by all gods and men. The prince declared. You have always opposed the Red Woman, whether it was for a genuine cause or was it because of your loyalty to the Seven. She is one of the reasons why you struggle to get allies, whom worship the faith and the old gods. I don't like them, these rebel Northmen and women, who came to our banners after Deepwood Mott. The leftovers of Rob Stark's decimated forces, but I have a use for them. We both do. The king whispered harshly, in quieter tone, so only the prince could hear him. Better to have them as allies than our enemies, since we have enough of those already. If Lord Mandalay truly did eliminate Davos, then I shall be looking into Mors Crowfood's offer for one of the great Jin's daughters for your bride. Time is running out and we need to solve this crisis. Jacob understood his father's urgency in marrying him off, as time was running out because more people will know he didn't die at the Blackwater years ago. If the Mandalays knew, then everyone else in the South will know because of their cowardice and the murder of Davos in front of those damned frays. He didn't mind the idea of marrying one of the Crowfood's great nieces, but his mother Queen Celis and the other Florence will not be happy about the thought of their future queen worshipping the old gods and not being the subservient southern lady in court. The prince could see it, with his new umber wife behaving in a way that would cause southerns to think northerners as savages with no courtesies. The woman lacking in any of the womanly manners taught in the south and the sour faces of Uncle Axel and his mother pleading to the red god to eliminate the umber woman before she becomes an uncontrollable queen of seven fractured kingdoms. The man knew his mother was better suited to handling a marriage negotiation than his bitter father, as it was more a woman's area of expertise than a king, who was better suited to commanding men on the battlefield than speaking to lords. Jacob was less excited of the idea, the older he got because he knew the missed opportunities as it chipped away his self-esteem. As the son and heir of the most hated man in the Seven Kingdoms, he knew being wed was going to be a struggle. He would have been married already, had his father not taken up with the Red Priestess or allowed half of the court to be converted into worshipping Lawler to the alienation of potential allies whom worshipped the old gods and the new gods. He stared at the northern map, as it showed more of Winterfell's details and how most of the corners and gates will be shut and manned by Bolton and Riswell men outside of the castle. The gates of Winterfell will be secured, but there are other ways to get into Winterfell without people knowing. There were secret tunnels built into the castle, raised by Bran the Builder, in case the Long Night returned, and the people could have ways to escape the dead things beyond the wall and to gain access to places, which were long abandoned. 
For a man like Roose Bolton, he would be a fool not to use the passages to his advantage, but then he sent his brother-in-law and a crop of Manderley and Whitehill soldiers to deal with me and my father, as if he was too craven to come face to face with his own doom. Prince Jacob was ready for battle, even though he was too young to be considered a seasoned warrior. He was there when the Storm Lords abandoned his father for Uncle Renly, he was there when his father lost the Blackwater and returned to him, and he was there to secure Deepwood Mott and depose the last of the Ironborn invaders from the north. Jacob will always be the main counselor to his father, and will never be replaced or deposed, unlike Uncle Alistair who paid for his crime and Ser Imri with death in the green smokes of wildfire burning on the Blackwater. He never forgot the rotting corpses around him, every time he fought a battle and even his first, as he was lucky not to have been sick on his first. His first war was going on for at least three years, and there was no getting out of it, until Winterfell was liberated, and the storm cleared course for the Riverlands, so he and his father could liberate the Riverlands as well as the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. I was blind, in wanting to appease the Karstarks and put you in danger. The Grey Shield Knight is not the only one to blame for what happened. The king spoke, in that same quieter tone, which scared Jacob more than his regular brittle tone. You should have allowed me to expel Sorel, you had no right to. The prince replied. The knight failed his duty, and I had to do what must be done, to stop dissent in my ranks. I would have banished him, if I had more men on my side and not have to rely on the iron bank to buy sellswords from across the narrow sea and have Sir Justin bring them. I hired Sorel as my shield, and he was my responsibility. The Karstarks will be punished, alongside Theon Greyjoy and his sister, when we reach Winterfell. Let the Northern Lord see what happens to traitors and those, who refuse my rights as their king. I have to marry one of the North's daughters, unless you have forgotten. To secure the alliance long term, and I'm not sure if mother would approve of an umber good daughter soiling the royal court. Stay away from Asha Greyjoy. Sir Richard has informed me of your regular interactions with her, she cannot be trusted, since I will put her brother to death myself. Uneasy alliances have to be made, you allied us with the Karstarks and look what it did. Asha wants revenge on the Boltons, and we can use it to our advantage. You understand the consequences, if we follow your plan. That woman wants to bed you and steal a crown for herself. I cannot blame her, as I blame myself for not marrying you off sooner into the war, and I have to contend with my prisoner attempting to seduce my heir. King Stannis said bitterly. She will be disappointed. I don't want her, but I know she can be useful in this war. Her name is the only thing that gives her value and her axe, which is a shame, but that's how the world is. The man began to think, but knew he was one of the only people, apart from Ser Davos, who can hold his father accountable for his failures and mistakes in this war. If it had been another man, then he would have been banished or eliminated for his words. He was lying when he said, he didn't want Asha, but he had a war to focus on and one woman did not matter to him. Jacob knew his plan could end in failure at the cost of his life and the lives of his men, but it could mend whatever hostility there was between Greenlander prince and Ironborn woman. The prince was not a man for accepting defeat or otherwise, but he knew the war was his last chance in creating a lasting legacy for himself on the battlefield, as it could be his last time he will be on a battlefield, with his life and the lives of his men on the line. A man with antlers on his unburnished gold helm trekked through the fields, whilst taking the reins of his grey mare, as the man's armour stood out from the snow fields. The storm was interrupted, and not a single snowflake fell from the sky a day after. The prince thought the northern gods were good and true to stop the storm, just for him and his father's armies to crash through Winterfell and reclaim it in the name of House Stark again. He was not alone on the field, riding beside him was his cousin Luther Estermont, with hair as bright as the nightfire the queen's men would light up for prayers to their god. Days before the battle and for the safety of the king and the royal family that remained on the wall. Jacob realized this could be his last battle, and he did not want it to be. He was his father's second in command, after Ser Davos, and was there when his father needed him. He was never going to abandon his king, not for anything, not even for a fleeting chance to get Desmer back to him. The prince shook his head, at the thought of his first love again, there were moments when he thought of her when he was freezing in the north and it made him warm inside, as he thought of the buxom strawberry blonde haired lady of the arbor. He still loved her, even though she was lost to him a long time ago, 
but Uncle Robert never forgot about his Lady Lyanna, and never would Jacob forget about his Desmer, since loving her has shaped him into the man he was and made him open his eyes about the world. If Jacob Baratheon truly had a choice, then he would have rejected his father's northern offers and wait for the love of his life, but his love for Desmer had eroded away and a new face replaced her. She was a woman with an axe and haughty voice, which made his bones shivered within. He was not sure what he felt towards Asha was real, but it was real enough to replace the face of his first love out of his mind, but she was a hostage for life and was going to spend the rest of her life in a Winterfell cell. The prince and his men were marching through the snows, but from the distance, little figures moving forward from the great castle itself it could be the enemy being set upon the prince and his father. Jacob and his father separated with two halves of the host, and halves of the northerners who took their own sides and led themselves. It's better this way, since Luther has Asha with him. I am responsible for her, and I am trusted to keep her from escaping her situation. I can't look at her, with those knowing eyes of mine, whilst I am fighting on the field, but I can use her and her axe for my advantage against Bolton's idiot and allow her revenge for her brother. I heard a lot from Sir Justin, a man Asha socialized with apart from the she-bear that she was in love with me, even though I rejected her twice. I cannot be responsible for her feelings, but I have some affection for her, not out of love or hate, but out of a shared hatred for the Boltons and their rule. The prince rode away on his horse, with Sir Luther and the host following behind. He began to wonder the silence of the field, was a distraction for him. Jacob was trained in this sort of thing, as it was like hunting with the Tarly party and looking for game in the season. He never wanted to miss everything, even if it put the lives of his cousin and his men in danger, but his instincts told him to look at every possible factor if men from houses Riswell. Whitehill or Dustin were coming to attack, even though most of them were trapped by Bolton rule to rebel or do anything about it. Prince Jacob was looking forward to seeing those cowardly Whitehills, who fled from him at High Point, but they have no choice to stay in Winterfell with their castle in the hands of his father. Jacob Baratheon rode in front of his half of the royal host, mixed with Southerns left over from Dragonstone, the Reach and the Stormlands, proud with a confidence, as Misty trotted at his command. He held the Warhammer to his waist, as he looked at the men willing to sacrifice their lives for their king, their prince, and the liberation of Winterfell and the North from the Boltons. The prince was conscious, he would never see Luther or Sorel again, and they could be dead by the time the battle ended, and he needed to prepare for that outcome and to honor their deaths as best as he can. Jacob's sword was in its place, even though the hammer was his primary weapon, his eyes were steeled with a determination to fight to the end. Men of the king, tonight shall be out last fight in the north before we clear out Winterfell of Oathbreakers and Kingslayers. On our way, will be thousands of men from northern houses, who aim to see us dead and my father's cause lost. As your future king, I vow to lead you all to victory and through death and beyond. The prince declared, with the roaring cheer of the men and cousin Luther raiding the air, and it made Jacob feel a sense of power only a king or a high lord could experience, and he liked the feeling of such power. The prince rode away on his horse, with Luther and half of his host by his side. He wondered about the silence, as it could be a distraction for him. Jacob was trained in this sort of thing, as it was like hunting with the Tarly party on some days looking for game in season. He never missed anything, even if it put the lives of his cousin and his men in danger. His instinct told him to look at every possible factor of men from Houses Riswell, Whitehill or Dustin were coming to attack. As most of the powerful northern houses were trapped under Bolton rule to truly rebel or do anything about it, unless they found one of the long-lost Stark boys, the turncloak was supposed to have eliminated. A quake in the ground shook at the rush of horses trampling the ground on a winter's night. Jacob had the warhammer of his uncle at his side, he still had his sword in its place, in case he heated it on the field and it did not hurt to have an extra weapon. He still had the dagger, the traitor Alistair Florent gave to him for his fourteenth name day. The sound of the northern warhorns were sounded from his side and from afar, where his father was with the rest of their host and some of the northern forces from houses Umber to Serwin. It made the prince wish he had his own warhorn, but the northerners will give him one on his next name day or on his wedding day, as a celebration of the new alliance between north and south. Jacob witnessed a barrage of Northmen on their hardy, big horses coming through with various familiar banners flapping in the winds. The prince motioned his men to go forward, 
with him at the helm of the host with the warhammer raised in the air and the shine of his armor seen by all. The adrenaline rushed through his blood, as he was ready to fight and to spill blood of his enemies. But he knew the Northmen and women were not as excited because they did not want to spill the blood of their fellow Northmen, even though they betrayed the memory of how Stark to kneel to the Boltons to survive. Jacob never knew Northern loyalty, until he saw it because they stick together, unlike Southerners, who play the game of thrones to stab each other in the back to win their plots and schemes against each other. The Warhammer received its first taste of blood in years, with the strike against a man wearing Bolton cloths, with the clash of metal and axes against the swords of established northern cavalry. The white snows were stained in blood, for the first time since the northern civil wars centuries ago, but the drops of red turned parts of the ground pink. With the bodies of the fallen dropping of their chaos of it all made their steeds flee from the area, and leave the men at risk of being trampled upon by the horses of the enemy, or cut to pieces by the enemy too. Jacob was glad to give the Warhammer a taste of blood, it has been thirsting for and there were enough frays and boltons to quench its thirst for traitor's blood. The men of those houses were cursed, and as the seven's most faithful servant, Jacob wanted to see the work of the gods be dished out by him. From the corner of his eye, Jacob struck the Warhammer against another adversary, as the battle cry of the Northmen rung in the air and the men called out as well. He held on to the reins of his horse, even with the Warhammer that will not be lifted by a skinny or a small man, but a man strong enough to wield it. The prince rode like the wind, with cousin Luther behind him with Asha on his saddle, to make sure she does not fall from the horse and escape in the midst of the chaos. With the Northmen advancing from the way of Winterfell, there was another cluster of men coming in from the east with the banner of the twin towers of House Fry being carried. As there were many frays on the field, due to them being aligned with Roose Bolton by kinship vows of godless marriage. The man clutched onto the warhammer, as tightly as he could, even though Misty was startling at the advance of the Fry men. Even though most of them were being hacked to pieces by the few mountain clans men that rode with the Lord of the Storm and Fury, out of respect for Prince Jacob for what he did in Deepwood Mott and beneath the wall. He never knew how much the clansmen, the most hardened of Northmen, who lived in the western boundaries of the mountains began to like and respect him for being the warrior Uncle Robert was. The prince sees the stain of the ground, as Snow White begins to turn blood pink, as more fry men were dying, but the ones in more elaborate armor were still riding their steeds and advancing towards the prince himself. Jacob realized the ones in better armor were Freys, in command of the armed forces sent out by Lord Bolton himself. The blood-stained snow was what disturbed me most, knowing damn well those Freys were sent to eliminate me personally. Why not Lud Whitehill or Roderick Riswell? Better men could have been sent to eliminate me or did Roos Bolton want the humiliation of me, the son of Stannis Baratheon to die at the hands of a godless Fry? He will not get the last laugh. Where is his idiot? I have many bones to pick with him, and I will send Asha his way and he will learn not to anger an iron-born woman, who loves her little brother so much that she would see him die at the chopping block. A gust of black wind blew in the prince's way, as a shadow of the snowstorm was returning as men died around him. Jacob motioned his horse to strike his hammer towards one of the sniggering frays, who were not protected by their heads, which made bashing their heads with the hammer easier and killing them indefinitely. The man's horse stirred again, as Misty was not used to this chaos and his hands were slipping away from the control of the saddle, and he tried to whisper reassurance to his frightened horse, but it failed as it worked in the past. He turned around to see his men were advancing onto the Freys and the Northmen, who were fighting by their side by brutal force and not by loyalty. All Jacob needed was to eliminate Roos Bolton himself, and the rest of the Northerners will rebel against the Boltons and the battle will end. The fright of the horse sent Jacob toppling onto the ground with his helm falling out of his head, but he picked himself up, even though his armor weighed him down. He carried the warhammer with a dignity, it has never been seen, since the Greyjoy Rebellion, but this time it will mean the permanent death of House Bolton, unless Lord Bolton's fry wife complies with King Stannis in the end. The man paced through the snows, battering every man he could see coming towards him with swords, held in such a weak way as the hand of the swords were shaking. A snarl appeared on his face, with his face seen by the men on the side of the enemy, so they could remember the man, who ended their pitiful existence in this world. 
A battle cry was heard in the distance, as more men on cavalry horses were motioning the field, instead these men carried the banner of the blue-green merman. The men of House Manderley had finally come to fight him, even though he was off his horse, and was trotting to survive. The prince licked his blood-stained lips in satisfaction, as the rush of blood was running through his veins and he liked it. As a man, known for playing the Game of Thrones, killing and fighting was thrilling to him and it gave him validation as a man and a warrior. It was the broken society he lived in, where men would sacrifice their lives in battle and songs would be sung about the wars they died in, but it was lies to him. Shattered by Randall Tarley, who taught him that war was a man's duty, not a province for glory but to serve your liege lord and your king. The prince was trekking, even though he lost sight of his horse Misty and could not find her. A stream of warriors carrying flaming swords rode through the field, shouting for Rlawler and his light upon us. As the men with the swords of fire were the queen's men, led by Sir Godry Faring, the ringleader with Sir Richard being at his father's side with Sir Justin on his way to Bravos. The queen's men advanced onto the Fry soldiers, but he could see the Mandalay men did not want to fight against the prince and his forces, as they knew who the true enemies were, unlike their lord and master. He was phased, becoming dizzy with the warhammer in his hand, but a man came towards him with a sword, and the prince ended his existence with one strike against his chest, and the blood sprayed onto the prince's armor and his face. Jacob had seen his fair share of blood in these wars, but this one was going to make him, as the Greyjoy rebellion made his father. Another victim fell to the might of the hammer, as the red sprayed on the prince's face the gold on his armor was covered in blood. The cry of men dying was ringing in his ear, and Jacob never thought to know if his father was amongst the living or the dead. He was not concerned, even though his father was an experienced battle commander and will be fine, but the chaos of the battle with at least five armies being split up to attack the rear ends of where Jacob and his father's forces were. The main factor was the Northmen on the side of the Boltons, none of them wanted to be there on their own free will. Apart from the White Hills and the leftovers of Arnulf Karstark's forces, even though the leaders of that army were imprisoned by his father in the lower barracks. The prince gazed at the bloodshed on the field, caused by the warhammer, even though his boots were covered with snow and struggled to move forward. He looked to see men falling from their horses and being hacked to pieces with rival swords. Jacob was worried, as Misty has not returned yet, as she did the last time he fell from her saddle in battle. As a horseman, Jacob had never lost control of his horse before, only in the heat of the battle or when the chaos was too much for his easily scared southern steed. He was stumbling his way, as Winterfell was miles away from where he and his men were, but he never forgot his goal or his aim, not for a second will he forget his purpose in this war. Men and few women were dying, from the sight of the corpses littered around, even though most of the dead were from the Fry and Whitehill side of the field. He didn't care because he was only on the field to eliminate the more important commanders and captains on Bolton's side. A neigh was heard in the distance, with the prince turning to see his grey mare trotting towards him, whilst tramping a few Fry and Riswell soldiers in her way. Jacob wiped the tear that fell from his eye, and his heart was levitated at the sight of his horse living. The steed stopped where he was, and he was able to get back on the saddle, with the warhammer at his side. From the saddle, he saw the piles of corpses from the side of the enemy, whilst the bodies of his own men were minimal in comparison, as the flaming swords of the queen's men saved Jacob an advantage. He hated to think of such men, he viewed as heretics against the gods. The man sounded a battle cry out of his own lips, with the men raising their swords to follow their prince through death and beyond. Jacob motioned Misty in the direction of the north, as he wanted to keep her away from the stench of the dead. A roar of victory radiated through the crowd of men and women, as a few more were grouped with the prince with them coming from his father's half of the royal host of Southerns. And the question that floated through his mind was what happened to his father, and where was he and the northern soldiers led by Moore's crow food, the umber with one eye. He did not know where, and he had a feeling this battle between liberation or defeat was far from over. Chapter 51 Adorned in the pink and red colors of House Bolton, arriving to assist what was left of the Frey's forces, but none could see Prince Jacob with the snow winds getting heavier and the storm being to the prince advantage to escape from them. The gold armor cannot be seen in the snow, as the color did not stand out in the face of the flaming swords of the queen's men, with the light dimming, due to the storm. 
Jacob's mind was scarred from the sight of the dead on the field he expected to be many dead in this battle, but it was too much for his mind to process and he motioned his horse to turn west, as he wondered where his father was and why he was not in the midst of the fighting. With the northerners and his half of the royal host pushing back against the mass of Bolton men, whom just arrived on the field, but it was not the entire Bolton host, as half of them stayed behind at Winterfell. The prince struck the warhammer against anyone, who got in his way, as he commanded his horse to ride west of the White Plains. He knew the storm would distract the men fighting, and he handed the host to his cousin Luther and he trusted him to take his place, whilst he searched for his father. Jacob may be a man grown, but he was never going to leave his father at the back of his mind, and he would never think not helping him if he was in trouble or was overwhelmed by the enemy forces. The horse was riding away through the treks of snow, which was minor in comparison to him having to have eyes at the back of his head. At seeing the visible threats coming after him, whether it was traitor Northman or was it the Bolton men, who came to help the almost defeated Freys. Another horse appeared in the distance, with the prince seeing a woman riding the horse. It was one of the horses left over from his father's cavalry, but the horse's master must be dead, if a woman was in the saddle. As Jacob looked closer, he realized the woman on the horse was Asha Greyjoy. She was following him or was she trying to escape? There was no way Asha would be foolish to try and escape in the middle of a battle with most men's minds occupied in killing the Northmen and Freys that stood in the way of Winterfell's freedom. He would take the Ironborn down, even if it meant to stop her from escaping, as she has no allies and no friends in the Greenlands and the Iron Islands, everyone she loved and commanded left her for richer pickings or were resting in the dungeons of Deepwood Mott. He kept control of his horse, even though he was not going to let Asha out of his sight. What the hell is she doing? Stealing a horse from a dead man. Where is she going? Is she meaning to follow me or is she daring to escape? The prince thought deeply, but he could not be lost in his own thoughts in the middle of a war and be in total control of his horse at the same time. Misty neighed loudly, with Jacob not sure what was happening. His eye was on Asha, not knowing iron-born women could ride better than the men, as the men were used to their ships and galleys, his face flushed red, due to the cold of the storm and his nose frozen to the touch. The man was secure with the thought of another female hostage not escaping his father's grasp at all, never would Gwyn Whitehill be foolish enough to leave without her own life being on the line. That girl was used to lure out her father and brothers out in the open, as isolation is the key to getting rid of Roose Bolton's most loyal supporters in the north and the ones who held Iron Wrath and the Wolfswood in his name. Before Jacob and his father's forces came and scrubbed them out of High Point, and took the lands and gave it to the foresters, their arch enemies in the north, which made the remaining White Hills stew, while they were trapped in Winterfell. Where are you going, pirate? The prince asked, loud enough for her to hear and to be afraid of the consequences of escaping the war. I'm following you, my sweet prince. Spare me of your lies and tell me truthfully. I'm looking for the idiot of Bolton, Greenlander. The one, who tore my brother apart. I was looking for my father, but plans have changed, and I could aid you in your search for him. Why would you do such a thing? We have an enemy in common. Will you let your pride down and let me have my vengeance? The idiot is of little concern to me, but my father wants him dead and I will follow his order. The grey joy began to chuckle between her lips, with an axe strapped to her waist, no doubt collected from the dead soldiers. You Greenlanders and your orders, you humor me, my sweet. The idiot will flee from the sight of a Greenlander and an ironborn together. I hope not, I mean to see him dead. Prince Jacob knew this deal could mean his death, but with the chaos around him, he had no choice to enter such an alliance. It was only for war, and they will go back to being enemies later, but they were on the same side and fighting the same enemies. It would be foolish for Jacob and Asha not to ally in plotting the death of the Bolton idiot, as the iron-born woman was searching for him and looking to skin him alive. As he did to her brother in the dread fort for years and created a sickly dead being from the torture bestowed on him. The prince wanted to see the idiot eliminated by Asha's hand, but he knew Theon Greyjoy deserved his punishment for his actions in the north and he suffered for his ill deeds. The turn cloak was marked for death, but he was still Asha's brother, and she will do everything in her power to avenge him from the man, who tortured him and broke him until he was no longer human. The two were riding west, 
but at a slow pace to get wind of anyone, who tries to ride them down. Jacob's stomach grumbled, at the thought his father King Stannis finding out about this alliance, but he didn't care his body disapproved of what he was going to do. He needed an ally at war, and Asha was the one. The ironborn woman still expressed her unadulterated affection towards him, even though he rejected her, but she will never stop trying to woo him, even during a war and where both of their lives could mean the grave in this frozen wasteland. He sensed Misty was nervous, but his horse was bred in the west and was always skittish when in the mist of the cold weather the horse settled and was dealing the harsher conditions better than most horses, that perished on the way south from Deepwood Mott. Jacob sensed a chill through the tresses of his long hair, as he lost his helm in the midst of the battle. He was risking his position to assist Asha, in the search for Roose Bolton's mad dog idiot, as he was here, looking for his false bride and for his reek. The idiot wanted to get them back at any cost, no matter who he eliminated and which northern lord or lady he pissed off to have his lord father throw him out from the warm fires of Winterfell and into the cold field. Prince Jacob was exhausted with the fighting, as his body was agreeing with him as well. His fingers holding on to the warhammer, were almost frozen to the hilt of it and were numb to the touch, but he was able to move his fingers well enough. Not for the warhammer to fall from his grasp and him to lose what his uncle was going to give to him on his way to manhood. I'm glad you are here. Prince Jacob said unexpectedly, not knowing how it would make the ironborn next to him feel. Why be so nice to me, sweet prince? Lady Asha replied. I don't want to do this without you. We are hunting the same man. After this war, we will go our own ways. You will have to live with your brother being dead at my father's hand. I will never forget you, foolish Greenlander stag. Did you steal one of those flaming swords? No, they burned out. I gave the command of my forces to my cousin, as he proved himself when killing your lot. Your father will go spare, the thought of his heir hunting down an idiot with me instead of being a hero. I will be a war hero anyways. That's the spirits, Greenlander. When the battle is over, I will share one cup of ale or wine with you. Do not dream too high, Greyjoy or else you will fall hard. The prince sniggered, when Asha said what she said. He liked the thought of sharing a drink with her, even though his father will disagree. Jacob had no friends, but his cousin Luther and Sorel was gone from his side, so he had no one to talk with, who was not a mindless soldier or a family member. The man was the type not to tolerate nonsense, especially if it was from family because blood relations gives no man license to be a failure or betrayal to you. It was what Jacob did when he pushed memories of Uncle Renly from his mind because of the man being a usurper. He never wanted to think of his traitor uncle, even years after his death because of what Uncle Renly had done to try and take his father's throne from him, after all Renly was responsible for stealing Storm's end from his father. The main stronghold of the Stormlands was Jacob's birthright, to be passed down to his own heirs, had it not been for that simpering green knight uncle that stole it from him. Prince Jacob changed how he saw Asha, as she slowly went from an enemy into something. He did not know what it was, and he did not like where it was going. An uneasy ally yes, it was what she was to be called for now. There was no way, he would take her as a lover, he had enough common sense to see it was a bad idea. Asha wanted a crown, and he was the way to let her take a southern one, because her own was stolen from her and she looked to him as bait and he saw through her. He was unlovable, as the son of Stannis Baratheon and he knew no one would truly like him or love him on their free will, but only would only like him for the promise of a crown and power in the game. If this night on the northern snows was Jacob's time to die, then the stranger was mistaken. He and Asha motioned their horses to trot slowly, whilst they were as far as they were from the main battlefield and the prince handed over his half of the royal host to Luther, whilst he had it to assist the ironborn in searching for Bolton's idiot. As he was around and had no idea that his false bride was with Sir Justin and Lady Alisan on their way to the wall to deliver her to the Lord Commander, and his reek was going to be executed by the prince's father, so the idiot lost by two points in this game. The harsh winds distracted the prince from being in control of his horse, but Misty knew to obey her master, even in such conditions to be trotting around. He turned to see Asha, with a blank stare on her face, she was craving for revenge and was going to get it tonight. He was covered in his furs, but his armor was weighing him down. Jacob knew his helm was long lost, 
and it could be found by someone on the battlefield and can claim him being dead. The lost helm makes a good distraction, so the enemy does not know where he is and Asha being with him. As a rational man, Jacob was wrong for trusting Asha, but he needed an ally to stay alive in this war and someone, who could trust him in turn and not be too close to him, he had enough betrayals in his life and he did not want to prepare for another. The Grey Joy has nothing, but her name, as she was deserted by her people and her family, only left with a beaten, broken and scarred brother, who will be sentenced to death. He still did not know about Asha, but he knew enough to make a choice whether to assist her or abandon his responsibility to her as a future goaler. What is on your mind, Greenlander? Lady Asha said, commenting on the prince's silent look on her. Nothing, just focus on looking for him. I'm glad you came with me. To keep you from escaping, if you think me a fool in letting you out of sight. You want to marry me. The Ironborn said in a haughty tone, she always liked to say such things to catch the prince off guard. I will never marry you you are Ironborn scum and you will live with being alone. There is no need to be so dull. Focus on the task, Greyjoy. The idiot is as slippery as his father and I want to see him dead. Impatient already, sweet prince. I will let you have the spoils, such as his coin or his weapons and I will take his clothes. You never seem to amaze me, Lady Asha. The prince ignored Asha's provocations, as it was something, she did to catch his attention. He was not fussed about it, because she was not his type of woman physically, but she was similar in the qualities he liked about women. He will never be foolish to say such in front of her and give her a weapon to use against him. Jacob's eyes were looking from side to side, as the fields were nothing, but snow and no man was there, dead or alive he was sure the search was fruitless, but for Asha it meant something to her. He had the warhammer, strapped to his back as his horse needed his full attention with his hands and he still had his sword, in case a man tried to ride him or the ironborn down. The wind stirred, with snowflakes lifting from the field as it swirled around them. As a southern man and an ironborn woman, it was rare for Jacob and Asha to see snow in their lifetime and go through a storm, which was the worst the north has ever seen, since the beginning of the long night, the original version of it. He believed with his mind, the long night and endless winter was coming again, after the long decade of summer and peace in the south, before the war started and the Lannisters stole the throne, belonging to Jacob and his fathers by law and blood. House Baratheon was the house on the throne, after deposing the Targaryen dynasty in the rebellion and bringing fourteen years of stability and peace in the realm, before the Lion Whore and the Kingslayer ruined it. The end of the war is nigh, as the fight in the north will be the longest and a great castle is the hands of cutthroats and their allies. Roose Bolton was foolish to send Northmen, who wanted to cut him to pieces out on the battlefield, as they could turn on his fry allies on the field without their Bolton master ever knowing, hold up in the hearth that belonged to Ned Stark and his children by rights. Father will deal with the rest of the forces sent out to us, but the remainder of the Karstark army is under our command with Lord Arnolf and his family being imprisoned for attempted murder and the betrayal against my father. The man shook his head at the thought of his wound at the hand of Harold Karstark, the drunkard of Arnolf's sons. Jacob was alive because of Asha, and he thanked her for it in his own way. He was a man of few words, but he was grateful for what the iron-born woman did for him. She was the only woman, Jacob had developed a solid relationship with, since he left his mother Queen Celis and his sister Princess Shireen at the wall with the rest of the Queen's men. A tear fell from the eye of the prince, when he thought of his mother and how she missed him, but he was secure in knowing his mother will cope without him and will always be his main supporter as one of the last trueborn heirs to House Baratheon. As much as he didn't like it, Jacob was the key to his house. He was the man ready to stabilize what was left of House Baratheon and how to build it up again for the next generation. There was rustling in the snows and Jacob knew it. Someone was here or they were coming for Jacob and Asha, a great opportunity for a wandering soldier to eliminate the heir to Stannis Baratheon and the last trueborn scion of Balon Greyjoy, it will make a name for such a person. He motioned his horse to be still, not wanting to frighten her as he did in the heat of the battle. The man was sure someone was already here, judging by the big-footed footprints lining up in a trail on the ground, as the storm blew some of the tracks away. Some still remained and the prince knew it was no one he was familiar with, who had bigger feet and wore boots to fit that size of an average lord's feet, even though the tracks indicated someone was still here. 
the idiot must be here, and he is looking for us too. The sister of Theon and the son of Stannis waiting for him. A lucky skin flayer to have such an opportunity to see his last hours in the hands of two, who rode away from the war just to find him. Skin flayers were outlawed by the Starks but will be destroyed by the Baratheons and will never again exist in the north, as long as Stannis Baratheon remained king. Prince Jacob turned to Asha, whilst both got off their horses, as it was easier to look for Ramsay Snow on foot. As a veteran warrior, being on foot afforded Jacob the best chance in finding the enemy, even if it was a lowly idiot, who was given too much power, and benefited from the death of his trueborn brother and Lord Bolton's rightful heir. The two began motioning forward on the heels of their boots, with axe and sword in hand in case the idiot or his idiot boys dared to attack them from behind a stormlander and an ironborn together will make formidable allies on the battlefield. But it was a shame both kinds were enemies because of the whims of a foolish ironman, who wanted to relish in the glory of taking a crown in the name of his ironborn rights. The man was conscious, as the storm raged on and the snowfall could be disarming to his eye. He was not alone he had Asha with him, an unlikely ally. It will be a great story to tell Uncle Axel and others when he reunites with the rest of his family of his life being saved because of a grey joy and he intend to pay his debt, by assisting her in the search for the idiot boy. The idiot's death will be long and painful as Asha swore it will be, to relish the thought of punishing her brother's torture with her axe. He will be there to make sure Lady Asha is not eliminated, as a valuable hostage to his father and a bargaining chip to impress the northern lords, who spurred his father's rightful claim to all seven kingdoms, including the frozen northern wasteland. The two looked around, as the ironborn woman faced the prince, no hint of emotion on her face. She clutched onto her axe, and was ready to eliminate the idiot, as the prince was happy to join her. Jacob spots a figure in the distance, coming towards the two with the man pulling out his reach-made sword and Asha with her axe. Whomever was coming was no friend of theirs and it was war, so it could be anyone from any of the northern houses sworn to Roose Bolton and his dictational rule over the north. He was warm beneath his armor and cloaks covering his fragile skin, as it reddens in the cold and in extreme heat as his nose was red and visible to the train that the figure came closer to them. But Jacob and Asha had seen worse than the idiot of Bolton so both had no fear of whomever was coming for a prince and an ironborn hostage. A clearing in the storm was enough for Jacob and Asha to see the face of the approach and Asha's lips turned into a snarl. An ugly man came into the prince's view, when dressed finely in the cloths of House Bolton red and pink. He was big-boned and shouldered, as he will surely be fat later in life, if he has one. The man's skin was pink and blotchy, with a broad nose and wormy wide lips. His long hair was dark and covered with flakes of snow, as was his dark red armor with a pale cloak on his shoulders. His eyes were ice cold and were like black holes on the way to the seven hells, as he would enjoy going to such a place, being a Bolton of high value and status with his clothes telling Prince Jacob otherwise. From behind and around, a few men in black clothes appeared with barking large black hounds on leather leashes, as Jacob was not afraid of no dog, unless the man in front of him thought himself higher than a purebred dog from the reach. I see the son of Stannis Baratheon left the battlefield to find me, I am honored to be graced with your presence. The ugly man said, twiddling his small knife between his fingers. You were meant to come alone, not with your pets behind you. The men of House Whitehill found your helm and cheered your demise. I am not as foolish as Lord Ludd to claim a victory with no body. I am here so what do you want? You brought the sister of my reek with you, better to eliminate two birds with one stone. You and your idiot boys will die tonight. Asha said, in a snarl between her lips. I finally meet the idiot face to face, the kinslayer of the north, here in the flesh. I am grateful to put a face to the name. The ugly man bristled at the thought of being called idiot, even though having his father's name did not mean, as blood and birth status matter in this world. You will mind your words, undull scum. I was gifted with my father's name by royal decree. By Tom and the child usurper, another idiot. Your father will be dead, before you raised your sword or hammer against me. You mistake me for Theon Greyjoy, a weakling who cannot survive the North. I am as much a Northman as the men, who fight against you and your father. A pity, 
for us to meet in this dreadful storm and the storm could eliminate us before we eliminate each other. Enough games, idiot, you will pay for what you have done to my brother. A veteran, who needs a woman to fight at his side. Ironborn scum, she may be, but she worth ten times more than you, Kinslayer. Why are you out here? Did your father sent you to eliminate me or are you afraid of other parties in Winterfell? You dare to question my spurs, the son of the man, who worships fire dares to stand against me. Faithless, godless as you are idiot. I know your name already and it is not Bolton as it is Snow. The prince declared, as the idiot man bristled again, not liking to be reminded of how a name means nothing when you live in a world where blood right matters. My idiot boys have been craving for a real fight, since the sack of Winterfell. Things were boring and having to host one northern lord or lady after the other. Better to be here, rather than threaten to be eliminated by those old Stark loyalists or that Dustin. Your little flaying knife may scare children and girls, but not me. I have seen more battles than you and I am younger than you. The prince chuckled, putting away his sword and bringing out the warhammer. Winterfell will be mine one day, and I suggest you bow before me as my father is Warden of the North. Prince Jacob and Lady Asha burst out laughing at Ramsay Snow's declaration, as it was as false as he was as a man, a lowly man, who dared to challenge the son of a king, the heir of storm and fury. The man's fingers were grasped onto the warhammer, as it thirsted for blood again and the snow boy and his idiot boys made good fodder. The man in front of him may be a idiot, but he had Bolton blood through his veins, and he could not underestimate him as bastards can emulate their families more than their trueborn siblings did. His eyes were surveying the idiot boys around him, most were men at arms for Roos Bolton, but held some twisted loyalty to Lord Ramsay. As he gave them the blood they desired and the authority to eliminate whomever they wanted, unlike the cautious Lord Roos Bolton, who wanted no blood unless it was necessary. The man brandished the hammer at his side, and looked at Asha, as she had her axe in hand. The idiot boys were present, as they surrounded the two with their angry hounds on their leashes. The barking gave the prince a minor headache, as he never liked dogs at all for their loud barking and constant neediness to be catered to. Prince Jacob knew he would confront a noteworthy enemy in this battle, but the idiot boy may do with the more eligible men hiding in Winterfell or fighting out in the battlefield, where Luther Estermont led Jacob's half of the royal host and would be wearing his lost helm. As a way to trick the enemy into thinking he was there, fighting with the men and not surrounded by glorified dog trainers and an idiot boy twiddling a flaying knife in front of him. From the turn of the eye, the idiot boys were sent upon them, as Asha's axe sliced the throat of one, that came close to her and Jacob swung the warhammer against at least three of them that tried to divide him from his ironborn partner. He saw three men remaining, and the idiot boy leader himself sniggering and not lifting a finger to help his own men. The snow was furious with the sight of arrows sicking out of the skins of his beloved hounds out of nowhere, as the remaining idiot boys lining to attack them from the front, as the rear attack failed. The prince's face was stained with the red of his assailants, but his steel-forged eyes were set upon the idiot, who unleashed his own pitiful sword. Asha wiped the stain of idiot red from her face as well, holding two axes in her hands, as she was not satisfied with the lack of blood and wanted more, and wanted the idiot boy to fight and not hide behind his men. The three idiot boys charged towards them, as the warhammer was crushed against their pitiful lack of armor, as Asha stabbed the remains of them with a knife, she must have stolen from a dead fry soldier on the field. But the men of Ramsay Snow did not survive against the might of one Ironborn and Stormlander alliance, with the bodies of them and their hounds littered across the snows. The idiot boy did not flinch, as he was used to the horrors of death, being a Bolton, even in name because of the usurper's decree. The edge of Asha's axe and the warhammer were coated in a thick sheen of red, from the fallen idiot boys, even their leader must be impressed of how long it took to eliminate seven men. Jacob was not convinced, as Ramsay Snow as rumored to be more dangerous when bored or afraid, but a Bolton never showed fear, even in the face of death from the land of the living. But this boy was no man, only a worm who tortures broken boys and rapes girls, who do not matter to the world or have families that care for them. I know he is watching me but looking at Asha because she is a woman. Northerners keep their women the same way the Southerns do. 
It is a shame the Dornish influence in court did not extend to the rest of the kingdoms and their gender norms, as women can fight for home and land, just as the men do. As Theon's sister, Asha is craving to bash Ramsay's head in, but she must be subtle, as her emotions can be used as a weapon, and I cannot allow my father's most valuable hostage to be eliminated because of my incompetence. He does not see me as a threat, but his lord father does and that's why he is cowering in Winterfell. The prince stirred, not minding his cloak stained of blood, but its thick black material makes it hard to see the red upon him. His face was covered with it, as well as Asha. He had to trust her this time, as they were two and Ramsay Snow was one and seven men were dead. The worm pursed his lips, as if he was the one who won this battle, but he put his little flaying knife away and brought out his sword. A jitter of his eyes moving from side to side from the idiot showed he was not completely dead, but he had some ounce of fear, being alone and surrounded by two foes. He did not run as other men would do in his place, as Bolton's only issue remaining, he is likely to stand and fight and not go down a craven. Asha gave the prince a look, as he did the same to her, and they both looked at the idiot together, holding their weapons, ready for this fight to be theirs and their foe to be the one, who rots in the ground. I'm impressed, my idiot boys will be remembered. The idiot Ramsay said, in a cold tone. With no remorse for the men, who just died for him. Are you afraid, Snow? Noi would rather die as I see fit, than die a craven like Reek. You know where my bride is, undull scum. As far as possible away from you, you will not hurt others again. Who are you to command me? I am the heir to Winterfell and you are the son of a throneless king. Better a man than you. Asha gritted between her teeth. She must love you very much to have gotten you here. My feelings for her do not matter I treat her the same as any enemy, the difference is, she has more value than you. Stop stalling, death will await you, idiot. The ironborn said harshly. I am truly graced to be in the presence of two of the worst, the north has to see. An ironborn and an undull prince with no legitimacy. Shut your chatter, I am here for a fight, not to play Sivas with you, Snow. If it is a fight you want, then a fight you shall have. The man was not amused by the idiot boy's chatter, knowing he was stalling his own death and he would have done the same in his place, surrounded by two people who can cut him in half. He and Asha formed a circle around the other man, as there will be no way out for him, even though the worm has his ways of slipping past justice, but not this time. The adrenaline and the blood rushing though the prince's body got him to smile, whilst holding his dead uncle's warhammer, as it made a dent in the emotionless face of Ramsay Snow. As the dance for death started, the prince moved himself to the right as Asha circled the snow to her left clutching onto her axe with a smile upon her lips. With the circle, there was no way the boy was going to fight back unless he wanted a quick death and an inglorious end to his insignificant life as Bolton's dog. The red skull hilted blade made its appearance, as it wanted to strike against Jacob, but the steel of the warhammer countered the attack. Jacob's eyes were wide open, as to how much does Ramsay Snow value his life to be able to defend it and survive, but the prince did not care anyways, as his life was minimal compared to his father or the lords, who supported the Bolton regime in the north. The counterattack with Asha's axe made a big dent in the boy's dark red armor, as it looked to hold against such a strike, but the boy's own cloak protected him from the elements, as the storm settled, just for Jacob and Asha to see the idiot's face in the clear. There was a saying Ned Stark said to Jacob when they were in the God's Wood together once, when talking about the subject of killing a man or death. As he said you must look in the face of the man, who will die by your hand, and you must afford the time to look him in the eye before you eliminate him. He never paid attention, as it was moralistic coming from a man, whose honor was as like lifeblood to him. Another sword stack from Snow was pointless, as the prince's leg was in front to trip over the idiot, and he landed face first onto the snows. Jacob was not going to waste energy in fighting someone, who was not worth his time, as there are other lords, who will need to be eliminated after him. He held the warhammer in an arrogant manner, even though the idiot boy got himself up from the ground, his clothes covered in snow as his look to be agitated by the fall and the humiliation of it being done in front of a woman. Asha did not bother much, knowing how arrogant and emotionally stunted the idiot was, as it made Theon Greyjoy look a coward in comparison. 
How can Roose Bolton allow this worm to carry his name and stain his house for so many years without any one of his men ending him permanently? The prince's face twitched, as the anger upon his face was plain to see. He held the warhammer with dignity, in comparison to the fallen skull sword on the ground. Jacob and Asha looked at each other, and at the boy, as he was collecting himself and brushing the snowflakes from his cloak. The man knew a downed opponent was risky and he already made that mistake with the drunkard Harold Karstark, by turning his back away and allowing the man to almost take his life away because of one moment of arrogance and pride, but he will not make that mistake again. A strike with an axe dug into the collarbone of the idiot, as he yelped out, as outcry was as deadly as the blood trickling down his neck and into his dented armor. His eyes were widened at the sight of the snow being hacked in the shoulder by Asha, as the axe dug into the collar and his knees were buckling under his weightless and almost dead body. Jacob never expected such an attack, but Asha was ironborn and was waiting for the opportunity to bury her weapon deep when he was not looking or distracted by the prince's display with the hammer. Prince Jacob never envisioned the fight to be as unimpressive, especially when he had an unlikely ally with him. Asha Greyjoy did not falter or even leave his side, even though it was more to do with the idea of her having a southern crown of her own to look forward to. Since the prince's father has not named his new bride, since Alice Karstark ran away from home and wed a wildling at the wall. The man held the middle of the hammer and stared at the snow man right in the face, even though his wormy smile was displayed to hide the stench of necrotic flesh from his collarbone shattered by an ironborn axe. The idiot of Bolton had run out of ways to trick, and his wild ride was coming to an end, but Asha left the axe buried into his shoulder and stood next to the prince. The two looked at each other, and at the boy with an axe stuck to his neck, as it done in the name of the woman's brother and in the name of ironborn revenge. I see, I underestimated you, undull scum. Will you eliminate me or make me a thrall, like her? The snow asked, with blood trickling down his neck and through his mouth and drops went into the snow. What the snow wished, he had gotten with the warhammer delivering a thunderous blow to the boy's chest, with the dent of his armor becoming a large hole with blood and dead tissue flying out of the wound. He almost looked like another man Uncle Robert eliminated with the same hammer of war, but this time, it was wasted on a worm of an idiot and his dead idiot boys, which littered the snows and were only black spots in the northern storm. The boy fell backwards onto the ground, as his sword fell from his hand and the little flaying knife did too. Collapsed onto the ground with a dead axe in his neck, and a huge blow to his chest was what was left of him. Prince Jacob stared hard onto the hammer, as he saw the blood splatters all over the silver hilt and on the sigil of the crown stag on it. The Stormlander turned to the Ironborn, as they looked at the broken and beaten body of the worm, they had slain. His frostbitten fingers found their way to the warm fingers of the woman beside him, as this day was a good day for them both. A northern warhorn was blown in the distance, as the prince and the Ironborn could hear it, as it signaled the battle to be over. He was not sure, if the war was really over, all those moons of campaigning in the north and fighting small battles to come to this was over, but the prince's eye widened as the horn blew louder. He was elated at the thought of all these moons of war and death were worth it in the end and the great seat of Winterfell was free from the Boltons. Chapter 52 The snowstorm slowed down, as the northern nobility and the remains of the king's southern armies were gathered before a makeshift courtyard in the middle of Winterfell. King Stannis's bones ached, as it had been three days since he had fought the battle that made him a warrior again. The war was the victory he needed to make himself a king again, even though his loss at the Blackwater still plagued his mind he had been so close to sitting the Iron Throne and have it taken away in a swoop. The North was a savage place, it bred hardy men and women, willing to endure everything, just to have the right chance to rebel against the Boltons, and it was fortunate his son and the Greyjoy woman eliminated the idiot. And half the royal force led by Luther Estermont broke through the lines and led the butchery of Bolton and Whitehill soldiers left on the field, but it was necessary to win the castle back. The northern lords and ladies left inside the castle had imprisoned Roose Bolton and kept his fry wife, Lady Valda locked in the old chambers of Caitlin Stark with her servants. The stink of rotting heads irritated the king, as he stood on the wooden platform. Stannis turned to look at the heads stuck on the spikes of Winterfell for all the North and Seven Kingdoms to see, as the heads were familiar and were his most important kills and spoils of the Northern War. 
He still had more executions to get through, even though a few had been done and the Greyjoy boy was first to die by the weirwood tree, by the request of his grief-stricken sister Asha, who was still in tears for her brother's death and dying so far from the sea. It was the price he paid for being a turncloak, but the northern lords and ladies were pleased with the king's actions and ruthless stance of executing the rebels and traitors. And even beheading Theon Greyjoy by his own hand, as it was also a request made by his sister and let it be known the king did not pay his debts, as he owed one to the iron-born woman for saving his son's life. The next line of traitors were brought before the king, as most of the men were in the coat of arms of Houses Fry, Bolton and Whitehill. As the Riswells and Dustins were smarter than people thought with the interlinked northern houses being the ones responsible for the imprisonment of Roose Bolton, his wife Fat Valda and all her men-at-arms and serving girls she brought from the twins. Lord Bolton's fry wife was the latest addition of women prisoners, King Stannis kept beside Asha Greyjoy and Gwyn Whitehill, as that girl was forced to see the dead and mangled bodies of her lord father and all her brothers brought in for their bodies to be burned. As the northerners were cautious and the king heeded the young lord commander's lesson from when they first met at Castle Black. The dead will not be rising in Winterfell, especially when his son and second cousin led to burning the bodies of the men they lost on the battlefield. Coming here brings bad memories, as it was the home of the man Robert slighted me for. The Stark loyalists were thankful, but only half acknowledged me as their king, as most would rather bend to a Stark than they do me. The dead Greyjoy boy impressed the northern lords for the skeptics to be turned into loyal subjects, but coming outside was best, better to hear the screams of dying men. Then the grief-stricken cries of the Greyjoy woman, after seeing her brother one last time, as his head was planted next to Bolton's idiot Ramsay Snow. The death of the idiot was heard through some outriders from House Dustin as my son and Lady Asha were the ones, who eliminated him and left an axe buried in his shoulder, what happened between my son and that woman out there. Stannis Baratheon was the rightful king, and it was difficult for prideful northerners to swear fealty to him. Lady Freya of House Serwyn was one of the first to acknowledge her king, after hearing of the deaths of Lud Whitehill and all his sons on the battlefield, alongside Hosteen Fry and his brothers and nephews as well. The remaining Fry boys were too young for the chopping block, as he had to wait for them to get older for that time to come. The serving girls of Fat Valda were compliant with his son Prince Jacob, when it came to accounting for the prisoners in Winterfell and throwing the Fry boys in the dungeons. The king came to Winterfell in chaos and disorder, but the last three days were about fixing things and maintaining order amongst the chaos of the desertion of the northern supporters of Roose Bolton and that man was going to be executed for all the north to see. And to look in the faces of the lords and ladies, he subjugated for fealty. His son Prince Jacob and second cousin Sir Luther were standing in the front of the crowd of nobles, next to the Lady Serwyn and Lord Ardos Flint. The king brought his best swordsman on the plank, Sir Godry and Sir Richard were with him, but Stannis knew Sir Clayton Suggs died in battle and paid his respects to such a loyal queen's man. Things got better when Hother Horsbane Umber surrendered, when the battle was lost and pledged his men into Stannis's service, to assist in the mass butchery of Boltons, Whitehills and Freys remaining and he allowed it. The Umbers were staunch Northmen and it was difficult for Stannis to get these men onto his side, but the surrender of Crowfood's brother made the shift in having all the forces of House Umber. The king saw the Horsebane as a traitor and threw him in the dungeons as well as the other highborn prisoners the king amassed after the Battle of Ice and Blood. Bring me the prisoners. The king commanded, and his men answered with bringing the latest batch of prisoners for execution as most of them were Freys and one Roose Bolton, who looked all tattered in his furs and he looked a mess from solidarity confinement. King Stannis glared at Roose Bolton, knowing the man was beaten and defeated, the death of his idiot saw little tears come from him. All Bolton's allies gave him up, when the battle was lost and eliminated his loyalists inside the castle. The leech lord looked worried with his eyes shifting from side to side, maybe concerned for his fat wife and the Bolton babe she carried in her belly. The man was not heartless and would make Lady Valda's confinement as comfortable as possible, until she reached the birthing bed and her child was born. Solitary confinement was suited to Lord Bolton, as he was a valued prisoner. The Bolton lord's furs and cloak were a mess, as the man looked dirty, even though the king offered Roose Bolton one bath, as the king killer was still a high lord and was treated as such, no matter how much a criminal he was and scum in the face of the north. On the left of Bolton stood Lord Arnulf Karstark, 
his sons Arthur and Harold and his three grandsons were all in chains. Brought before the king and were lucky to have survived the frostbite of the battlefield, but he was fortunate they did not escape in the chaos of the war. Stannis hated these men more than he did Bolton, as one of them had wounded his son and he will not forget about it. These men were going to die, and he will do something to lure Lady Alice to return home and take over Carhold, as it will be easier for the lady to return when her great-uncle and his sons are dead. He did not approve of the wildling marriage, as written to him by his lady wife Queen Celis, when the king got access to Winterfell's ravenry and the castle maester was eliminated. It was good, as Maester Willem came in to replace the dead man before him, even though he was from the forester retinue, the king wanted to keep the maester here, as the portly man saved his son's life. The Karstarks had spoiled fruits thrown at them, by the household of Winterfell as the king allowed it, as those men deserved to be mocked by all sections. King Stannis gritted between his teeth, every time he had to see these worms, the worms who almost ended his son's life. He had to keep calm and civil, with the Karstarks living on borrowed time and everything they schemed for was all for nothing. Arnulf glared at Lord Roos, whom both were stripped of their finery and were dressed in rags as the common criminals they are, underneath highborn titles. The two men on their knees were disappointed, as their heads were lowered, not being brave enough to face the lords and ladies, they schemed against and how they will get the last laugh, especially the Mormonts and Umbers. The king wanted to get this over and done with, as he had more important things to get sorted, such as his son's marriage and finally arranging a wedding after so many disappointments through the years. There was nothing to worry about, as Bolton's wife is content, even though she was a glorified prisoner, but was treated better than Asha Greyjoy and Gwyn Whitehill were. The Bolton lord was brought to his knees, by the king's men as he will not make himself the kneeler in front of the northern lords he will never see again. King Stannis was not ignorant to the fact, he aged at least ten years older than his actual age as his son pointed out on their way into the castle, but the king ignored it. He had more important things to deal with, such as meeting all the lords and ruling ladies of the north one on one, even though he will talk with Lord Wyman after the executions, especially when it came to a marriage proposal Ser Davos made when he was at White Harbor. Stannis was grateful to know his Onion Knight was alive, and the Mandalay did not eliminate him as previously thought, as it was only to keep his son from smashing Lord Wyman's teeth for murder. I Stannis Baratheon, first of my name King of the Undoles, the Roiner and the first man the rightful Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm, hereby sentence Lord Roos of House Bolton to death by beheading for the following crimes, assassination, suppression of the North. Allyship with the usurpers who sit on my throne compliance in the terror unleashed upon Horwood by the idiot Ramsay Snow and the blood of Lady Hornwood and Rob Stark are upon his hands and allowing the torture of a highborn man to happen under his own keep. The king said, listing the known crimes the Bolton Lord had done and the others of the idiot will be laid upon him, as the boy was his spawn and he allowed him to commit such crimes without stopping him. The Bolton Lord said nothing, even in solitary confinement as a man of few words. He said nothing again, even when accused of all his crimes in front of the northern lords and ladies, even the mountain clans were present for the execution. As a northman, Roos Bolton forfeited his right to be beheaded by the weirwood tree, as he soiled his hands with the blood of Rob Stark and the people his idiot eliminated, in his wardenship of the north. The king realized the man's good sister Lady Barbary of House Dustin resided the man's fate, even though he was married to her late sister and the father of her favorite nephew. Who was eliminated by his own idiot half-brother, at least Roose Bolton could die knowing his true-born heir was avenged. The rotting head of Bolton's idiot was seen for all the citizens of Winterfell to see, and even Lord Bolton turned to look at the head once and never again. But the chained Karstarks next to him were also silent, not wanting to make things worse than they were for themselves, Stannis will eliminate these men himself as he will do Roose Bolton. Lord Bolton is the not the only lord, who will be punished as such, by his left are men, who deserve death more than anything. I hereby also sentence Lord Arnulf of House Karstark, his sons Arthur and Harold and all three of his lordling grandsons to death for the following crimes corresponding with the enemy at war, attempted murder twice on my person and my son's person too. Complicity causing the death of the rightful lord of Carhold, an attempt to steal the rights of Lady Alice of House Karstark of her home and keep for a false marriage arrangement and using untruths to solidify a false alliance. 
King Stannis said, with the crimes of the Karstarks more recent in his mind and he personally wanted Harold, the middle son to suffer for attempting to eliminate his son. A gag fell from the mouth of one of the Karstark sons and was shifting through his chains. You will never win the war, undull scum. I do not regret trying to eliminate your son, you and your family deserve to die for your abhorrent beliefs being spread across the realm. King Stannis stood dignified, not bothered by the words of the Karstark, who tried to eliminate his heir. He held on to the hilt of Lightbringer, as he will deal with the highborn deaths at his own hand. The man glared at Ser Godry and Ser Richard, indicating they step back, as he will take over and take the lives of the Bolton and Karstarks on their knees before him. Death was something Stannis dealt with as the king, and he will see more bloodshed before anything can be simple and uncomplicated again. As the rightful king, he had to show strength in front of Northmen and women, who will willingly rebuff his claim again, but he proved himself to them by butchering the phrase outside of the castle walls and the death of Ramsay Snow can be attributed to his spurs in war. Even though it was his son, who eliminated the idiot with the help of Asha Greyjoy, a threat to his son's marriage plans worse than the rebel northerners in the castle. The man raised the sword of Lightbringer above the heads of the men, and began slicing the heads of every man on his knees to die, even the grandsons of Lord Arnulf whom were all tweens and old enough for the chopping block, as the blood from their removed heads soiled the wooden plank they were on. The red stained the simple grey armour of the king, but his face unflinching by the deaths by his hand, but the bodies will be burned in the hour of the wolf, whilst the heads will be put on spikes next to the heads of Theon Greyjoy and the brothers of Valda Bolton. A bloodbath was the understatement, as Stannis disliked that word, as it was used by the young and the ignorant of his loyalists from the few houses, whom will stand by him. It was an ignorant boy by the name of Miles Florent would use that word whenever stories of war were in his ears, as the boy was spoiled rotten by all members of Stannis's good family, being one of the last sons born of their house with the Florent name. As the blood soaked the wood, none of it touched the king's boots as he looked at his sword coated with red. It was over and Stannis was glad it was, as executions should not take long, even though he was putting highborn men to death in front of the solemn faces of the northerners. He was glad to see the head of Harold Karstark roll, as he is nothing but a rotting head to be put on Winterfell spikes, alongside the rest of his family, Roos Bolton, the Fry brothers and Theon Greyjoy. The war took a toll on Stannis, as his bones ached again, it was not a symptom of age but from the sin he committed with the Lady Melisandre. Had he been a believer in the Seven, then the faith would have granted him clemency and a chance for redemption of the sin he was a part of. The Seven Kingdoms knew Stannis Baratheon for a heathen and deserved death by stones, but he did not care as he was the rightful king and all his enemies will face the same fate as the men, whom their heads are on Winterfell's gates. The Karstarks and Roose Bolton are dead, but it leaves me emptier than before. The Greyjoy woman stands next to my son as if she is his friend. I will not stand for it, after all the times I spoke to him about staying away from her and her ilk. Lord Mandely know my patience runs out, when it comes to negotiating the marriage between my son and his granddaughter, the elder one. Not the wild one with green hair. The younger granddaughter used her voice against her own grandfather and reminded him of his loyalty to the Starks and urged her lord grandfather to join me against the Boltons and Freys. A young girl knows evil before any old man does, as he will spend his lifetime bending his knee to such evils such as the Boltons and Freys. I know I must deal with the rest of the Freys in the Riverlands, as soon as the storm clears. The king's fears of the Greyjoy were becoming a reality he was not vigilante enough and he should have known about his son and Lady Asha escaping from the battle to hunt Ramsay Snow down themselves. It was not until Stannis found out of Luther airing his son's antler dark gold helm as a shade on the battlefield. He was not happy about the fact the Estermont boy, would impersonate his prince and led his half of his host, whilst his son followed the Ironborn near the walls of Winterfell and eliminated the Snow Boy and his men at arms, even the rabbit hounds were dead as well. King Stannis turned away, as he needed his sword cleaned and left his loyal knights to deal with the bodies and the heads of the men, he beheaded. King Stannis claimed the former solar of Ned Stark, as there were no Starks left and he was the highest man of authority in this castle. He spent most days reading old letters sent to Lord Bolton, in his tenure as Warden of the North, but the ones sent by the Lannisters were burned at the fireplace and never seen again. 
The snowstorm outside of Winterfell was the least of the Stag King's problems, since his enemies struggled with more than what they can handle. Especially with the letters detailing the Lannister Tyrell struggle with dealing with the Greyjoy brothers raiding the Reach with the full force of the Iron Fleet, the same fleet Stannis himself defeated years ago. Mace Tyrell must be shitting himself, if he was going to allow ironborn scum to steal the bounty of the South and to rape and eliminate his subjects. The solar was cold and dull, as was the Stark Lord himself that sat here years ago himself. The king sorted through the old and new letters and keeping the ones of most importance to him and his plans to take the throne again. The man assumed his lady wife and daughter were content, with several queen's men stationed to protect them. He will not risk the lives of his family, but Celis practically begged him to allow her to be present at their son's wedding, as Stannis would usually deny his wife her delusional requests. The wall was a harsh place, filled with the worst of the seven kingdoms, but Stannis had the cells of Winterfell filled with men from enemy houses, as House Whitehill was no more than a girl as its heir with the men dead on the battlefield. Where was Sir Justin? The king was certain his most obedient knight will return soon, but for how long, as the battle of ice and blood had been won and Winterfell and the north was his for the moment. A new warden will need to be appointed from the loyal Stark houses, not the ones that sided with the Boltons and Freys, whilst their fellow Northmen were dying in the cells of the twins. A new warden will be appointed as soon as the snow clears the north and the storm stops, even though the storm has raged outside the walls of Winterfell for five days and nights. The Riverlands were still under Lannister control, even though the River Lords will find a way to rebel, as the North did. The proclamation of the long night returning against is frightening, especially when I am supposed to be the great hero come again, all the Lady Melisandre's mystic babblings and there are no truths or proof to it. I know I am not the chosen hero, but I am content with the fact, as I have a kingdom to save and a house to rebuild. The return of Ser Justin left the focus of the king to the man, who will visit the solar later. Lord Wyman requested to dine with him and give salt and bread from his own wagons, but Stannis could not be bought and remembered the fat lord rebuffed his fealty like a jape. He could not afford to slight the richest lord of the north, especially because of his bitter musings of having the entire north under his rule, but the man was going to give him his granddaughter for his son to marry before the sept and weirwood tree of Winterfell. Better the mandily girl than the soiled daughter of Mathis Rowan birthing Stannis's grandchildren in the future, as it will not be filled with dread. The Mandalees were the closest to a southern family in the north and the girl will have been taught courtly graces that will make Celis comfortable as a future queen. King Stannis spoke to his son in this solar once, and never again for the next four days. He was not blind to his son's activities, as he heard from a passing servant of seeing the young prince enjoying the company of the mountain clansmen and the northern nobility. Lady Barbary was poison, and Stannis did not want his son to be filled with the same as her. His heir was betting the serving girls and handmaids of the northern ladies that stayed in Winterfell, whilst the battle raged on. It was told the king's son was lonely and needed company other than his cousin, since the king himself dismissed Ser Sorel from his service and isolated him more from people than he previously thought. The rightful lord of the Seven Kingdoms began to write letters by his own hand, one for Ser Davos when he returns from the mission Lord Manderley sent him on, but he knew the Onion Knight will die before he failed his king again. The doors of the solar opened for the portly, Lord Wyman Manderley to enter on a wagon pushed by six men at arms strong enough to do so. The lord was too fat to sit on a horse but was he a liar in that regard or did he ride a wheelhouse to Winterfell to welcome Roos Bolton as Warden of the North, rather than swear fealty to his rightful king. The fat man had little to deny, since his granddaughter will be queen and the future of birthing the next generation of Baratheons, who will do their house better than the king and his foregone brothers. The lord was adorned in a heavy fabric doublet of his house colors of green and blue, and everything he owed had his merman sigil on it. The Mandalay men-at-arms placed their lord on the seat opposite the king, as he pushed his letters to one side and looked the fat lord straight in the eye with his hands crossed together. Servants entered the solar with plates of food for the two men sitting by the table, as it was not too much, with the king wanting to save food to feed his subjects of the north and keep them alive through winter. I'm glad to finally meet you, your grace. A shame lesser lords went before me. Lord Wyman said, huffing under his breath as the king feared the man will die before he sees his granddaughter married in the sept to a suitable husband. 
Enough niceties, you know why you are here in the solar. Ah. The marriage contract. The dowry provided by House Manderley will befit his grace to what he pleases with it. I know why you rebuffed me you needed your son back. The father of my son's future wife was a captive of the Lannisters, and you needed him home, for your sake and for Sir Wylas's lady wife, who spoke to my envoy with great disrespect and scorn. I am sorry for Lady Leona, she loves her husband and fears consequences from the Lannisters, your grace. You think you can push your granddaughter on my son and things will be good, my lord. No your grace I believe we are better as allies than enemies. Your granddaughter better be the vision of beauty you boasted about, unless I want to be linked to some other Northman as family. There is trouble in the capital, your grace. The return of the faith militant in the leadership of some barefooted man called the High Sparrow, spouting hateful rhetoric in King's Landing. The Queen Regent, Cersei Lannister, Marjorie Tyrell and her handmaidens have been arrested by this band of fanatics and causing disorder in the capital. Why should that matter to me? If what my son's wife said was true about you and the Red Priestess, you brought into the Seven Kingdoms, this band of fanatics will seek to destroy you and what is left of your house. He cannot reach me, as the North is buried in snow, unless the Faith Militant want to freeze to their graves. As your son is a patron of the Seven, loyal worshippers such as myself will listen to him and get behind him, if an eventual battle is to be had with the Faith Militant. The king found the food at his table satisfactory he did not find pleasure in food as Robert did. He ignored most of Lord Wyman's ramblings of this high sparrow character, as that man and the faith militant have essentially taken his lawful kingdom and deposed the Lannister and the Tyrell whore. Stannis could not imagine hardened men like Mathis Rowan and Randall Tarley standing by as their queen is arrested and not being able to do anything and it being too late to abandon the alliance with the Lannisters. As a man of no faith, it will be difficult for the king to try and get allies and take his kingdom back from the fanatics of the faith before it's too late. In his mind, Stannis knew this preacher character had a point to hold the Lannisters accountable for the wars they started and the destabilization of the Riverlands and leaving the people of the Reach to suffer at the hands of the Ironborn. Stannis was no lover of the faith of the Seven, especially after the death of his parents and Maester Cresson. His son and heir on the other hand, was a patron of the faith and was always a good citizen in the eyes of the High Septon and the most devout. As it was Jacob's faith that kept the Southerners loyal to the king and it was what impressed Lord Manderley enough to throw his granddaughter in his son's bed for marriage. Eating with the fat lord was bristly at best, as the two men were no means friends, but were allies that found each other in the middle of a complex game started by Roos Bolton, whose head is rotting on the spikes of Winterfell. He would consider Bolton's widow Lady Valda to take charge of the Dreadfort with what remained of Bolton's armies, until her unborn child came of age and she will understand the price of rebellion more than her husband and brothers did. It would be great to unite the houses of Forrester and Whitehill with marriage, with the Forrester man in command of Highpoint. Lord Wyman suggested, even though the king bristled at the thought of such a union, but it will benefit him more since the Foresters fought on his side. More weddings will need to be had to unite the North. Great idea, your grace, since the Boltons and Starks left the North in such chaos and disorder, in which only a man such as yourself can bring order here. How old are the daughters of the great John and Moore's Crow food, my lord? Why such a question? To have a replacement, unless you play me false and you will live to see an Umberby queen before one of Sir Wylas's daughters. I shall not play you false, as you got rid of the Boltons and Freys. The spikes look decorative today, your grace. The Lannisters will know what you did and deposed their puppets in the north. The storm will hinder the Lannisters or Tyrells from sending any armies, as they are dealing with the Faith Militant and the Ironborn invasion of the Reach. It must be good for you, to have the advantage over your enemies. And have some pointed star-worshipping fanatic and his servants essentially take over my kingdoms. No offense to you, my lord as I know your house is a patron of the faith and my family used to be. No offense taken, your grace. I was wrong to think you were converted to the worship of fire, but Ser Davos spoke true after all. The wedding will take a lot from us, as it will be a short and simple ceremony. When will your granddaughters be brought over? The girls are on their way to Winterfell, with their mother and father as you speak, since I ordered them to come when the battle of ice and blood ended. 
It will be a great occasion, to celebrate unity and an alliance between North and South again. It will take longer for my lady wife and daughter to make their way from the wall for the wedding, as Winterfell is secure enough for them to stay. Shall we toast to our alliance, your grace? Not until my son and your granddaughter are wedded and bedded. What will happen to Lady Valda and your other female prisoners? I will keep them here, until after the birth of Roose Bolton's last child. I will make sure the Lady Valda is treated well and is content with her quarters in the castle, as for Lady Gwyn and Lady Asha, they will rot in the dungeon separate from the men. The iron-born woman should have been executed alongside her brother, the turncloak. I choose to keep Lady Asha with me, as my hostage against her raiding uncles, but the Lady Gwyn will be married to her old forester lover again, for the sake of duty and unity. As least, some people will get a happy ending in this dreaded world. The king cannot be excited, as he has dealt with one disappointment after the other when it came to Jacob's betrothals and future marriages. But he will finally walk down the aisle with the eldest of Lord Manderley's granddaughters and finally bed someone other than Northern Serving Girls or Lady Asha. The worst that can come to Stannis's mind will be the iron-born wench bedding his son, even though they spent a significant time together and eliminated Ramsay Snow. He will not turn a blind eye again, even though Jacob will always do such things behind his back to irritate him, as it's the way of rebellious heir trying to test his father's patience. The king's heir is smart enough to know the consequences of betting such an undesirable woman, when his bride is leagues away from Winterfell and will be presented before him. As they will be married before Winterfell's sept and before the heart tree to please the traditional northern lords. King Stannis was no friend of Lord Wyman, but the man will become his most powerful ally in the fight against what is threatening the North and reclaim his throne, for the sake of his house and the future of it blossoming under Jacob and Shireen's hand. He did not want to face the inevitable, but it was the king's own fault for turning a blind eye to what his son is doing with his time, as dismissing Sorel Grimm was the worst thing the man had done. He had to do it, honor and duty demanded that man be punished for his failure, even though the man was the only man, apart from Ser Davos, who can tell Prince Jacob what he does not like and can tell him no, when the king cannot because he was his son and heir. Stannis would never refuse his son what he wanted, even though he judged Renly and Robert for spoiling him too much in his childhood, as the last trueborn son of House Baratheon and his son being very important in the Game of Thrones and the security of Storm's End. The Merman Lord was beginning to be pushed by his men at arms on the wagon, but Stannis saw the man in the beginning for a liar and a fraud. He was reminded of Lord Manderley's claim on the lands of Hornwood, even though the Glovers were fostering the previous lord's idiot son. And as the King Stannis could legitimize the boy and have him betrothed to one of the northern maidens, whom are not married and unite the north with even more marriages arranged in the next few days. The rest of the King's host and the northerners stuck in Winterfell for the foreseeable future, he will need to occupy his time with tasks, which will take the time from his mind. The thought of some fanatic in control of his kingdom, his capital made the king grit his teeth, and the southerns call him an fanatic for allowing the Lady Melisandre her right to worship her god. Even in foreign lands with his lady wife Queen Celis, as her first convert to the religion of Rolaller. I met Lawrence Snow, after the Battle of Deepwood Mott, the boy had only turned four and ten and was pleased to see the iron-born gone from the castle. That boy would accept my offer better than the Lord Commander would, as he will make a fine husband as a legitimized Hornwood and no Bolton will get their hands on those lands, as long as I am king. Lord Manderley will seek to marry his green-haired daughter to the boy, but there are other brides to be considered. I would have chosen the green hair as Jacob's wife, but the girl is too wild and spirited to be shoved in a southern court. Her elder sister Winifred will adjust to court life and will be a dutiful queen. Stannis realized the dread Asha Greyjoy presented to his plans, with her foolish infatuation with getting a crown of her own. That woman pranced around Winterfell, under his nose and soiling herself with his air. He will be damned if his first grandchild turns out to be a half-ironborn idiot. The king hoped the rest of the Mandalies arrived in Winterfell soon, as this marriage has been hanging over the king's shoulder since the northern campaign started, some of his original plans have failed but new ones sprout out from the ashes. He will not allow ironborn scum, the last of Balon Greyjoy's line to destroy the future of his house with her recklessness and infatuation with a crown. The king knew his son was on his way, 
after the meeting with Lord Manderley to tell him the news, even though Jacob had enough of false betrothals. All for them to end in disappointment, but the fat lord gave the king his word his granddaughter will walk the sept, even if the storm outside was raging. His son remained unmarried for so long and Stannis blamed himself for it. The rightful king can be too bothered, as his son's future and the future of House Baratheon was on the line. Only Stannis, Jacob and Shireen remained of the Trueborn line, and they all had a duty to preserve it for the next generation, even if the king's grandchildren will be half northern. Stannis never wanted Shireen's marriage prospects to be as low as his son, but he was lucky to have a male heir, as such is better for a house to advance in power and it's why the Florence stayed loyal to him, not out of love for him or Celis. But for Jacob and the future children he will have there were so few Florence left, and many of them stayed with their rightful king, even when being hounded down by the Lannisters and Tyrells, maybe it was hope of gaining their lands and wealth back when Stannis or Jacob ascended the Iron Throne. The letters were being written, especially towards the wall for his wife to have her and his daughter brought to Winterfell before the bride arrived with her mother and father. King Stannis was not looking forward to seeing his wife again, knowing she will wail and cry over their son and the scars he gained from this war and blame him for it. He will not have the Lady Melisandre brought down, since she thrives in isolated surroundings where his lords cannot belittle her any more, and not cause problems with the northern lords. He had enough issues to deal with, and he will not allow the Red Priestess to cost him his last opportunity to gain another army to fight for his throne again. It was her lies and untruths that made him fail the first time, and the king will not make the same mistake again. The double doors of the northern solar opened for his son to enter, but the king saw a red-haired man standing by his heir, as it was Luther Estermont and he was left outside. King Stannis had warmed more to the Estermont boy and was more comfortable with the knight being his son's companion than Sorel Grimm or Asha Greyjoy. The heir of the Iron Throne was sullener than his father thought, as he wrapped himself in northern furs and looked more like a northman than a southern man in the king's mind. He never ignored how much his son was growing up away from him, especially when being complimented with looking much like Robert, when he began his rebellion against the Mad King. Stannis had let go of some of his bitter jealousy, as it was destroying his relationship with his son, and letting those feelings go made things better and his son was more receptive to him, unlike when he would wander off and intentionally avoid him. Prince Jacob was a man, and he looked like one as he was no boy, after five battles and being responsible for the death of Ramsay Snow. His son's blue eyes were steeled and were hardened, as the king saw his heir return from the battlefield with blood smeared all over his face, as if the red was a mask worn, whilst dragging the body of the dead idiot with the iron-born woman by his side. His son was a battle-hardened warrior and was a killer of men, not the court politician he was. The prince left his cousin outside, and closed the doors of the solar, as he had a small limp on his leg when he approached the seat opposite the king. Stannis knew the limp was temporary, as long as his son was visiting Maester Willem and he will be fit to walk as he should. The king's son looked nothing like his father, as there was no trace of florent blood in him, unlike his daughter Princess Shireen, who had the big ears and the nose of her maternal family. The prince sat down, with his head leaning against his hand. Lord Manderley was smiling on his way to his guest chambers, did you do something to please him dearly? The prince said, in a dull tone. I plan to legitimize the idiot Hornwood boy, when he arrives in Winterfell with the Glovers. The king replied. I understand, since he is his father's last son left and the people of Hornwood would be pleased to see them return to their seat. At least, he will take the offer, unlike a certain lord commander. I know you are bitter about John, but Starks are too honorable to take such a deal. He would rather die than steal the claim of his half-siblings. Tell me true, and don't lie to me. Are you betting Asha Greyjoy? The maids of the Dustin Widow, yes to be honest, as whores are not my taste. I am not betting Asha, we may have eliminated a man together, but we will never be friends. That is good to know. You will be married four days after the Lady Winifred arrives with the rest of her family. I'm glad, father. There is finally a wedding, no stops again. I'm quite excited to take this next stage of my life. I would never envision myself to be a father. Jacob said, wondering if he was good enough to father children and raise them. A man is not only by his age, but his ability to do his duty to his house and his family, 
no matter what's at stake. You will be a better man than me, a better man than Robert and a better man than Renly, since our generation soiled House Baratheon and it will be you, who will bring respect and honor back to our house. Stannis declared. What did you speak with Lord Manderley about? It's between lords and kings, nothing for you to be concerned with. Southern politics and other northern marriage arrangements. I'm glad you put your issues with Lord Wyman behind you, as we will need his support to survive winter. He likes you already, a patron of the faith and is content you will treat his granddaughter well. We will also wed in the gods' wood, as a show of respect to the northerners, who worship the old gods, but mother will not like it. Your mother and sister will arrive for the wedding. I will not deprive you of seeing your mother and sister there at the altar. The wall is now stable, and the north is rid of the Boltons. I hope Uncle Axel brings the Baratheon cloak and other wedding trinkets with him. The king realized it was not a good idea, to leave the Baratheon marriage cloak in the hands of a fanatic like Ser Axel, but the man was his wife's uncle and the only one she had left. His son will practice the faith's wedding customs as a way of integrating himself with the Mandalis and showing the rest of the kingdoms, he has not converted to Melisandre's religion. Stannis was unsure of his son being married in the eyes of the Red Leaf Tree as well, but he knew why he wanted to do it, as a show of respect to the northern lords and not alienate them more than this war already did. The king knows Jacob will lead one day and he will be dead and gone, but now will be the time to teach Jacob more life lessons as he can. Since the storm has trapped them all in Winterfell with no hope of moving the armies to the Riverlands and getting rid of Lord Walder and the rest of his repugnant brood. At least Valda Bolton and the child in her belly will be under Stannis's control for the foreseeable future and she makes a valuable hostage for her troll of a grandfather, and he will do anything to make sure a great-grandchild rules the Dreadfort. There was a smile on his son's face, but Stannis was not blind to his air-keeping company with women, he should stay away from, especially highborn hostages. It did not hurt, since Jacob was only making Lady Valda comfortable, since she is with child and must live with seeing the rotting heads of her husband and brothers on the spikes of Winterfell. His only son's eyes glared at him, as they were steeled from war and death, but it was all Baratheon steel and not the wiles of the fox, he showed when betting Lady Dustin's serving girls. It disgusted the king to even think of it, as it was known and not a secret to be kept, maybe Lady Barbary was conspiring against Lord Wyman in supplanting his marriage plans. His son was unmarried, a man and available, which was a prize in the eyes of the northern and southern lords, since the latter missed their opportunity, as they chose to bend the knee to the usurpers, who sit on his throne. The wedding will be grand, since it will unite the north again. Lady Valda is glad to see a wedding that is happy than of total misery. Why are you socializing with my hostages? King Stannis replied, gritting his teeth again. I'm making them comfortable, since the north is harsh and cold. Better they are content than they are loathing us. The Greyjoy woman stays out, Lady Valda is more of a priority than her, since she is with child. The birth will be interesting to see if it's a son or a daughter, as Roose Bolton's last child, at least this one will have a future unlike the murdered Trueborn heir. You will do your duty and get the Mandalay girl with child as quick as possible. This war has gone too long, and I desire to see a grandson in my arms. What if a granddaughter comes first? Will you be disappointed? Jacob said, in a forced tone. It does not matter, but your mother will not care as a grandchild will mean more to than the gender of the child. The serving girls of old widow Dustin were good company, even though I get death glares from her Riswell nephews. I was not planning on marrying one of Lady Barbary's nieces behind your back. Good, you see how much this marriage alliance is important to the future of our house. Will you give Sir Justin his reward of marrying Lady Asha when he returns from Bravos? I will consider it. As the rightful king, I will reward loyal knights, who do as they are bid. The marriage will suffice, with Asha Greyjoy's uncles are pillaging the Reach, causing problems for our Lannister and Tyrell enemies in King's Landing. Asha's old husband must be dead by now, it's best to look for a new husband for her, while we are here. The options are thin, since most of the men have been eliminated. We will always find a way, since we survived the storm and the northern war together. King Stannis will not admit it, but he smiled on the inside. He was a cold man, who would eliminate without a second thought, 
but his son brought him a joy, he had not had since when his mother and father were alive, and his family was whole and unbroken. The marriage with Winifred Manderley will change Jacob and it will make him a better man and stop betting the northern maids and do his duty as a husband to her. He knows he cannot force Jacob to do what he does not want to do, it's the Baratheon stubbornness he inherited and there was nothing the king could do to dull his heir's fascination of frustrating him. Stannis has a chance, unlike with Renly to be a better man for his son, his wife and his daughter, since the snowstorm has given him the time. To rule the north until the storm clear the roads and paths for the king and his armies, to claim the seven kingdoms and finally sit on the Iron Throne. Chapter 53 The grief settled as the dust in the northern sky. Asha Greyjoy was alone and content. She knew her brother was going to be executed by the southern king in front of the northern lords. He kept his promise to punish the prisoners he captured in battle. The castle was cold and dull it was so northern, as her ironborn self would never be welcome on any circumstance, unless she took it by the iron price, as her old self would do. She was given a room of her own, close to the royal quarters as she will always be watched. By the knights of Stannis Baratheon and no one will let her out of sight, unless their name was Justin Massey. The ironborn Mr. Champion hoped he returned soon, but she spared no hope, as he had a task to do in the name of his king and will go, all the way across the narrow sea and accomplish his mission. Separating from Prince Jacob was a must, she was a hostage and he was man to be wed. Asha shed a few tears she liked him and would have married him, if he was ironborn, not a handsome Greenlander and the son of the most brutal man in the Seven Kingdoms. She did herself no favors, approaching the prince when his father voiced his disapproval of their relationship, but it was not a case of them betting each other. It was a common companionship between two lonely people in the north. Asha missed Theon, even though she hardly knew him, as he was taken away by the Greenland Wolf Lord and she lost her brothers in her father's rebellion. At least, the southern king allowed her brother a clean death by the sword, by the heart tree of the old gods for her sake. Asha must deal with seeing his head on the spikes of Winterfell's gates it was a warning for southerns and northerners not to cross Stannis Baratheon and his bullheaded son, unless they wanted their heads on spikes for all kingdoms to look at. The woman stared at her latest escort, Ser Sorel Grimm, the king's man and the green prince's former shield, she could tell by his bald head in tattered clothes. He was put on her, as the man wanted to prove himself worthy of redemption. Asha glimpsed the sneers the grim man gave her, as she was ironborn and he was from a place that fell victim to ironborn raids through the centuries. The man was not too bad, only when he was boring and no good to talk to. Sorel was a failure of a knight and everyone knew it, even the king himself. By the look in his steeled eyes, he wanted to be by his prince's side again and longed for the chance. For all the talk the man had, he makes himself look a lovestruck pounce in a way that not respectable for any knight. Sorel would rather remove my head from my shoulders, like the king did to Theon, but I have value, until the southern king finds me a new husband, to marry off to one of his knights. Stannis Baratheon must be waiting for my champion to come back or marry me off to someone else. I will not get my southern crown, as he said it to my face. Had I be looking for a crown, I would have used my young body on the Greenland prince and married him in the Winterfell sept, even though I have no love for Greenlander faith, but it is the faith of the Green Prince. Even though his father would rather worship fire and he seemed to miss his red witch every day, and even the queen wife with the great beard on her and the scarred princess daughter. Asha was amused in more ways than one. There were certain places, where she was not allowed to go, by the order of the king in her various escorts. As the king's prize, she was more valuable as a kept woman than the other women, the king imprisoned. She should be called the prince's prize, as he was the one who defeated her in single combat and took her to Deepwood Mott himself. She never liked the Greenland prince to begin with, but the man changed something within her, and she changed him too. A Greyjoy and a Baratheon alone in the frozen north together, it was prime for killing, but they put those differences aside, and focused on a common enemy and his idiot. She was pleased to have avenged her brother and left the idiot with the axe stuck in his neck, but the prince and his red-haired cousin dragged the bodies back to Winterfell on horses and wagons, until they were put on spikes on the gates of Winterfell. The idea of change was foreign to Asha, knowing she would never get along with any Greenlander, especially the son of the man, who beheaded her last brother. 
The prince had finished speaking with his father and the fat merman lord, but the man seemed full of anger when the other two men were not looking. It was expected for the son of the king to be married, and she had to stomach the stupid green wedding, as the prize hostage of the king and a trophy bride for one of his knights, unless Sir Justin returned. Asha never met the prince's Greenland bride, but she already disliked her on principle, she was stealing her southern crown and the prince away from her. It was what Stannis Baratheon wanted, to separate the iron-born woman from his son and sever whatever their relationship was. She did not care, as she will only shed one tear for the man and will move on, even though she may be a widow herself. Your stare can burn any man, Greenlander. Asha said, in a stiffened tone. Better to burn you with, my lady. Ser Sorel replied. Why are you here? I am your escort permanently, since the king was impressed with my duty-bound ways. Great, more time with a Greenland Southern. I do not enjoy my time with you, either but we will make the most of things. When will Ser Justin return? I am not privy to the king's secrets and plots, if you want to know, speak with Ser Richard or Ser Godry, men of the king's inner circle. They would rather dismiss me for being a woman. Ser Clayton died on the battlefield, there should be some relief for you. Do you grieve for your fellow knights? No, since Ser Suggs was a queen's man, I do not care for him as he was poor in manners and should never have been knighted. You are only watching me to get back in the king's good graces again. I'm glad to see Prince Jacob return safe, thanks to you. You must like serving him, even though the king hates you. Only because of where I am from and the house my family serves. Will you leave when the war is over? I will do what I can to earn Prince Jacob's forgiveness and I hope to serve him, when he is married with children of his own. I will be some man's wife, only if my husband on Pike is dead. How can be you be married to a man, who have not consented to? My uncle thought it a good idea, to sign the marriage papers with my seal on it, it's how Greenlanders used to do it. To remove you from the lordship of the Iron Islands, those men sat back and allowed a mad man to take your rights. Asha lowered her shoulders, not wanting to talk with a Greenland knight, about the loss of her throne to Euron and her humiliation at the hands of the Ironborn. She was a woman in a culture that favored violent men, and it was what her mad uncle was. Only a few champions claimed her their queen, but it was not enough to defeat Euron or even Uncle Victorian in the Kingsmoot, Theon would have lost as he was more Greenland than Ironborn, and their people would have rejected him because of that reason alone. Asha was lonely, as a child who lost two brothers to the sword and one to the Greenlanders, but it made her lord father more determined to train her as his heir and the only one he had left. She was given what most Ironborn women did not have, as the opportunity to captain her own ship and command her own men to reeve and pillage as her ironborn ancestors have done for centuries on the Greenlands. All was gone, her broken and dead family, her crown gone and she was stuck in a drifty castle, with a gritting king who wants her burned, just for lusting over his son. It was her own reality, but she came to terms with it, long before she lost Deepwood Mott and resided herself to life as a hostage. Asha still had her strength, but showed it in front of the Green Prince, who dismissed her for her womanhood at first sight, as he learned to change his ignorant Greenland views on women over time. She enjoyed the little time she had with her prince, before he was called by his father or some northern lord, who wanted his attention or a retelling of how he and Asha eliminated Bolton's idiot and left an axe embedded in his shoulder to bleed to death. You will cope better than others, the Whitehill girl shakes like a lily. Ser Sorel commented dully, not caring for what happens to the king's other hostages. A northern girl, who worships the southern faith. What did she expect? Lady Asha replied. You met Bolton's widow, a vibrant spirit in such a dull castle, but being with child has not damped her joy at all. The fat one in pink silk, you will not catch me wearing such, even if the king puts me at sword point. The bald knight chuckled, even though he was no ordinary green man, as he was no lord, just a fighter on the right side of the war. You in silk will be the death of all mankind, eliminate us before the white walkers do. You calling me ugly. You are a failure and a man without honor. I will not have my honor and dignity questioned by iron-born filth you will watch yourself before you will be on the chopping block, be fortunate you are a woman and spared from such a fate. Sorel declared. Has the prince been to see you, since you were dismissed from his service? 
Only twice, but he has much to do, his mother, the queen and his sister, the princess will arrive soon and there is a wedding to prepare for. I have never seen a Greenland wedding, will it be fun? You will sit at the back, with me watching you and some may dressing you for the occasion. Your normal chainmail and trousers will not do. If Asha learned one thing about her stay in Winterfell, was Ser Sorel Grimm was not as dull as people thought he was, unless you coaxed anything out of him. He reminded her slightly of her nuncle Roderick, as the reader must know what happened to her and Theon's death. As the Harlaws were the second most powerful family on the Iron Islands, not even Nuncle Roderick will have the coin to ransom her she will be Stannis Baratheon's hostage, as long as he wanted to, even if he took that iron chair south. She will still be his hostage, but Asha Greyjoy will see the finer trappings of Greenland royal court, even if she could be the first iron-born woman to step inside the cesspit of a capital called King's Landing. The current Greenland king and the Stannis' main enemy was a little boy, in the claws of the roses and lions. Asha could see herself, in a Greenland lace dress, even though she will be paraded around as the king's prize for all the Greenland lords and ladies to see, even though she has nothing, but her name as a means of value to the king. Will you put me in a silk dress yourself? Asha said, in a haughty tone. A winter dress will suit, since winter is already here unless the grey rats have declared it. Ser Sorel replied. Grey rats? It's what we Greenlanders call maesters by such a term, only those who dislike these men call them so. Why? If a maester born from the south influences a northern lord to marry southwards, he will lose the influence of his fellow northmen. Might be the same for us ironborn. The bald knight was not a bad escort, even though he was as dull as last night's supper bread roll. Asha never thought Sorel could have a spark, but he was defensive when he talked about his prince, as if the man belonged to him, even though it was none of her concern. She looked outside of the window to see the snowstorm, as heavy as, it was on the road to the watchtower. The inside of the castle was warm, from the timber brought from the umbers to keep the castle and the guest keeps warm. She will never leave this place, unless she wanted to sign her own death warrant, she wanted to live, even though it was not an ideal situation. She brought it upon herself, by her own misdeeds and must pay the consequences of her crimes, the crimes of her dead brother and the crimes of the ironborn. Asha had enough of being used as a pawn against her people, but her own people left her here in this cold and dull region to die without warmth from the sea she called home. She would meet a potential husband, since her old reaver would be dead by now, due to his advanced age. Asha was not looking forward to such a wedding but it was to keep her out of King Stannis's way and to keep her away from his son, while he wed the northern girl that was coming over. She will face the north girl, who dared to steal her long sought after crown, as she would be forced to bed the prince and quicken with child. Sorel Grimm was her guard and her escort at the same time, but was put on her service by the king, who was impressed with his diligence to keep her out of the way of the northern lords and the king himself. At least, Sir Justin will spill some of the king's secrets to her, but Sorel had none since he was dismissed from the prince's service by force. Asha was sorry for the horses, as they were gated into their stables with the horses of the leftovers of Stannis's army that came with him from the south, as a crop of them died. Including the disgusting raper knight Ser Clayton Suggs, who she was glad was gone and she would never have to shiver in the presence of a man, who should have never been a knight. The queen's men were agitated, not being able to worship their red faith, in front of the northerners and on their lands, unless they wanted to be thrown out of Winterfell. Asha was comfortable with the king's men, the ones who worshipped the Greenlander faith the prince worshipped and the same faith he will marry under. She stayed out of the way, even though Ser Sorel protected her from the worst of the men Stannis brought with him north, as it was his duty as her guard. The ironborn was itching to train with her axe, as she had nothing better to do than being watched like a hawk, by a reach man. Who would rather remove her head or even allow the fanatical queen's men to burn her on a stake, like they did to the cannibals for eating each other? This place is drab, too boring and nothing to do. Better Sorel takes me to the training yard, but the storm has put everyone here on lockdown. Sorel is ordered to keep me away from the prince, or else Stannis will change his mind and eliminate me, instead of giving me mercy as he did. I hate it outside nothing will please me more than to stare at the heads of Roose Bolton and his idiot. The bald knight on my left dictates where I go and who I talk to because, it was his duty to do so, 
but he is growing fond of me, even though he would rather I be dead. Ser Sorel Grimm may not be my friend, but I can have him as an ally. The Ironborn shivered at the thought of cannibals, especially since she saw it for herself in the north. Living on salt and sea, made Asha knave to how such monsters will never be seen in her homeland, but further north, as she was chained by the southern king on the first half of the journey from Deepwood Mott. She could never go anywhere, without Ser Sorel knowing or being with her, it was better to have someone at her side, than to be on her lonesome. A chill passed through the dank halls of Winterfell, even though Asha was used to the cold and not being northern, as the southerns and the king's armies had a harder time adjusting to the climate of the north and Winterfell. The storm has hindered them from moving further south, and liberating the rest of Stannis Baratheon's kingdoms from the rule of lions and roses. But it was going to take time for the snow to clear the roads and for the men to be prepared for another long journey to finish the war the southern king started. Asha's situation was terrible, being the last trueborn scion of her house, with Theon being dead and her brothers lost to the sword. She was the only one who could carry on the Greyjoy name, with one of her uncles being mad and the other being a martial failure in all sense of the words. Had the damp hair not been her uncle, Asha would have eliminated the spineless coward for giving away her crown to a mad man and a godless man as he disrespected the sea the drowned god occupied. He would never be welcome in the drowned god's watery halls in the deep. Both her ironborn uncles left her to rot at the hands of Stannis Baratheon, why should she give them anything at all, as they already stole her birthright of her father's throne and lands from her? Being the wife of a Greenlander knight will stick to her uncles, even though the reaver at Pike would be dead by now and she would be free to be married to someone else, preferably chosen by the southern king. Across the halls, the ironborn caught sight of the red-haired Estermont boy in the sigil of the sea turtle with the green prince, with a beard on his face. Asha knew from Ser Justin, of Stannis's queen wife, whom had a facial hair as well, as it was passed down to the sun. She ignored the sight of the prince, as did Ser Sorel as he was ordered to stay away from the king's son because of his failure. The prince could have died, had Asha not intervened in his fight against Harold Karstark, as his head graced the gates of Winterfell, alongside Theon. It was unpleasant when the Karstark men would leer at her, when they were in the dungeons. Asha could roam the castle, as a highborn hostage and a woman, whilst the men were in the cells ready for King Stannis's iron justice to come for them. The Estermont scattered away, seeing a pretty face from one of the serving maids brought over by the ruling northern ladies, leaving Prince Jacob to come face to face with her. Even though Ser Sorel made himself invisible, even though he was still around to make sure, she does not dare run from him. The prince's beard was slightly shaved off, as the hairless areas were exposed, and she never realized how handsome the Greenlander Ponce was beneath the great hair on his face. His eyes made him more intimidating, whenever someone looked at him. Prince Jacob was a man of eight and ten years and has seen more than most men in this castle and won every single battle he fought in the Northern Campaign. He was his father's steadfast loyalist and counselor over lords much older than himself, but he did his duty to his king, even though the thought of getting married made both the ironborn and the prince see each other eye to eye on the issue. Lady Asha, has Ser Sorel given you grief? The prince said, in a casual tone. No, he has been good to me, though I prefer Ser Justin. He will return soon, as soon as he delivers the girl to the wall and goes to Bravos to buy my father his sells words. What are your opinions on that? Sells words are honorless thieves who fight for the highest bidder, they might as well be assassins. Do you know your bride? Only a little, but I will get to know her after the wedding, since the storm has us all trapped here. You have matured, Greenlander. The Ironborn said, in a sour tone. What's the matter, Greyjoy? What happened to sweet Green Prince? Your sweetness has washed away, and I see you for the brute you are. It's who I am, and I am proud of it. Will your future wife like a brutish husband, such as yourself? She will have no choice in the matter, unless her fat grandfather wants to forego being linked to the legitimate royal family. All Greenland speak, are you a man at all? Yes, I am, and I keep to my role, unlike you who wants to make trouble for herself. You are surrounded by people, who want you dead and only my father has kept you alive. I am thankful for your father's defense, since I saved your life and he owes me. He would never say it to your face, 
but he will honor a debt if needed. Not to an iron-born woman, he wants to keep away from his son. The prince and Asha began to stroll through the halls, even though her grey knight was close behind and out of sight. The castle was all northern and all stark, but it reminded her of Theon's decisions, which cost him everything. He could have escaped Winterfell and returned to Deepwood Mott with her, and then Theon would have stopped Euron from seizing the Driftwood crown, but there was no use dwelling on the past. So much could have been changed had her dear brother listened to her in his moment of need. Prince Jacob's sweetness had gone away, as soon as he licked the blood of the idiot boys from his lips and smiled as he crushed the idiot of Bolton with the warhammer. A darker side only Asha saw of the king's son when they were in the snow together, but she was thankful that anger was not unleashed on her, as she endeared herself to him, even as a reluctant ally. There were many halls of the castle, as there were many levels, but Asha wrapped herself in the furs given to her by Sorel to keep her warm and to have some resemblance of care for his charge. You look cross, what happened? Asha asked, wanting to know what made the green prince so wroth. My father wants the wedding to happen immediately, when the bride and her family arrive, but I want to prolong it. I want my mother and sister here to see me walk down the altar of the gods, even though he wants me wedded and bedded sooner rather than later. It leaves us with more time, even though your father will not like it. Sod my father, I am a man now so I can do what I want and speak to whomever I want. Brave to refuse his order, but he loves you too much to refuse you. Love, my father would rather take the sword rather than say that word in public. So unloved, my green prince. No wonder why you became such a brutish man, like your uncle. Do not speak, of what you do not know, my lady. How is your father's onion knight, since he is not really dead? He will return soon I have not seen Davos in a long time, and I will be glad to see him again. The prince said, with such a reverence in his tone. His steeled eyes brightened, and a smile perched on his face, when he spoke of the onion knight his father so cherished, it seems this knight has an importance in the prince's life as well. Is your cousin your new friend now? I keep him at my side, as I have few loyalists of mine. My father approves of cousin Luther more than Sorel, as Luther is kin and can be trusted. Poor knight, he must know. It's better not to tell him, he is saddled with much guilt because of what happened to me and I don't want him to feel more shame. You are too merciful for your own good. It's better to be merciful than to eliminate blindly, as it what makes rulers or unmake them. Will you unmake my uncles, if you face them? My father and I will, we aim to cleanse the seven kingdoms clean and to start over, by getting rid of anyone who stands in our way. I would like to stand by your side and get my islands back. If you want to take that risk, standing against your remaining family for a Greenlander, who will never take you to wife. The halls were warmer on this side, as the furs kept her from freezing outside and inside. Asha never thought her green prince brave enough to fight her nuncles in battle, but his father defeated Nuncle Victarion in the rebellion and won the war for his royal brother. She listened when Victarion did not, when not underestimating Stannis Baratheon, even in his gaunt and thin state, as it made him more frightening and more feral as a man and an irritated king, with three kingdoms under his belt. The prince looked like his father, when it came to his eyes and his hair color, but he looked nothing like him as the rest of him as all his uncle, King Robert and a nose from his florent mother. Asha only saw what the prince's cousin and father did, was the lighter side of the green prince when he is not so cold or worth with the foolish knights, who swore themselves to their king and his cause for the Greenland throne. The ironborn stomach stirred, whenever she was the prince's presence, but she dismissed it to hunger and it almost being supper. Asha was proud and will never admit that to the man at her side. He helped her eliminate Ramsay Snow, but he was not her friend or her lover, not in the way Christopher Botley or Carl the Maid were to her. She missed her former lovers, even though the Glovers were going to bring them over from Deepwood Mott to present them to the king, as tokens of thanks for getting rid of the Boltons and Freys. Winterfell was the base of Stannis Baratheon's operations, until the snow cleared, Asha would not think to spend the winter in a northern castle. Surrounded by so many enemies and was a king's prize for the rest of her existence, unless the brittle southern king granted her wish to join her forefathers at sea. Chapter 54 The man was strolling the halls of Winterfell in the dead of the night. People were still awake having their supper and the king only ate with the northern lords and ladies. 
he was not in the mood, to be inches away from the prince he used to serve and not speak to him. Sorel wanted to redeem himself for Prince Jacob, but he took the duty of guarding and escorting Asha Greyjoy, it kept him away from the prince and gave him something to do. He did not enjoy the Ironborn's company, but it was the only company he got because of the nature of the job. As the lights of the castle were lit, the knight's head was lowered because everyone knew of his disgrace. He was a knight and he had nothing to be ashamed of. The only thing he had to be ashamed of was being dismissed by a man, he swore loyalty to in the first place, but Stannis Baratheon was the man with the crown and the authority of a king, so the man dismissed him out of spite, not because of duty to his son and heir. Ser Sorel liked being exiled from the prince, as it allowed him to become his own man and do what needs to be done. He made several allies amongst of the king's men, and even became their leader, after the disappearance of Davos Seaworth. He saw the queen's men whittled, as most of them perished on the battlefield and he no longer had to deal with the japes of Ser Suggs, whose body was ashes and dust because of fear of the long night returning to the north. The night of the dead was coming, as it was evidenced of the storm, that raged outside for days, keeping the king and his army trapped in Winterfell for the foreseeable future. I should have seen home. To see the family again, but they are under siege by the Ironborn and the fleet in the reach and I am all the way in the north. I can survive this war, if King Stannis doesn't put me on the chopping block like the Fry brothers and the Bolton men. I profess loyalty for Prince Jacob, even though I was his shield and it was my duty to protect him on the voyage home and shield him against the savage cold of the north. I rode with him against the wildlings, I rode with him against the White Hills and I rode with him against the Ironborn at Deepwood Mott. I never rode with him against the Boltons and Freys, as Luther Estermont took his cousin's helm and made a guise of it. The Knight of the South was not a vengeful man, but he wanted to be against King Stannis and Prince Jacob. He learned to shove his anger down, as a knight in service of the rightful king, he cannot afford to make more enemies, being a reach man and a man of the South. He never thought of his family when he was on the battlefield, as he was only a cousin in the shadow of his mainline family. He meant nothing to them, as being a sailor at Old Town taught him much about business and cementing alliances, when it came to trading goods. The reach was bountiful, and anything can be traded for a price, but such bounty was being ruined and raided by the Ironborn, and no one was doing anything about it. Unless the storm lets up and it can allow the king and the rest of the armies go south to save the reach, then the people would proclaim Stannis as their king, much to the disloyalty of their overlords, who allowed a great region to fall into ruin. Sorel never jested, unless with the northern soldiers and the king's men. He saw how hardy the mountain clansmen were on the battlefield, able to endure icy weather as they did at home, to fight for the freedom of Winterfell and spill Bolton and fry blood. The northerners never forgot, who betrayed their ruling family and they got revenge for it. The only phrase that remained here were female, most of them handmaidens for the widow Valda Bolton, a spirited woman who knows good taste in food and her child will be as strong as her. He only came across the Bolton widow a few times, but it was to share tarts and slices of cakes made in the kitchens. As the king wanted Lady Valda to be content and happy, with her carrying the last child of Roose Bolton in her belly and it could be a son and heir for the Dreadfort. The women hostages were livelier, knowing their male counterparts were rotting in the dungeons or their heads graced the gates of Winterfell. The smell of the heads disguised Sorel, but it was a statement not decoration for the walls, for the Seven Kingdoms to see Stannis Baratheon deal with oathbreakers and traitors. A storm in the north kept the king's armies from moving past Winterfell and its territories to go south to the Riverlands and liberate it from Lannister rule. Sorel liked to call this the Liberation Campaign, as the prince would agree with him. Setting oppressed people free is the only way, Stannis will ever become a legitimate king, who can be appreciated by the people and who would respect the religious differences of the land and not use the Red God to take over the Seven Kingdoms. As a knight, Sorel was sworn to the king's cause, but he did not like him. No one did, but they fought because they believed he is the one destined for the throne, even though it was because of duty and justice. His loyal subjects stuck with him through loss and through small victories in the north. The ones who abandoned Stannis's cause must be kicking themselves, especially the Southerns, who conceded and bent the knee to the Lannisters and Tyrells to keep their lands and families intact. Ser Sorel was not so forgiving of his own small house, 
who followed the Tyrells to court and are suffering the consequences of the follies of their liege lord and his most powerful bannermen to get into bed with the prideful lions of the south. The Greyjoy woman keeps me on my toes, but I will never be friends with such a person. She is not responsible for the actions of her uncles, but she is still ironborn and a Greyjoy, two of the worst things to be in the north. Her life was kept intact at the expense of her broken brother, who is now on the spikes of Winterfell. My cousin said a woman is good for raising children and being fucked, but he is wrong. Women do much more than be prizes for marriage, they can be queens, ladies and regents for young sons when needed to be. The grey joy is my responsibility, only because Stannis wants her away from his son, I don't blame him. The ironborn wench is not good enough for, such an exceptional man like Jacob Baratheon, who will be married in day's time. I will not look forward to seeing that hairy Florent queen in my presence. The man shook his head, when he thought of Queen Celis, a Florent lady by birth and a Baratheon queen by marriage. The Grimms and the Florents never got along and were long-time enemies, but Sorel was able to leave that grudge to the side, because the woman was the prince's mother and she had more trust in him, than she did her own lord husband. He was there, when Lord Alistair was burned for his crimes of treachery and almost giving away the king's children, but a man on Dragonstone found out, and it was how the king knew of his good uncle's treason against him and his family. The man deserved to die for his crimes, as Sorel spent days trying to bring Prince Jacob home only for his own selfish great-uncle to nearly sell him to the Lannisters to get his own lands back. Even if the deaths of the prince and the little princess with grayscale were to occur, under that man's considerable short reign as Stannis's hand of the king. Sorel did not understand the game of lords, but he knew a little of it. He was a fighter and a sailor, nothing more to get out of the way of his family. He was no lord, as he said to himself every battle that was won in the north, he was a knight and sworn to uphold his vows to do what is right for the kingdoms. He was a knight on the winning side of the ongoing war, even though the enemy think they won the war, by treachery and violation of the rights of the gods. The knight had eaten with the other king's men at meal times, even the Estermont boy, Luther who had been kind enough to tell him the prince's secrets. Knowing how much Sorel wanted to be by Prince Jacob's side and be his right hand again, but that will never happen because of his own failure and never been given a chance to redeem himself. The North would look ancient and old, if not for the storm and I got to see it in its prime, before the Greyjoys and Boltons destroyed it. I would have fit in such a place, as a southern man with a name, but no status and I would have made a life for myself. The vision of a life had passed me by when I met a certain Baratheon rebel man with black hair and steel blue eyes. I could have turned him over to the Hightowers, but it would be complicated, as one of the prince's relatives is married to Lord Hightower, and would have done everything not to have her husband's sons and knights hand him over to the Lannisters. I did what I could to bring him back to Dragonstone and be on my way, back to Old Town and resume my life, but Prince Jacob inspired me to join on the righteous side as a believer of the faith. The knight began to see Winterfell had more halls and passageways through its extended levels, as exploring became a favorite pastime. When he handed the Greyjoy woman over to another knight in the king's service to be an escort for the night, as Sorel only watched Lady Asha in the day and afternoon. He was glad to be on the winning side of the war, since the faith was against incest and adultery, as it's what the Lannisters have done and the Tyrells married into them, knowing such sinful acts happened in the Red Keep. Sorel kept to the seven-pointed star, as instilled in him as a child and as a man, but he would see Prince Jacob changing his father's mind about religion and embracing the seven again. As it's his duty as the rightful king to keep the predominant religion of the monarchy. He had nothing to fear, whenever the prince and the ironborn came across each other, he saw little detail which others would miss, as men and knights are not qualified to know such things as affection and love. The man knew at the back of his mind, Asha Greyjoy had feelings towards the son of Stannis Baratheon, knowing the two eliminated a man together and kept secrets between each other. The woman gave the prince comfort when he separated from his mother and sister and to be alone in the north with his father for company. Sorel knew enough of the Baratheon man to see little things about him, but he was fortunate to be invited to his wedding to the Mandalay girl. As courtesy from the king he disliked, as the man took it as he did the dismissal from Prince Jacob's service as he did, as cold as the castle he stayed in. The man looked forward to the future, but itched to get back onto the battlefield again. 
It will not happen, as the heavy snow has done its damage and has blocked off the available roads for the king and the armies to cross through the north and go south, to free the riverlands and the rest of the seven kingdoms from chaos. He was living well, as a guest in Winterfell and being a part of the king's men, as it earned him respect from the northerners, not the scorn the queen's men are treated with by the northern lords and ladies at every supper, and Sorel enjoyed every bit of it. Those men did him no favors and were no friends of his. He was glad the worshippers of the Red Demon were being treated, as they were by the northern nobility, even though Sorel was not as pious as he was supposed to be as a man and a southerner. As his eyes roamed, the knight saw the joy on the faces of the nobles and the knights inside the great hall of Winterfell, even though they were finishing their supper. They enjoyed the company of each other, after a long war and many executions after, things were going well and alliances were beginning to be forged, right in this hall. Ser Sorel was no stranger to the Game of Thrones, but it was the Game of High Lords and the Game King Stannis must play to secure his throne after many years of war. He will promise to be there, when that man sits the Iron Throne and the knight himself could get a position in the King's Guard, as he would suit the profession. Which means he can be close to the royal family, even though he has grown fond of Princess Shireen, a child with grayscale and had spirit in her. The knight was content he would have liked to be by Prince Jacob's side and be his right hand, but that position belonged to Sir Luther and he never blamed him. He was the prince's cousin in Highborn, as it was his right as blood to stand by the prince and he did not. Sorel made peace with his failures, but he wanted to change things to redeem himself for his own honor to be restored, and never be a failure again in the eyes of the seven. He looked at the window, to see the snowflakes melting from the windows, even though the storm raged outside and there was nothing anyone could do to leave the castle. Even though a wedding will take place in Moon's time and he will swear his loyalty to his mandily future queen, even though she may not know him, but he will do his duty to help the future of House Baratheon flourish into a new age. The End